Lady Sunshine and the Magoon of Beatus by Alexei and Corey Panshin. This is a true story. Some stories are lies or half-truths. This is a true story of those desperate days when men still confined themselves to the nighty planets of the dispersion, in the nodding afternoon hours before Nashua summoned the nerve to declare herself an empire. This is the story of young Jen, who was as beautiful as you may dream, and who was known as Lady Sunshine, and of how she became the partner of the Magoon of Beatus. Lady Sunshine was her own chosen name, but at the time of her meeting with the Magoon, it was a true description only of her exterior. She did not radiate. She did not illuminate. She was not fit to be the partner of anyone. The times were bad for mankind, as bad as any the race has ever known, and Lady Sunshine was a product of the times. Mankind lived on the nighty worlds of the dispersion and did as they thought all the generations of men before them had done. They ruined each other in the name of business, politics, fashion, and fame. But mankind was sick and horizonless. There was not a man alive who did not know that earth, the source, the wellspring of man, was dead, ruined by man. Mankind lacked all commonality and purpose. Men whirled in the closed circle of the nighty worlds, seeking advantage wherever they could, grasping and seizing. The universe was limited and life was short. Lady Sunshine was taught this last lesson by her grandmother, who was Madame Osevere. Yes, her. Lady Sunshine was the heir of Madame Osevere and was taught by her to be cynical and treacherous, to deliver more blows than she took, to use power for advantage, and to stand alone. Madame Osevere taught Lady Sunshine so well that the day came when Lady Sunshine realized the limitations of their alliance. Whatever Madame Osevere might say, Madame Osevere stood alone, a unity sufficient unto herself. And what was Lady Sunshine's place in that unity? She was being ripened to be eaten alive. Lady Sunshine must flee from that to preserve her own unity. She laid a long plot of escape. She trained and prepared herself. She made herself a spaceship pilot. She used Madame Osevere's absorption in the busyness of real life to make her own secret plans. As delicate and precious as she appeared, Lady Sunshine was strong and determined in pursuit of her own purposes. She fought Madame Osevere and never admitted that she fought her. She merely said that she was unfond of the planet of her birth, that Osevere had bent her, and that she wished to travel to some one of the other worlds of men in her spaceship. And she fought so long and well that at last, in order to save her other interests, Madame Osevere was forced to loose her grip. Madame Osevere said, You disguise your rebellions against me as criticism of this planet. But I am the very type of Osevere, said Lady Sunshine. It has made me thin and fragile. I wish to see what I would be like elsewhere. It is I who made you, said Madame Osevere, not this planet. If I had raised you elsewhere than here, you would still be the same. I wish to discover this for myself. You will shortly enough. Your proper place is here with me, doing as I train you to do. It is only by following my direction that you will ever be a fit instrument to inherit my powers and position but I am far too occupied at the moment to coerce you properly. So I will indulge you in your whim. You may go. I grant you permission to find out just where it is that your best interests lie. I guarantee that you will learn that they are with me and with Osevere. Now thank me and go. Thank you, good Madame Osevere, said Lady Sunshine. One last thing before you go, said Madame Osevere, halting her escape. Remember well all the lessons I have taught you. You will find that you have need of them.
Lady Sunshine ran in her trim white spacecraft to Amabile, which was one of the playground worlds of men. She had in mind to leave her planet and Madame Osevere far behind her. There was freedom and gaiety on Amabile, which there never was on Osevere, and Lady Sunshine tumbled headlong into it. It looked like fun, sporting with rich and handsome men and lovely carefree women. She threw herself into the whirl and let it do with her as it would. She was stripped clean by Amabile. She was demeaned and debased by it. She played at pleasure ever harder and harder, trying to find an end and never finding it. Instead, she found that she had good use for every lesson she had ever learned from Madame Osevier. She did many pointless and destructive things that you would not enjoy hearing about. She discovered that the people of Amabile and the people who came to Amabile were as bent as the people of Osevier. Was Madame Osevier right? Was this life? Was this the entirety of life? Lady Sunshine woke one day on Amabile. She was alone and she hated herself and what she had become. In desperation, she fled. She ran again in her spaceship, desperately lunging from world to world in search of a planet that was not as monstrous as Amabile or Osevere. She was strong in pursuit of her purposes, and it became her purpose to find somewhere among the ninety worlds of the dispersion one world where she would not be bent. But she did not find it. She came to Beatus from the planet of Cromati, which was her sixty-first planet. She was tired and hopeless. She had had small hope of Cromati. It was for her not a place of search, but a place of retirement. She had stayed at the home of Lord Brain, who was her grandmother's vassal on Cromati. It was unnecessary for Lady Sunshine to encounter anything more of Cromarty than Lord and Lady Brain for her to know that this was not the planet she sought. It was more of the same. Lord Brain had persisted in trying to amuse her with his minute knowledge of fashion that was new to him, but that was irrelevant, not to mention old to her. His manner was unctuous subservience, which made his matter all the more difficult to endure. For her part, Lady Brain preferred to meditate aloud on her few well-savored moments of interaction with people of importance, my people. She spent much time in calculation of various stratagems by which the miracle might be repeated and presented these to Lady Sunshine in hope of approval of the arithmetic. They inflicted a house party upon her when all she sought was a moment of peace in which to reorder her own priorities and they pressed at her a ninny who styled himself the Count de Pagan. He was a pale shadow of the men of Amabile, but by the testimony of Lord and Lady Brain, he was the best that Cromarty had to offer. He pursued her everywhere, urging her to allow him the privilege of harvesting her grapes ere winter's deadly finger touched her vines with frost. He did not know what she was. He did not know what she had been. He did not know how much his proposal sickened her, and he did not know what she truly sought. None of them knew. They said to her, You are such an inspiration, my lady. It is enough to know there is one like you, a lovely butterfly flitting from world to world to give us hope. Or, I have never traveled through space, and I have no intention of ever doing so. Cromarty is quite good enough. Whatever you may think of me, I do not care. I am quite satisfied with myself. So there. Or, forget your fantasies of escape, my sweet Jen. You have no need of other worlds. Reality is here. Find the world here in my arms. She said, Jen is not a name for your use, Count. To you, I am Lady Sunshine, and turned away. At last, in desperation, she allowed herself to shock and bewilder them with a brief and partial glimpse of what she really was. In her ship, she raced a pilot hired in a pool organized by the Count de Pagan. The pilot's reputation was considerable on Cromarty. 
she scandalized the party by carelessly distributing the whole sum of the wagers she had won and had insisted on collecting to their various servants and mechanicals. And even so, they did not understand that there had been no risk to her in the race. Even less did they understand that her demonstration of power was no pleasure to her, since it furthered her purposes in no regard. At best, it furthered the purposes of Madame Osevere, who was pleased to see the power and repute of Osevere spread farther abroad. To Lady Sunshine, it was a surrender to her own weakness. She announced her intent to leave immediately for the planet of Beatus. That was a convenient name for her escape, snatched out of fleeting house-party conversation. Beatus, someone had said, was a place where, for morale, the people wore buttons that said, Beatus is not as bad as Beaten say it is. Everyone nearby but Lady Sunshine laughed familiarly. The man added, Only it is. Who ever heard of Beaten speak ill of Beatus? And everyone laughed again. Lady Sunshine had heard of Beatus. It was one of the ninety wells of the dispersion, and it was not far from Cromarty. But she had never heard anything of Beatus to make her think it was the planet she sought where she would not be bent, and she had had no plans to visit the place. For Cromarty, however, Beatus was more than a miserable place. It was the local wellspring of humor. What is the difference between old earth and Beatus? That caught her attention. Lady Sunshine had an interest in old earth, the source of the varieties of man. Several unacceptable answers were tried to general amusement before the proper answer was given. Nothing. Both are unfit for human habitation. She asked about Beatus. Beatans, the jokesters said, were squat and unhealthy men who lived in a deadly blue murk and made machines that did not perform properly. They were guaranteed to operate only on Beatus or in the hands of Beatans, but Beatans did not travel well through the transitions of hyperspace, and no one else would willingly live on Beatus. What is the difference between a fool and an idiot? A fool is a man with a machine from Beatus. An idiot is a man who travels there. Oh, you've heard it before, Lady Sunshine said. But the men of Beatus are professional machinists? Of necessity. It is only by virtue of their machines that men live on Beatus at all. It was small wonder that Lord and Lady Brain were frank enough to ask how they might have offended her and the means by which they might repair their error. But Lady Sunshine proposed to ruin their house party entirely. Her distribution of the money she had won had shocked Lord Brain, but he had accepted it. He had placed his own wages on her because that was where he thought his advantage lay, whether she won or not, and he had been amazed and pleased by the result. But now this, desertion in mid-party for Beatus of all places. Lady Sunshine was politic. She did not inform Lord and Lady Brain that she preferred the blue fog of Beatus to the pleasures of their hospitality. No, she chose instead to tell them that she traveled to Beatus on the chance that it might supply her with a machine, a remote planetary analyzer, that she needed for her purpose. You traveled to Beatus in search of a machine? Yes, Lord Brain. For a machine? Yes, Lord Brain. Lady Sunshine had nothing left to her but her purpose. She had no better place left than Beatus to search for a planetary analyzer. But what shall we tell your grandmother when she inquires? If my grandmother should inquire after me, said Lady Sunshine, tell her that I have gone to Beatus. But she did not think that her grandmother would inquire. Madame Osevere had given Lady Sunshine permission to find out where her best interest lay, and she did not interfere with her now. She was too busy otherwise to do that. It was in discouragement that Lady Sunshine came to Beatus. Her purposes were come to nothing, and she feared that Osevere and Madame Osevere, waiting patiently for her, were the sum of greatest possibility that yet existed. She hated the thought. Even the transitions of hyperspace, usually a tonic bath, 
a stimulation of every nerve, were no answer for her discouragement and her lack of hope. The fight against hyperspace left her drained and weary. When she was given leave to land on Beatus and was brought down through the murk to a safe landing on a planetary grid, she discovered that the worst that Cromati had to say of the place was understatement. The men of Beatus seemed hardly human. They were lumpish and hairy creatures, and they did wear buttons that said, Hang on, Beatons, and if you think it is bad here, you should see where the Munglies live. But Lady Sunshine had seen where the Munglies live, and Beatus was worse. It was the most unfortunate and minimal home of man that Lady Sunshine had ever visited. The machines of Beatus pounded away eternally to keep the men of Beatus alive in their holes and warrens. The cold blue fog of Beatus penetrated even through the protective equipment that she wore. It was corrosive. It made her eyes sore and watery, her throat raw, her lungs painful. It confused her mind and upset her balances. Every moment she spent here demanded double the time elsewhere for recuperation. But yet she had come here for the sake of her search. The men of Beatus, whatever else might be said of them and their planet, were technicians and machinists. So down she went into their warrens, doing her best to ignore the seeping blue fog and the pulsing throb of the great machines. She made her usual inquiries and offered her usual inducements. I seek a machine by which I may inspect a planet such as Beatus from orbit without the necessity of landing on a grid. A remote planetary analyzer. I am prepared to bear whatever expense is involved. But all that she received was the usual response. My lady, why inspect Beatus remotely? We have a landing grid firmly in place, and after all, here you are. I mean to inspect planets that have no landing grids. Pardon my laughter, my lady, but what reason could there be to inspect a planet that lacks a landing grid? If it was worth landing on at all, it would already have a grid so that ships might land there. And other familiar responses. How about another novelty, just as good, my lady, but different? And it is not possible, begging your pardon, but even to contain such a machine would require a naval vessel of unprecedented size. It is beyond your resources, whatever your willingness or ability to pay. And slyly, how much money might be advanced for preliminary researches into the matter. One answer was not usual. It came from a belligerent, lumpish little man who wore not one, but three buttons boosting Beatus. What do you suggest? As all Beatus knows, at the dispersion, men were settled on the best existing planets. If a better world than Beatus existed, we would be living within it today. Since we are not, it is hardly in my best interest to build a planetary analyzer, now is it? I am not the fool you take me for. But then one day a man who was lumpish and hairy like other Beatons, but who had more seeming confidence than most Beatons, since he wore no buttons, came to her and said, Please follow me. The envied one wishes to see you in his hole. Who is the envied one? The man was taken aback. Why, himself, the Magoon, the mirror in which Beatus sees its hopes reflected. Ah, the Magoon of Beatus, Lady Sunshine recalled him now by this title. The Magoon was not the mirror for all Beatons, but there were many on Beatus who surrendered the care of their hopes to him. He was a very mysterious figure, reputed to live in deeply dug seclusion. Why does he wish to see me, she asked. I don't know, said the man. I am but a messenger. There was no hope left in Beatus for Lady Sunshine, but no greater hope elsewhere, so she followed the messenger. She was passed from one pair of confident hands to another, deeper and deeper, until at last she was ushered into a room where the cold blue fog penetrated only in faint nauseating wisps, and there she met the Magoon himself. The Magoon of Beatus was not beautiful. He was almost as queer and humorous as his title. Like less important men of Beatus, he had been bent by his planet and made squat, lumpish, and hairy. He was short and brown. His hands and feet and nose were large. His eyes were sad. 
He was as ugly as a man may be and still be reckoned human. Lady Sunshine pitied and feared him in his awfulness. Above the penetrating humble mumble of great engines, the Magoon said to Lady Sunshine, I understand that you seek a machine that would sense the nature of a planet at a distance. That is true, Magoon, she said, casually mangling his title to demonstrate their true relativity. Why do you have need of such a machine, Lady Sunshine? Why don't you use a landing grid like everyone else? If a planet is inhabited, it does not need your analysis. If a planet is not inhabited, it hardly merits analysis. Do you mean to be some sort of spy whirling about our heads and peering down at us? No, she said. Then state your purposes. After a moment, she said, I mean to go to unsettled planets, planets unknown to men, and analyze their fitness for human habitation. To what point, he asked. Are ninety planets not enough? No, she said. Some planets are more desirable than others. I seek to find new planets and to distinguish between the more and the less desirable among them. I feel that somewhere there must be a planet more desirable than, say, this one. But common sense says that if there were some planet beyond the worlds of the dispersion that was preferable to any world among the ninety, we would be living there now. Ergo, this planet is more desirable than the next best alternative. Lady Sunshine stared directly at the Magoon, even though it was impolite to gaze fixedly at what was so deformed. Will you not agree that in the haste of the dispersion somewhere a planet might have been overlooked that was preferable to Beatus? I cannot believe so, he said. It would be disloyal. Then contemplate this possibility. An error was made five hundred years ago, an agonizing, foolish error. Earth was about to breathe its last, and desperate men, poor clerks, overlooked some better place and condemned their fellows to endure the hell of the Mungly planet forever. The Magoon contemplated the possibility. At last he said, And for this search you need a planetary analyzer so that you may evaluate worlds without landing on them. Yes, she said, it is essential if I am to find a world better than the Mungly planet. But isn't this properly the job of some planetary navy, a major vessel on an extended expedition of exploration and survey? Properly it is, she said, but no navy cares, not even the great navy of Nashua. The interests of Nashua are commerce and power, not search for a hypothetical planet better than that of the Mungli's. It is, however, my chosen work. My computer spends all its available time mulling the probabilities of various candidates for my inspection. I have asked my advisers, the Magoon said, and one and all they seriously doubt whether a ship smaller than a major naval vessel could adequately contain a planetary analyzer that meets your specifications. Is this idle speculation, or could you build such a machine? It is not idle speculation. I command the best resources of Beatus, the best advisers, and the best technicians, and they give me good reason to believe that your desires are impossible. "'unless you have a major naval vessel at your command?' "'No,' said Lady Sunshine. "'Only a modified Pabjelski, Model 7.' "'And she sighed. "'The Magoon said, "'However, other possibilities have occurred to me. "'If you will come—' "'Lady Sunshine inhaled in wonder at the phrase, "'other possibilities, "'but then coughed and choked on a wisp of blue. "'Still, she followed the Magoon "'as he led the way through the intricacies of his warren.' As they passed great pulsing machines, Lady Sunshine held her ears against the noise. But the Magoon had been so bent by his planet that he did not even seem to notice the hulking black monsters. At last they came to a deep interior room at the very heart of the Warren, a child's room with many toys and lathes, workbenches, and small machines. It was equipped with an airlock. It was a strong room against the blue fog of Beatus, and none penetrated here. Lady Sunshine liked the room on that account. The Magoon said, When I was young, I lived my life here. My health did not permit me to leave this room, not even to play in the corridors of the Warren. The machines you see about us were my only given playthings. This was my particular favorite. In fact, I have continued to use it until this day. He patted a metal bowl, polished and featureless, that hung suspended in the air. There was a seat beneath it, the Magoon sat, 
pulled the bowl over his head like a bucket, placed his hands in gloves, and positioned his feet in stirrups. I fail to understand, Lady Sunshine said, but the sad hillock of a man was wandering in his toy. He did not seem to hear her. I do not understand what you mean by this, Lady Sunshine repeated. There was a sudden rap at the door. Lady Sunshine looked again to the magoon, but he was lost to the sound. She answered the door herself. It slid back to reveal a subtle, spidery little mechanical about one and a half feet high, crouching there in the airlock on its universal motivator. It spoke. Lady Sunshine, it said thinly. It is I, the magoon. No, she said. Is it possible? Indeed, the queer little thing said. I present you with an alternative to your planetary analyzer. This, she said, looking down at it. The mechanical hoisted an eye on an extensor until it was on an equal height with her own eyes and stared directly back. The lens of the extended eye flickered and altered. There is green in your eyes as well as brown, the small mechanical said. How very strange. Lady Sunshine looked from the small mechanical to the magoon, lost in the parent machine, and back again. The mechanical rolled into the room on its motivator and demonstrated its agilities before her. It said, I am suggesting that you send a small drone down to the worlds you propose to examine. On board the drone will be a mechanical such as this one. Then, just as I have experienced the surface of my planet of Beatus through my mechanicals, so may you experience the surfaces of these unsettled planets. But what is it like? Lady Sunshine asked of the mechanical circling about her. What is it like? Permit me to test your system for myself. The magoon withdrew his hands from the gloves and raised the large featureless helmet. Consciousness had fled from the mechanical and it balanced lifelessly on its motivator, a mass of inert metals and plastics. The magoon said, I constructed large parts of the original system myself and made all of the later modifications, of which there have been many. Very clever magoon, she said and was glad somehow that she was taller than he, and that he lacked the extensors of his little mechanical to make himself equal to her. With his assistance, she put on the cumbersome helmet over her head and put her hands in the gloves. In spite of the fact that both were large enough to fit the magoon comfortably, it seemed to her that her head was held in a vice and her hands in pinions. She felt loomed about, and she thought that it smelled bad there in the helmet. But at the same time, she could hear with the little robot's ears. She could see with its eyes. She looked across the room and saw the magoon standing over Lady Sunshine in the probe machine, placing her feet in proper position. And yes, she could feel her legs being moved. It was very strange and disassociating to be in two places at once. But then, suddenly, she could feel the floor move beneath her motivator. She pressed with her right foot and swung right. She pressed with her left foot and wheeled. Ha ha! she cried and heard her thin voice with her robot ears. Wow! She tapped at a wall with an experimental extensor as she spun crazily by on her motivator. She felt the shock. She heard the sound almost as though it were immediate. Magoon, she said, this is very shrewd. What is the price of your machine? Its possibilities were incalculable. It was everything the magoon had said. It was a viable alternative. With this machine, she might circle a planet in her trim white spacecraft and see and hear and feel and manipulate it at a distance. That was more than she asked. The magoon stepped in front of the progress of the mechanical. Lady Sunshine pulled up short. Do you propose to buy me, he asked. The wealth of Osevere means nothing to me. I have wealth enough of my own. Do you make me a gift of the machine, she asked. No. Lady Sunshine moved backward on her motivator. Then she stopped again. She pulled her hands abruptly from the gloves with their fingertip controls. She freed her head and looked at the magoon, his back to her, standing before the little mechanical. So there is a price, she said. What must I do to earn the use of your machine? He turned to face her. Lady Sunshine was amazed to see tears in his eyes. He said... I share your ends. I have the hope that there are other worlds where men may live in harmony rather than in disharmony as here on Beatus. I do not believe that these worlds exist, but I dream that they might. Since I am the mirror of the hopes of Beatus, there are many who share this secret dream of mine. 
I have never been allowed to chance travel to other worlds. I do not know whether my dream is true. You may use my machine, Lady Sunshine, if you will find with it a world to exchange for Beatus. Not the Mungli planet. Beatus first. The agony of my people must end. I will, she said. You have my word, Magoon. You may have your choice of the worlds I find. But then she said, There is one small problem that still concerns me. Your machines have a poor reputation on other worlds. How may I be certain that nothing will go awry at a crucial moment? The Magoon waved the criticism aside without rancor. There will be no problem, he said. I guarantee it. I will see the system installed in duplicate, and you have my word that it will work for you in crucial moments. We will see, she said. We will test it on Beatus. Agreed, he answered. Now satisfy my curiosity. You must have given considerable thought to the problem of search. What is your method? I follow the best advice of my ship's computer, Lady Sunshine said. I understand, he said. But on what basis are your computer's choices predicated? Statistical inference, she said. Ah, yes, there are interesting possibilities in statistical inference. But what about intuitional methods? Have they no part in your search? No, intuition plays no part in my search. How did you come to land on Beatus, the Magoon asked. Was that recommended by your computer? No, she said, it was an accident. But it was not an accident. In this universe, those things that are alike find each other out. Affinities gather and computers be damned. What do computers know of true affinity? Only what they are told. Computers are also weak in intuition. They cannot jump to wild conclusions and be justified. It took time to install the double system of planetary probe machines in Lady Sunshine's white spaceship and more time to make the necessary mechanicals and drone landing crafts. All the Magoon's great resources were turned to the problem and he himself oversaw the installation of the probe machines in her ship. Lady Sunshine, meanwhile, practiced operation of the mechanical until she was adept at manipulating it on its motivator and directing its various extensors. It was subtle to operate, and she wished to be in control when the time came to actually explore another world. She also asked her computer to devote its spare time to selection of a choice short list of near places of search for the new world she hoped to find. She was interrupted in this by the need of the Magoon to coordinate the probes with the computer. Computer rectification of imperfect data from the distant mechanicals was absolutely necessary. No matter how directly and immediately one seemed to be in habitation of the mechanical now, the ship's computer was an essential bridging link in exploration from space. Otherwise, what gaps in reality might appear? What blurring? But there proved to be continuing problems of coordination. I don't understand it, said the Magoon. He found it necessary to adjust the probes again and again until at last they were in agreement with the computer. It was a long, slow, and tedious process, but finally it became time to test the probe machine on Beatus from the spacecraft in orbit. The Magoon participated in the test. It was only his second opportunity to see his sickly fog-enshrouded world from space. He had never been allowed to travel when he was young, and his sense of responsibility and best advice had kept him confined to Beatus now that he was older and himself. He was excited. Lady Sunshine beheld him calmly and did not comment on his antics. He was a queer and ugly, hairy brown creature, Magoon was. From orbit, they sent a drone vehicle down to the surface of Beatus. All went well to the Magoon's great delight. When the safe landing of the drone was indicated, Lady Sunshine nodded to the Magoon and donned the probe helmet. But all was not as it should be. It was not as it had been in all her occasions of practice. The helmet did not work. The fingertip controls did not respond. Lady Sunshine became overwhelmed by panic. She smothered. She drowned. She could not breathe in the close confines of the helmet. She could not escape from its grip. At last she fought free of the probe machine. She breathed deeply. She had found it frightening. It was all that she feared that was inert and dead. Then she said, This machine does not operate properly, Magoon. Will your duplicate machine serve any better? Or have I wasted all this great time on Beatus, where the machines are untrustworthy? Perhaps it is a matter of some small adjustment, the Magoon said. He assumed her place. He put his head in the helmet, his lumpish paws in the gloves, his feet in the stirrups. He was gone for a moment while Lady Sunshine waited, peering at his engulfed body. But then he raised the helmet and said, It operates quite satisfactorily for me. 
Try entering the other probe machine, Lady Sunshine. She took the other seat, and after another deep breath, donned the helmet. She found herself in the drone vehicle on the surface of Beatus. She rolled forward on her motivator out of the drone. It was Beatus beyond question. It was horrid where she found herself. The ground beneath her motivators was spongy and uncertain. It was dotted with viscous purple pools that were vile and of unknown depth. They seethed. Virulent, deep blue royals of fog billowed about her. Lady Sunshine rolled forward tentatively on her motivator and found herself almost immediately surrounded by the pools of oily, putrid purpleness, unable to proceed. She paused in the poisoned air and poisoned earth, unable to see, uncertain of her direction. She heard nothing but howling. For the first time in her experience of Beatus, there were no great throbbing machines to show where men made their truces with this awful place. Where to go? She poked a cautious extensor out to test the nearest pool, but paused again in fear that the vileness would dissolve her appendage. Suddenly a great animal of a Beaten, a large misery, came running out of the fog at her. His protective devices were old and inadequate. He was eaten by sores and his hairiness was untended. He splashed through the purple pools and loomed large before her. She saw that he wore a great plate button. It said, I do not understand, Beatus, but I accept it. He cast himself down in the putrid purple slosh. He abased himself before her, coughing and choking and retching in the thick corrosive liquid. He rose and fell in it, thrashing and gasping, but always returning to it. He cried, Your pardon, O great Magoon! I have not been among your followers. Forgive me. I never thought to see you here in this solitary corner of mine. You are my one hope. All to my life. Favor me with your blessing, and I will be your faithful follower forever. I have never had a hope before. This pathetic creature attempted to paw at her. She rolled backward on her motivator to avoid the contact. With one eye she watched him. With the other she looked to her safe footing so that she would not join him by accident in the vile slop in which he wallowed. I am not the Magoon, she said. To her great relief, she saw the second mechanical then. I am the Magoon, it said. It passed her by and rolled up to the Beaten, even into the slop where it rode gently on the surface of the seething pool. That is Lady Sunshine. It was a natural error. Now allow me to bless you. The mechanical soothed and comforted the man who rose dripping from the rottenness into the poison royals of fog. The Beaten reached vainly toward her. Bless me too, Lady Sunshine. Please bless me. My condition must alter. The Magoon looked to her. At last she rolled forward a little distance, reached an extensor out to the man, and touched him with it as a rock might be prodded with a thin stick. Bless you, she said. The man stood and shook himself with happiness, like a wet dog. Oh, grace, grace unforeseen, I do not deserve, but I will be worthy. He ripped off the poor remains of his protective devices and cast them away. He hurled his button into a purple puddle and ran into the fog, shouting and crying his joy. Lady Sunshine said to the other spidery little mechanical, "'Does this happen to you often?' "'Yes,' said the other mechanical that was the Magoon. "'Often. Their hopes are my chief burden. "'Their condition must surely alter.' "'When they faced each other again in Lady Sunshine's orbiting spaceship, "'Lady Sunshine said, "'After that initial difficulty, your machine did all that I could ask. "'I'm more than satisfied, but I must know what went wrong.' The Magoon shook his head. All that went wrong was that you operated the machine alone. That is all. The machines of Beatus need Beatons to direct them. Otherwise they are uncertain. Lady Sunshine said, Then you cannot guarantee the success of the probe when I put it to my own purpose. 
I guaranteed that the probe would work for you, the Magoon said, and it will work if I am present. Therefore, I propose to accompany you in your search. Did you have this in mind from the beginning? Is that why you installed two probe machines? Yes, said the Magoon. You were not frank with me. No. Do you dare to make this journey of exploration, she asked. The best advice you have been given has been not to travel. Do you dare to travel? asked the Magoon of her in return. Who has advised you to make these explorations? No one, Lady Sunshine said. All have advised against it, but it is my chosen work, and I do not stand the dangers from hyperspace that you Beatons do. Who knows what dangers I stand? the Magoon asked. I have never traveled through hyperspace. For that matter, who knows what strange and terrible things you may encounter in the course of your explorations? The unknown may be more frightening and dangerous than you can imagine, and yet you persist. I have reasons for my persistence, Lady Sunshine said, smiling, and I have mine, said the Magoon. She shook her head. You may die, she said. It seemed to her that the Magoon was a frail being for all his gross bulk, and that any great shock might disinhabit this heapish, ugly man as firmly and finally as the inert mechanicals they had just abandoned to the various poisons of Beatus. I may die tomorrow here at home, and what purpose will my death have served then? Better death in search, even fruitless search, than death in stagnation. I must alter the lives of my people, even though I die in the attempt. For good or for ill, I must cast the hopes of Beatus into the wind of the unknown. And no one may do this thing for me. No one may do this but me. So I ask, may I go with you on your journey of exploration? Lady Sunshine could not say no. She, too, would rather die in the search for an alternative to all that she had ever known than return to Osevia to die and become her grandmother. Moreover, if she were to persist at all, it was quite clear that she needed the Magoon to operate the probe machine. Yes, she said, because she could not say no. But she did not like saying yes. It took away from her something that had been hers alone. The Magoon smiled in great relief, and then he said, But before we leave, I must alter your computer. It is your ship's computer that has been at fault through all these days of adjustment and readjustment, and not my probe machines. Beatus, as we just experienced it, is no Beatus that I have ever known before. I have never seen it that blue and vile. Lady Sunshine asked, Do you remember that you were not frank with me? Yes. I have not been frank with you. What do you mean? I have not told you my true purpose. I have not told you all. Do you mean to say that your purpose is not to find somewhere a planet more hospitable to man than the Mongli planet? No, she said, though I am sure that I will find such a place in the course of my search. Then what is your true purpose? Lady Sunshine had confessed her full intent to no one. Who understood her progression from one planet of the dispersion to another in her own spacecraft? Few, very few. They called her a butterfly, admired and dismissed her. Who understood her desire to find new worlds outside the tight bounds of the ninety worlds? Only the Magoon, this singular foreign creature. Who would understand her true intent? She said, my purpose is to find true earth, and that is why you may not change the computer. It holds singular precious data. I do not understand you, Lady Sunshine, the Magoon said. Earth was destroyed long ago. There is no earth any more. There are only the planets of the dispersion. Or do you speak of new earth? That is a fine world, I am told. I have been there, Lady Sunshine said and it is not the place for which I search. It is not true earth. Let me tell you my heart. I believe that in the dispersion men were not taken to the best planets that exist, but were scattered carelessly on first-found worlds. 
I have been on 62 planets, and I know what worlds are like. I have never found a straight one. They have bent us, every one, every one. They have made us strange and separate. They have made us scrambled and aimless. They have made us hateful. I know. I have been everywhere, and it has been like that everywhere that I have been. If New Earth is not True Earth, then for what do you search? asked the Magoon. I search for the one planet where mankind will not be bent, but will grow straight and true. It will not be Beatus. It will not be Osevere. It will not be New Earth, which is but a pale shadow with a name it does not deserve to bear. Until we find True Earth, we will never know what mankind really is. And I know what True Earth will be like. It will have the mountains of Aurora. It will have the forests of New Dalmatia. It will be made of Amabile and Osevere and New Earth and even Beatus. It will be all the best and more of 62 worlds. That is the standard by which my computer reckons. If Beatus was bluer and viler to your eyes than ever before, that is because for the first time in your life you saw Beatus truly and not as it has bent you to see it. The Magoon said, Truer eyes do not improve Beatus. No, I suppose they would not, said Lady Sunshine. But you must realize that by the standard of true earth, every place looks the less, as the men of true earth will outmatch the bent men of Nashua or of anywhere else. Your model of true earth is composed of all the planets that you have visited, the Magoon asked. Yes. What of Beatus was added to the standard by which true earth is to be known? All that which is not blue and vile and lumpish, Magoon, Lady Sunshine said. Now, if you promise not to alter my computer, but accept the truth, then you may still accompany me. You may still venture your adventure, and by the way we will discover many worlds that are better than Beatus. Your dream of true earth seems a fancy to me, said the Magoon. I do not dare to dream your dream. I hardly dare to dream my own dream. But I agree. Let us travel together in search of our dreams and discover what we may. The Magoon's departure was opposed by his advisers and his dependents, but he would not be gainsaid. He dared to risk all for his dream, and he prevailed over men who did not. He addressed his people as a whole and named to them the purpose for which he meant to travel. And, as his hope was their hope, they responded as one, and his advisers must then change their advice. So is it always, when all is risked for a dream. And so the two set off together in search of a better world than Beatus. But though they traveled together, Lady Sunshine and the Magoon of Beatus were not yet partners. Lady Sunshine traveled in search of her own purpose, not the Magoon's. She searched for true earth, the world where her unity would not be bent as it was bent and twisted on other planets. The presence of the Magoon aboard her ship was no more than a means to this end. Lady Sunshine and the Magoon traveled through hyperspace to the nearest place of those selected for search by the computer. Hyperspace was a stimulation and a joy to Lady Sunshine, a welcome antidote to the debilitations of Beatus. For the Magoon, hyperspace was a shock that left his sad eyes even sadder, but that was an expected reaction. He seemed to survive it ably enough. Lady Sunshine asked if he were all right, and he said that he was. They emerged from hyperspace near a sun that was living green fire. Lady Sunshine pursued the directions indicated by her ship's computer and found a planet, an unknown world, a candidate for true Earth. She settled the ship into orbit around the planet and with the advice of the computer launched a drone. The Magoon looked down at the mystery that waited below them. This is more than I ever expected, he said, and so soon. At this moment I can almost believe in your true earth, but I will be more than satisfied if this world is the superior of the Mangli planet. But what they discovered was not equal to the Mangli planet, not as a place of human habitation. 
It was not even to be preferred to Beatus. The two mechanicals rolled forth from the drone. There was nothing to be seen in the somber green light of the distant sun that was not rock or shadow. The shadows were ripe violet in color and strangely cast. There were no clouds in the sky. No wind breathed. All was silence. Lady Sunshine wheeled slowly on her motivator, looking all about them. The magoon stood still, but slowly rotated an eye. The rock that surrounded them was brown and green and red, black and gray. In some places these colors were separate, in others they were streaked and intermixed. The texture of the rock also varied independently of color. In some places it was delicately roughened, like the hide of a beast. In other places it was as smooth as though it had been finished. And yet, as they looked about them, each in his own separate way, they saw that in still other places it was slick and polished, like a natural glass in which they might see themselves reflected. There were no straight lines anywhere. All was curves and undulations. The rock was rippled in places like the surface of a pond, and otherwhere it was waved like the surface of an ocean. It was molded in many ways. In the absence of other life, rock had grown here after its own ways, unmodified. It had slowly fashioned itself. It had made itself into fairy spires, into private abstractions and unknown plastic shapes. Or it brooded through time, considering what it would become. It was many, but it was all one, for there was nothing in this world but rock and the shadow of rock. It was natural, but its nature was strange to them, as they were strange to this place. As they looked about them, they saw that the drone had landed on top of a great singular rock formation, so that they looked at the world about them from a height among heights. They were very near the brink of a smooth and graceful swoop to destruction. They did not speak to each other, these two mechanicals. How much time passed as they looked about them, they did not know, for they did not reckon time. If this world was strange, it was all the stranger for being judged by the standard of true earth. That standard was not applicable here. No computer could rectify what the mechanicals perceived, but only make their perceptions more singular and unique. Nothing here could be judged by any human standard. It had its own reasons for being. At last, Lady Sunshine said, This is not the world I seek. She struck at the rock with an edged extensor. The rock gave forth a light hollow sound as though it were brittle. Then it chipped. Now there was a great visible mar in the perfect surface of the planet. Nor is it the world I seek either, said the magoon. His voice rang thinly, overwhelmed by the towering rock about them. And yet, he said, to think that we stand here where no other sentient observers have ever stood before. Could there be a lonelier place than this? What we see now has never been seen before. When we leave it, it will remain unchanged through the eons, never to be seen again. But the planet gave counter-evidence. Where it had been chipped, the rock healed itself. Where it was marred, it slowly grew smooth again. Where fragments lay, they were absorbed by the mother rock. And then something most strange and awesome happened. The rock face shrugged beneath them. A great blind ripple passed through the surface of the rock as the hide of an elephant might involuntarily shudder to dislodge a fly. Lady Sunshine was nearer the edge of the formation, close to the long, shattering swoop to the lower rock. The surface beneath her motivator was slick, and she could not gain traction. The rock undulated again, and she was skidded against her will toward the great hurtling slope. She was helpless to stop her progress. She spun her motivator futilely. The magoon did not move to aid her. He watched her silently. And then, as another wave passed, he fell over. She wondered why he made no effort to rise. He was far away. She was helplessly sliding, falling, and destruction had her. It was like a slow and silent dream. 
Then the helmet of the probe was lifted and she was free and safe. The magoon, that brown and hairy creature with great large nose and deep sad eyes, looked down at Lady Sunshine. She was disoriented. I think the mechanicals were best abandoned, he said. That world is no place for us. Yes, she said, still falling. Yes. And they did not discuss the world of rock further then. It was too strange a place to be lightly spoken of, and their experiences were too much with them. They put that world far behind them. They went immediately from there to the second place of search indicated by the computer. This was the solar system of a flawless and brilliant white sun. But search as they might, they found no planet there in the place predicted by the computer. They paused while the computer reintegrated its data. And during that pause, they took silent thought. It was only when they were to leave that they finally were able to speak to each other about Eterna, the rock world. In the meantime, it occurred to Lady Sunshine that her ship's computer had failed in its first two attempts to find true Earth or even a world preferable to Beatus. These failures were, of course, discountable, She had asked the computer for its nearest and best choices, and these had merely been nearest. Nevertheless, the Magoon might have criticized the computer for its double failure, and had not. She liked him for that, and she liked him for not making an unnecessary fuss over the pains of hyperspace, which she suspected that he suffered and hid. She found that she thought of him as specifically ugly less often now than before. At last the computer suggested rather abruptly that they had spent altogether too much time in this wasteland solar system where no hospitable planet was likely to be found, so they prepared to leave this sterile emptiness around the white sun. We have our release now, Lady Sunshine said. Let us strike out to see what better place we may find waiting for us at our third rendezvous. There is no need to feel disappointment, the Magoon said. We have had a good beginning. One planet in two attempts is a good beginning. It is more than I expected. And that planet was worthy of a visit, said Lady Sunshine. It was like a cathedral of some forgotten religion. It was awesome and majestic, but also incomprehensible and inhuman. Did you think so? asked the Magoon. I felt the same, but I thought it must have been a disappointment to you, since it was so clearly not true earth. No, said Lady Sunshine. That visit was not one I would repeat, but I would not surrender it. The slow power of that place overwhelmed me. I think it has followed another road than ours, one far slower and less headlong, one less improvised, one more well considered. Even before life arose on old earth, I believe that planet was making itself. It has never considered an alternative to being rock. If impetuous man and that which impetuous man becomes are not the true way of the universe, then the rock of that world may slowly demonstrate its own truth. It is an alternative to us. We may not criticize it, but only leave it abide. I am sobered by such patience, said the Magoon. I wonder on what day we will communicate with that world. And on what terms? said Lady Sunshine. And to what ends? The third hyperspace transition was longer and more oblique than the first two they had made. Lady Sunshine had always accepted oblique and acute hyperspace transitions as much the same. Now, for the first time, she realized that there were qualitative differences between the two. The sun of this new place was pink, Lady Sunshine called the Magoon to view it, and he rose from his bunk once again when they were settled in orbit and she announced another new world in place beneath them. A new world, a new enigma, exclaimed the Magoon. It looks promising. I wonder what it will reveal to us. It is an enigma better resolved with your probe than with the planetary analyzer I never found, Magoon, Lady Sunshine said. I would not like a remote and bloodless examination half so well as this direct engagement. 
With a mere analyzer, we would have known no more of the rock world than its unsuitability for human habitation. But are you certain you wish to explore so soon after travel? We may rest, if you like. I feel a responsibility to your people for you. You have no responsibility for me, said the Magoon. My fate is not in your hands, except now and then, and by the way. You are not one of my advisers, Lady Sunshine, but there are times when you sound like them. I apologize, said Lady Sunshine. And rightly so, he said. Let us explore now, then. But as soon as Lady Sunshine saw the planet, she knew it was not true Earth, whatever else it might be. True Earth would have no room for a place as dull as this. The drone had landed on a featureless gray plain. The sky above was a lighter shade of gray. Plain and sky met at a distant, seamless horizon. A tired wind lifted a handful of dust and then let it settle in dribbles. As they silently looked about them at the new world they had found, a great furry-winged flying creature came flying ponderously near and then was eventually gone, lost to sight in the grayness. In great excitement, the Magoon said, Why, this is fantastic. Look at the gauges. Perceive how habitable this world is. Why, it is my dream. Was this place better than Beatus? Lady Sunshine inspected her meters and then double-checked them against the Magoon's readings. All readings were startlingly normal, as though this grayness were somehow a boring and temperate average, a mediocre mean. Indeed, seemingly this dusty flat would make a suitable location on which to place row on row of long houses. Lady Sunshine said, I wonder if your people of Beatus would be happy here. It seems monotonous after the varieties of your planet. The Magoon raised an eye on an extensor a great distance in the air and looked all about them. He fixed finally on the direction that the flying creature had flown. I see a grove of green in the distance, said the Magoon. Since you seek variety, let us go investigate it. As we travel, let us propose names for this world we have found. Perhaps later when we know it better said Lady Sunshine. They rolled on their universal motivators over the dusty plain in the direction that the Magoon had indicated. The ground was so hard that they left no visible marks of their passage. Lady Sunshine said, Does this place delight your heart, Magoon? Indeed it does, he said. It is living proof of my dreams. I can hardly believe in a world as habitable as this. If I were not within this mechanical and unable, I would hug myself. A strange reaction, unless, of course, one had never known any world but Beatus. Do you not wonder why I have been so discouraging? Have you been discouraging? asked the Magoon. I have not noticed that you have been. Perhaps it is a failure in the perceptions of your mechanical, said Lady Sunshine, for I have been being discouraging. This planet may be better than Beatus, but it is not much of a planet. You would stop here and rest content. You would not? Of course not. I have traveled more than you, Magoon, and I have never seen a planet more lacking in grace. It may be habitable, but it would bend you worse than Beatus has bent you. You would be very strange then, your betness compounded. We have been here only briefly and distantly, and I feel oppressively bent already. The Magoon said anxiously, But perhaps we have already been more than fortunate in finding two planets. How many more than this will we find? Many. In the course of my search for true earth, many. Worlds so almost perfect that they will make you weep and your teeth ache. Take your people of Beatus there. Or take them here if you still prefer. We will remember where this nameless temperate flat was. I will not forget at any rate. But what of this world's groves of green? asked the Magoon. Lady Sunshine raised her own eye on its extensor. This gave her the peculiar experience of seeing both near and far simultaneously. With her lower eye, she looked at the Magoon. With her extended eye, she looked in their direction of travel across the Grey Plain. She asked, If there are other groves of green on this planet, are they also giant cabbages? Giant cabbages, Lady Sunshine? asked the Magoon. 
I cannot believe that my grove is giant cabbages. It is not, Lady Sunshine said. It is one single solitary giant cabbage. That is your grove entire. Do you wish to look for yourself? Slowly, in his piping voice, the mechanical that was the Magoon said, I think you are testing my devotion to this world. I have always found cabbages peculiar. He rolled forward. Pull your eye in, he said. Let us continue. We will discover soon enough if you are testing me. Lady Sunshine looked at him with her extended eye, changing the magnification until she saw him whole and clear. He looked quite strange from this angle. Very well, she said, but I for one propose that we name this place Cabbage Flat. The ground under their motivators was now less hard. It was damper and darker. When the green grove was clearly visible to them, even at their proper minor height, the ground had turned to black mud, which tried to admire them. But their universal motivators were more than equal to mud. Instead of rolling, they now slid smoothly over the top of the bog. When they came closer, it became apparent that Lady Sunshine had not been testing the magoon. The grove of green was indeed a single huge plant bearing a distant but distinct similarity to a gigantic cabbage. It was the center of the local dampness. Indeed, close about it the mud was thick liquid, a sloppy black muck. Though the great enfolding leaves of the massive vegetable were apparent to them at a distance, the magoon did not admit its nature until they were close upon the enormous green and purple bulk. He stopped in the muck and studied his grove. You are right, he said at last. It is very like a giant cabbage. Do you wish to examine it more closely? asked Lady Sunshine. Or does it wish to examine us more closely? asked the Magoon. Does it seek to eat us? The black muck around the cabbage had begun to swirl slowly. As they rested on the slop, they were being pulled around in a spiral toward the cabbage. Around and around and closer and closer they were brought to the plant. It looked much the same on all sides. A few leaves spread high and wide, the rest folded together in a central bolus. They were closer than Lady Sunshine liked when the Magoon finally said, I have seen as much of this peculiar vegetable as I care to see. Let us retreat a distance. The swirl on which they were carried seemed so inexorable that Lady Sunshine wondered if they could retreat or whether they must again abandon their exploratory vehicles. But, in fact, their motivators propelled them easily across the spiraling tide of muck. They settled at a more comfortable distance. The pull of the swirling current increased, but they resisted it, floating easily in place. It increased yet again, but never becoming more than a frantically stolid movement. They held their place against it lightly. Again you see the advantage of your probe to my analyzer, said Lady Sunshine. An analyzer would have given us a very different picture of this world. It would have reported that this place was temperate, but not that it was cabbage flat. The Magoon said, If the planetary analyzer were properly made, and if you had a battleship to contain it, it would take such things as cabbages and flatness into consideration. Suddenly the mud around them ceased its churning. In moments, the face of the bog was still again, the last ripples fading away. Observe your meters, said Lady Sunshine. This planet is less habitable now than formerly. Its disharmony now exceeds that of Beatus. And indeed, their gauges did show that the atmosphere around them had become radically altered. There was now an over-concentration of several potent chemicals. I suspect the source is the cabbage, said the Magoon. Does it seek to attract us, to overcome us, or to repel us, asked Lady Sunshine. How can one tell with a cabbage? Perhaps it is attempting to communicate with us. The bog began to swirl again, but this time in the opposite direction. Instead of the cabbage drawing them in, it was now doing its best to push them away from itself. 
They resisted the movement of sludge and continued to hold their places to see what would happen next. Then, without warning, the great central bolus of the cabbage fell apart. The overlapping leaves flapped back with the sound of ship's canvas filling. They spread wide, opening the plant, but still hiding its interior from their view. A large, furry-winged flying creature, perhaps the same that they had seen earlier, leaped into the air with a raw-voiced cry. It flew to them and seized the little mechanical that was the Magoon of Beatus. It carried him up into the air away from the cabbage with great effortful wing beats and flew away into the grayness. Lady Sunshine looked at the unfolded vegetable. She was too small to see over the great spread leaves into the mystery of its interior. She looked with her other eye at the moving thing in the sky, now only a single undefined spot. She magnified the spot until she saw it clearly again as flying creature carrying mechanical. She did not know what to do. Lady Sunshine abruptly pulled her hands from the gloves and raised the featureless metal helmet. It was quiet there in the ship, in orbit. She might as well have been all alone. She looked at the magoon. She rose and went to him. Should she rescue him from the machine as he had rescued her? He was more experienced in its use than she. He might not be as lost as she had been. Would he not abandon the mechanical if he were dropped from a height? She observed him until she was certain that the magoon was still in voluntary control of his mechanical's faculties. She saw his feet work his motivator with smooth and knowing precision, and she knew that he was well. Lady Sunshine left him then and ran back to her probe machine. She had left her curiosity unsatisfied. She hurriedly resumed her place. She pulled the helmet back over her head. The cabbage had managed to push the mechanical she inhabited to the very edge of the muck while she was gone, but she wished to penetrate its towering bulk. She wished to see from where the flying creature had come. But the resources of her mechanical exploratory vehicle were insufficient. Lady Sunshine raised her extensible eye to its limit, but the green and purple plant would not let her see its unknown interior. It denied her. It lifted its leaves in a tremendous effort that cracked the air loudly and folded itself together again. Lady Sunshine looked all around her again. In the distant sky she saw the flying creature returning. She magnified her vision and saw that it was empty-handed. It was returning for her, but she would not let it have her. She withdrew from the probe machine to save herself. She saw the magoon rising and standing free of the other machine. Are you all right, Lady Sunshine? he asked. Yes, she said. What happened to you, magoon? It was quite strange. The flying creature carried me back to the drone and set me down with another raucous cry. Then it flew off without looking back, returning again to the vegetable. What happened to you? Nothing, she said, as though she did not realize the limitations of the mechanical that had just been demonstrated to her, as though she had not been afraid. Then she said, While you were being carried... Did you think of a better name for this planet than Cabbage Flat? No, said the Magoon. Cabbage Flat it will be. This is not the planet to replace Beatus. I see now that your dream is a better dream than mine. Mine will produce nothing but Cabbage Flats. But in looking for your dream, perhaps we will find that world better than Beatus, for which I and my people hope. Let us look on. What is the next place on your computer's list? The sun that Lady Sunshine saw before her when they emerged from hyperspace was radiant gold of a lustrous richness more orange than yellow. It glowed like her hair, or like a treasure house. But the Magoon did not rise from his bunk to witness it, though it was lovely. He was not yet recovered from the hyperspace transition. Seek our new world, true earth, he said. Don't fix your attention on these pains of mine, which will pass. 
You are a dear creature, Magoon, said Lady Sunshine, and turned again to her piloting. She followed the statistical inferences of her computer and found a planet not too very far from where one was predicted to be. She settled into orbit around it and allowed the computer to calculate the most probable optimal destination for the drone. But when all was ready, the Magoon was still in pain. He said with great effort, I have not been candid with you, Lady Sunshine. I have been more affected by hyperspace than I have allowed you to know. You should have told me so, that I might have returned you to Beatus, she said. No, what is important is your dream of true earth and the fruits of that dream. But are you sure that you can survive another transition? No, but that does not matter. You need me, and now I have failed you. The Magoon ceased to speak then. He did not respond to Lady Sunshine. He was very sick, and she did not know what to do. She found that he had armed himself with medicine, and that he had used it all. She spoke to him, but he did not answer. She touched him. She washed his face. She felt ashamed. The Magoon's motives and behavior had been so much nobler than her own. She had selfishly insisted on pursuit of her private goal at all costs. But what had been her true goal? To demonstrate to Madame Osevier all that Madame Osevier denied? To show her that there was a world somewhere in which Lady Sunshine could be someone else and not the creature that Madame Osevier had made? For this petty end, she had used the Magoon willfully, taking no notice of his pain, discounting it, ignoring it. She had not cared what he needed or suffered, because she had required his services. What were her choices in this moment of the Magoon's collapse? She could take him to Beatus. She could take him by the easiest acute hyperspace transition to one of the ninety worlds, but any hyperspace transition might kill him. Then there was this new enigma, this unknown planet below them, that might be more living rock or more cabbages and flying creatures. This planet might be anything. If, with all her great skill, she brought her trim white spacecraft down to the planet in the absence of a landing grid, then, in spite of her great skill, they would never be able to leave this world again. They would be bound to it forever. Lady Sunshine was lost in the twists of a great paradoxical knot. She had brought the Magoon to this place to operate the probe machine, because she could not. Now, however, the Magoon could not operate the probe machine, because she had brought him here through hyperspace to operate the probe machine. It was for the Magoon's sake that the probe machine was necessary now to explore the world below them but without his ability to operate it, the probe machine was useless. Because Lady Sunshine had brought the Magoon through hyperspace to operate the machine, because she could not. It was a horrible knot. It made no sense. She could not land on this planet. Neither could she fly elsewhere through hyperspace. Neither could she do nothing. She cried in agony. She was alone, more alone than ever before in her life. She was a unity, a singularity, and it was not enough to be that. She had but one temporization available to her. If she sent the drone down to the planet, the Magoon might recover sufficiently to activate the probe so that they might determine whether or not to land themselves on the secret world below, the unknown planet of the Golden Star. She pressed the button to launch the drone, but when it had landed safely... The Magoon had not recovered. The squat brown creature, ugly and dear, continued to lie unconscious in his bunk. While she looked, he suddenly cried and thrashed behind the glass. Then he became still. Terror-stricken, she pulled the ship's emergency unit from its private closet. The Magoon was still alive, but he was much worse. She strapped him in and attached the emergency unit. The computer monitored his functions. She could keep him alive in this fashion, but for how long? For the first time, her self-sufficiency failed her. 
even in her worst moments on Amabile or in her most discouraging moments of search, she had not been this helpless. She had never needed aid before. Aid? That was not the way of Madame O'Severe. That was not the way of mankind. Each for himself, above all, each for himself, until one stood alone atop the pyramid, master of all, above all, one. It suddenly occurred to Lady Sunshine that she had operated the mechanical on Cabbage Flat after the Magoon had quitted the system. He had been standing apart from the machine when she had raised her helmet. Was it possible for her to operate the probe without him? Poor Magoon, she said, and touched him. He did not respond, but lay inert in the grip of the emergency unit. She closed the glass. She checked the automatic functions of the ship. Mind your business well, she said to the computer. Then she went to the probe. She sat down, placed her feet in the stirrups, pulled the helmet over her head, and put her hands into the gloves. And immediately it seemed to her like the first time she had tried to operate the machine around Beatus. She was aware of rigidity. Her head was gripped closely. Her hands were imprisoned. Her legs were dead. But what did that matter? The machine operated. She could see. She could hear. It was as though she were on the unknown world and not lost in a computer-rectified machine somewhere in orbit above it. Lady Sunshine looked at the other mechanical beside her, still and silent. She looked out of the drone into the world that awaited her beyond. It was amazing. It was seeming Arcadia. It was Eden. It was trees and grass and brilliant golden sunshine. It was a jolly little brook and an alternation of perfect hills stretching to the horizon. Can this be true earth? she asked but the other mechanical gave her no answer. She would have to discover for herself. Amabile had been attractive at first appearance, and also other planets, before they revealed their bentness. She labored her mechanical body out of the drone. It was an annoyance to labor, but somehow she was unable to work the mechanical smoothly. Her fingers had forgotten themselves. Her feet were asleep. Was the difference the missing Magoon, or was it somehow this planet? Then suddenly she careened forth, ran in a desperate curve, spun helplessly on her motivator, and fell over. A wise little bluebird twittered mockingly at her. It watched her flail to rise and jeered again. She watched it take to flight as she lay. It disappeared in midair, leaving nothing but a swimming moat of emptiness in her vision. She could not believe what she saw. Had she imagined that she saw the bird? Had she imagined that she saw it disappear? She finally managed to lever herself upright. Her mechanical body seemed heavy and out of balance. Her control was uncertain. At any moment she feared that the mechanical would have a lurching fit or suddenly refuse to answer her intended direction. She could only move at angles, not in direct forward progression, so she tacked one way and then another in order to proceed. Was this true earth? Lady Sunshine wondered why she did not love its golden perfection better. But then she looked more closely. This was difficult because her mechanical eyes would not focus. But she saw that the world had a plasticine quality. It was overripe. It melted into itself in a way she did not like. Trees intertwined themselves blindly, groping at each other with long tendrils. There were strange, distant animals in this pastoral land, moving together. As she watched, a doggish creature, not a dog, more than a dog, rubbed itself intimately against a tree and then urinated on it. Not knowing why, she was again reminded of a mobile. But why? She watched a creature that was like a golden-furred rabbit hopping idly on the hillside. It disappeared like the bird, and then appeared again. There were strange spots of blankness in her vision. The colors of this world drooped and threatened to run together, to spill and mix and whirl. There were flickers at the edges of her eyes. She spun her eye around to catch them, but though she rotated it madly, 
they always managed to elude her. She did not like this place. It made her uneasy. And yet, to appearance, it was perfect and golden, like some California or Hui Brazil. Was the fault in the machine, or was it this place? She moved forward, tripped over something she didn't see, skated wildly, fell, bounced fortuitously, and came to rest upright. It was so strange. She could not move properly. She could not see clearly. Lady Sunshine felt the need of the magoon. There were spaces in her expectations, and she was deeply disturbed. She began to watch one particular area of blankness in her vision, a swimming nest that moved this way and then that and could not be pinned down. She was determined to see through it. She raised an eye on an extensor to see it from a height. She did this with all due carefulness, lest she fall over, which she felt that she might do. She watched the moat with separate eyes, and it did not go away. She became certain that it was not the computer that was at fault. It was not the mechanical. It was not herself. The source of strangeness lay in the planet. She heard a piercing squeal which unnerved her. Then suddenly the blankness, that blankness, was no longer there. Instead, she saw a black rabbit creature mounted on the golden rabbit she had seen before. It turned its face to her as it thrust and pumped, and she saw that it had long, sharp, unrabbit-like teeth. Then it fell off and lay panting, its little pink penis extended from its furry sheath. The golden doe tried vainly to hop away, but the black buck leaped up again. It seized the golden doe by the neck and bit down savagely. The doe squealed again, and then its neck was broken. It thrashed helplessly, exposing its underbelly. And then Lady Sunshine saw that it was not a doe at all, but another buck, and that it had an erection of its own in the throes of death. Even before it stopped moving, the black rabbit creature fell to feeding on its warm body. Lady Sunshine retracted her extended eye. She feared she could not move without falling with her vision radically split. She moved forward carefully. She was successful except for one inadvertent, reckless lurch. The rabbit thing continued to feed greedily on its fellow until she was close. Then it lifted its head, gave her a knowing look, hastily licked the blood from its black-furred mouth with a delicate pink tongue and hopped away into an anomaly. It was gone into a swimming blur, disappeared again. The look it gave Lady Sunshine remained with her. It had included her somehow in its crimes with that look, and the knowledge frightened her. She wanted to separate herself, but the golden corpse remained, bloody and mangled, lying on the hillside as though it were hers, her property. Abruptly, a loud moan began, starting low, rising, breaking into howls. What was that? It was painful and intimidating. It unnerved her to hear. It came from nowhere and from everywhere. It surrounded her and filled her ears, filled her world. It was as though the whole uncertain planet was shrieking its pain at her. Lady Sunshine wished that it would stop. When it became too much, she cried for it to stop. It stopped. Then two people suddenly appeared. They seemed to walk out of a bush with brown and crumbling leaves. One was a woman with long black hair and sharp foxy features. She led a man who was covered with overlapping triangular scales. Both were naked. Her muff hair was as golden as the dead rabbit creature. His penis was slippery and wet and dripped mucilaginous strings of gleet. Lady Sunshine was amazed to see people here. This planet was not one of the ninety worlds of the dispersion from old earth. Naked people. The woman saw Lady Sunshine first. She put one hand to her muff and the other to her mouth, sucking her fingers in a parody of concern. She prodded the man with an elbow and made a suggestive twaddle to Lady Sunshine with the fingers from her crotch. 
Then the woman and the man walked through each other and were a place of emptiness. They were not visible, gone, impossibly gone. Lady Sunshine tried to calm her distress by placing the worlds of origin of the two naked people. They seemed definite types, as definite as the Magoon from Beatus, as definite as a lace-veiled butterfly from O Severe. These people were formed, malformed, bent into special shapes. But Lady Sunshine could not remember any place where the people looked so vulpine, or any place where men had evolved scales like a pineapple, and that was even more distressing. In the emptiness about her head, there were suddenly tears, screams, and silence. Silence. Then more screams. She looked wildly about her. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing but golden sunshine and the sky as blue as the benighting fog of Beatus. The planet uttered a final explosive raw-voiced agony which turned to laughter and trailed away. There are those who need time to get used to it here, someone said in an exquisite throaty voice. The voice came out of nowhere. And then there are those who take to it right away. The voice seemed to come from above, out of a tree. A mass of creepers, tendrils and black writhing vines lowered itself. There was a flickering within the web, at times flashes of paleness, at other moments only writhing blackness. The squirming nest reached the ground and broke open, but there was nothing within the tentacles but unfocused shimmer, an anomaly. Then a dryad stepped forth out of the nothingness. She was fat, middle-aged, coy, and horrid. She was naked and flabby and white as rice. She looked like an evil pig, a great festering wound, a gummer had eaten away most of her nose and turned it into an open snout. A few of the black creepers broke away from the main mass and remained with her, winding and twining intimately about her body like snakes. Where they touched her, they left welts on the whiteness like intense broken red veinlets. The creature of the tree, this dryad, reached out to Lady Sunshine, who started back from her, nearly toppling. May I touch you? the dryad asked pleasantly. I want very much to touch you. May I? I like to be the first to touch new people. It is almost my only vice. The gummer seemed to shift on her face. Her nose was now there, where it had not been before. It was a red blobby thing. But now part of her forehead was eaten to the bone, which showed whitely through the open wound and a lip was lifted high to reveal skeleton teeth smiling at Lady Sunshine. No, said Lady Sunshine. She did not want to be touched. Above all, she did not want to be touched. The dryad said, I just thought that I would ask while it occurred to me. You mustn't think I was insisting, just because it occurred to me. She walked in a circle around Lady Sunshine, while Lady Sunshine watched her with a wary, rotating eye, ready to lurch if the dryad attempted to move in her direction. Then suddenly the dryad sat down beside her. She stroked and petted her various creeping companions, and moved a favored thick black tendril into her crotch, where it curled itself around her leg and snuggled intimately. The dryad licked her lips obscenely, tongue running over white teeth where she had no lip, and leaned toward Lady Sunshine. Lady Sunshine inched away. From what planet do you come, my dear? she inquired. Oh, severe, Lady Sunshine said. Originally. Oh, severe. That's nice. That is such a distance to have come. Your need for us must have been very great. Why, that means that sooner or later I will see more of you, doesn't it? But it would be so nice to be first. You are so sweet and fragile. I do like that in a girl. The dryad, that fat fountain of unknown delight, suddenly stood again. You must excuse me, really, she said. I have tarried too long with you. 
But here is someone new that has been sent to me, and I must not be selfish, must I? She turned and galloped off to intercept one of the distant animals that Lady Sunshine had seen, which now approached them. Or was it a man? Or a boy? Or was it a creature part human and part something other than human? Lady Sunshine could not say. His genitals made him male, but he had the narrow-hipped, smooth-muscled body of an adolescent boy. His skin was mottled green and yellow, and seemed of different textures, smooth where it was yellow, pebbled like a turtle or lizard where it was green, everywhere hairless. His tiny head was bald and chinless, and bobbed atop a neck fully two feet long, as though it had a life of its own separate from its body. This strange and improbable creature took no notice of the maiden of the tree come tripping to intercept him. He detached a bit of yellow from his green leathery body, tossed the gobbit into the air, and snapped it down with a lunge of his long neck. Lady Sunshine realized then that the yellow patches on his skin were fleshy, moving things like creeping leeches. He plopped another with great relish into his lipless mouth and bulged his eyes hugely. Match for unity, the dryad challenged him. She seized him by his limp, dangling member, and her black creeper familiars bound him to her otherwise. He nodded and picked a yellow blob off his body. He squeezed it until it popped and ran like dripping custard. He smeared it on her face, and she gagged and sputtered. One for me, he said, laughing. Unity. They began to contend, to wrestle, to twine like the trees of this planet. The doggish creature that Lady Sunshine had seen earlier came trotting over as they swayed for advantage. It sniffed them closely, snapped at their genitals, and was slapped smartly by the thick tendril that the dryad wore as guardian of her privacy. The doggish one whined, and then deliberately urinated on them. Unity, it said audibly, and trotted briskly away. Lady Sunshine was amazed to hear it speak. The gross dryad never let go of the green boy's penis. She ripped at it with her nails. She gnawed at it with her skeleton teeth. She rubbed and snorted it in her decayed nose. Lady Sunshine could hardly bear to watch. The turtle boy whimpered and chittered at her attack, but in spite of all her painful work, he did not yield to her. He had weapons of his own. He bashed, nudged, and butted her blindly with his small bald head on its long neck. He struck her again and again with great blows. With soft, nailless fingers he strove to pry away the thick black tentacle that protected her. He suddenly broke away with a triumphant cry, holding the tendril. His neck grew stiff, his tiny head grew dark and engorged. He struck the dryad with her tendril, and she screamed and loosed her grip on his penis. The green boy creature made the dryad bend and present her rear to him. He whipped her with the tendril, and she screamed with each blow. Her body was a mass of red whelks. He cried, louder, louder, and whipped her even harder. Then he penetrated her with his bald head on its long neck. He plunged into the dryad again and again, and she filled the world with the sound of her pleasure and agony. The tendrils that clung to her stood out from her body and writhed blindly. And then, at the climactic moment when the green leather-skinned creature was about to expend himself within her, somehow the black tendril he used as a whip wrapped itself tightly around his neck. He was blocked, prevented. The tendril squeezed tighter and tighter, and the rising tide within him had no outlet. He withdrew his lipless, chinless head. He was under stress. He was in dire straits. He pointed to his neck desperately. With his other hand, he pried vainly at the thick tentacle. His green skin was almost black. The dryad snapped his neck with sharp, impertinent fingers. She slapped his cheeks. She prodded him in the gut. At last, she recovered her black companion and stood aside. The boy rang the world with his howl. 
Then he vomited gouts of delayed yellow matter that had been blocked from ejaculation. One for me, the dryad said. Unity! Unity, everyone cried and applauded her. They knew a winner when they saw one. The poor sick boy looked at the great crowd that had gathered. He retched and cried. He flickered madly and then disappeared. The dryad showed her teeth in her most hideous smile and then yawned elaborately. She passed her black familiar between her legs. It wrapped itself around her right leg and nestled into its home again. Lady Sunshine looked at the many beings gathered around her. It was impossible to say how many there were because they became and they unbecame. All of this awful world threatened to come unpinned about her now. There was more flicker than stability. All the strange and naked people she saw standing around her in the dark rainbow drip and swirl were diseased, or they were deformed, or they were inhuman. There was one being that looked like a baboon with immensely swollen genitals. It had the face of a lovely woman. It sat on the ground and played with crawling spiders. A woman with skin like rough tree bark fondled a balloon-headed dwarf. A creature with the body of a man and the head of an elephant groped them both with its trunk. The woman seemed to be unaware of where she was, of what she did, and of what was done to her. The dwarf smirked. Another woman with twin lines of dugs that stretched from chest to groin lay on her side on the ground while an assorted brood of squirming things fought each other for her tits. Two fought to the death. Their wet nurse picked up the parts of their bodies and tossed them to the sharp-toothed rabbit thing which savaged them. Lady Sunshine whirled on her motivator, but everywhere she looked it was the same. She felt dizzy. This place was not an accident. It was intentional. It was directed at her. It was a trap for her. She had a vision of this planet, plants, animals, humans, and creatures in between, all intertwined in one great rapacious, battling, steaming, creaming, moaning, sucking, fucking, slavering, groping, dying, crying, pyramidal unity. The creatures whirled in a sickening flux around her and sang to her, Earth is dead, nothing matters, sufferance, desolation, pleasure, unity, forever and ever, amen. Lady Sunshine was bewildered and beset. Who shall initiate her into the mysteries? the creatures asked. The dryad stepped forward. She wriggled her wet and gaping snout. I saw her first, she said. I should have first turn. You had your first turns, darling, said a filthy grandmother with a neck that hung in wattles like a turkey and empty withered breasts. She gnawed on the leg bone of a child. But I have experience, and experience counts. Match experience, said the dryad. Match your unity against mine. Very well, said the grandmother. Have a nibble, she said, and handed her bone to the dryad. And you, said the dryad, handing her black companion to the ancient. The fat dryad munched at the leg bone. The filthy old woman tried to bite the wriggling creeper she held, but it evaded her and struck at her wrinkled neck. The old woman snapped like a mongoose, and the tendril was caught and bitten in two. It fell limp. The dryad shuddered and ululated, then she flickered and was gone. One for me, said the old one. Unity! The crowd shuddered and cried, One for you! As you see, it is experience that counts. Oh, what I will teach this sweet child! But then a man stepped forward, naked except for black socks. In this company he was unusual, because he looked fully human. He did not flicker at all unless you watched him very closely, and his dark hair was neatly combed. He said, you forget me. I did forget you, Dr. Rong Song, said the grandmother, but only for the merest moment. Let us step aside and match ourselves one against one. Dr. Rong Song smiled sincerely. 
One against one, he said. Unity, said everyone. Unity above all. They all disappeared. The man, the grandmother, and all the various creatures. The world around Lady Sunshine shattered, sharded, pinwheeled, blurred, spilled, swirled, and ran. There was only one stability in all the chaos. That was the doggish creature. It came sniffing up to Lady Sunshine. She tried to back away from it, but could not move. Try to leave, said the doggish creature. Just try to leave us. You will find that you cannot. We are yours and you are ours. I will be last. I'm always last. But in the end, there will be one for me. To her horror, it lifted its leg and urinated all over her, and she could not prevent being marked. Unity, it said. Then it disappeared too. Lady Sunshine was helpless and alone, lost in lovelessness. She tried vainly to move, but her head was vice-gripped. Her hands were cuffed. Her fingers were paralyzed. She could not move her motivator. She could not extend her extensible eye. She could not rotate her rotatable eye. She could not leave the mechanical. She could not retire from this place. She could not take her ship through hyperspace and escape as she wanted. She could not move at all. She knew now why this place reminded her of a mobile, but it was far more terrible than a mobile had ever been. She realized that Madame Ossevia was right. She had hoped to remain aloof from corruption. She had longed to remain untouched, but now she was lost, eternally damned. This was the entire universe, forever and ever, and it was the same everywhere. Disease, decay, death, evolution. O severe equal amabile equal beatus. As counterpoint to her thoughts, this planet played for her its single eternal song of ecstatic revulsion, of solitary abandonment and humiliation. It filled Lady Sunshine's head and heart as the one real thing. But no, there was a realer thing. There was one hope. There was true earth. Somewhere there was true earth. No matter what else, there was true earth. The awful keening stopped as abruptly as it had begun. There was silence, long, empty silence. Then the sincere man stepped into being through the swirling, colorful dissolve. He was alone. Dr. Ron Song's hair was still perfectly in place, but he was now missing a sock. Lady Sunshine saw that his bare foot was not human, but was other. Here I am at last, he said, licking his lips and teeth clean of blood. Have I kept you long? Lady Sunshine looked blindly at him and tried to hold on to her dream of true earth. You think you understand now, Dr. Rong Song said. But of course you don't. You must be dominated. Experience is the only true teacher. She protested. I don't understand. I won't understand. No false innocence. You say you don't understand, but of course you do. Deep in your heart you do. You did not come here by accident. You sought us out. This is the place for which you have longed. What do you mean? she cried. This is true earth. No, if this was true earth, then there was no hope. And now you must be touched, Dr. Rong Song said. He reached out, and she could not prevent him. She could not resist. She could not help herself. There was no escape. Escape? To what? To where? He touched her. He spun her ruthlessly on her motivator, and around and around she went. She spun in her mind, helplessly. Hopelessly she cried, cried, cried to be saved. And then... All around Lady Sunshine, the dissolving, spinning world split apart, and there was light. The helmet of the probe machine was lifted from her head, and she lay open to the radiance of a new universe. Magoon, she said, it's you. 
He had come somehow out of his coma, out of the grip of the emergency unit, from behind his closed doors. The magoon was naked and hairy. He dripped tubes, wires, and broken needles, but he took no notice of them. His eyes were for her, otherwise unseeing. He said, I heard you call for me, and I came. She hugged and kissed him desperately. Bless you, Magoon, she said. This is an awful place, and we must get away from it. The Magoon looked at Lady Sunshine. This is the place, he said. I know it. There is no other. And he collapsed. She cried and laughed and gasped because he was hurt and he was her love. She plucked the thorns and darts from him. With impossible strength, she carried him in her arms to her bed. She had not yet thought of him when she said they must leave, but now she did think of him. She thought of him above herself. The Magoon could not go elsewhere than this planet, and she must take him there for his sake. If this was true Earth, it did not matter. One place was like another. The one thing she was sure of was the Magoon, and if they were together, it did not matter where they traveled. The Magoon transformed the universe. She kissed him and tenderly stroked his hairiness. Then she turned to her piloting. With the aid of the computer and her own skill, she brought her white spaceship safely to land, not far from the drone on this planet without landing grids, this awful world she had just quitted, and felt relief. Not far distant, Lady Sunshine could see her former mechanical body. It stood alone, abandoned, inert. But something was strange. She felt as she had never felt before in all her life, and she did not know what it meant. She glowed within herself. Her heart was lifted. What did it mean? This was not the way it had been when she inhabited the mechanical. That was remote and queer. And this might almost be a different world. Or was the difference in her? This world was changed. It was not the same. She saw it differently. She threw open the doors of the spaceship and stared about her in wonderment. The planet was lit from within itself. Colors were everywhere, pure and luminescent. They glowed and streamed with inner life like the slowly pulsing breath of a stained glass dove. The planet was filled with notes that hummed and fluttered and chimed. Occasional notes that came and went, or stayed, or changed. Rare harmonies, and the colors interplayed and shifted with the notes of the song the planet sang. All in goldenness and sunshine. The Magoon joined her, risen from her bed, and she turned to him. He was well. He was healed. His eyes were no longer sad. He was beautiful. He was beautiful, but at the same time, no less the Magoon that had been. He was not altered. He was transfigured. And he smiled at her. Lady Sunshine looked at him, and in him she saw enhanced all that was good in herself and all that was glorious in this strange planet. She loved him not as ultimate truth, but for the ultimate truth that she saw within him. And if he was made well, so was she, she who had not even realized that she was sick. A great oppression that had been with her always was now lifted, and it was only with its passing that she realized its existence. She who had been bent was no longer bent. I love you, my dear Magoon, she said. In you I see more than I can ever say. And I love you, he said. It was then that they became partners, 
They were no longer solitary, selfish unities, but were joined together in a oneness that was more than either of them, that was more than their sum. They exchanged names. Hers was Janet. His was Lester, which means lustrous. She had never told her true name to anyone before. They turned to the planet again and went out into the world together, hand in hand. Lady Sunshine cast her white clothing from her and let herself be touched by the winds of color. They played on her body and she laughed in surprise. She was lifted into the air on a chiming note and became part of the dance of color and the song of songs. She was ecstatic. Her bare body sailed in the iridescent, streaming rainbow swirl. It was all so strange and wonderful. It was the same world that she had encountered before, but it was seen with transformed eyes. As they played, knowledge came to them. It surrounded them. Knowledge was this world, and in their play they became knowledge. They knew truth. There was no more bentness. They saw the computer standard of true earth as the poor, partial composite that it was. This planet could not be recognized by any sum of addition. It was of another order. They saw the probe mechanicals in all their inadequacy. How could truth be perceived as truth by means of this fractional version of human perception? It could not. And they saw themselves for what they had been, distorted, half-human creatures. And they knew other things. Together, Lady Sunshine and the Magoon laughed and shouted, rolling through the singing shafts of luminous color. They were together with each other and with this world. They were locked together in oneness. Love was experienced. Love was known to them. This world was love and love was knowledge. Knowledge, love, and knowledge this world. And then suddenly the sounds and colors around them were altered to new orders of complexity far beyond their range. They looked and found themselves in the presence of three people, a boy, a mature woman, and an old man, all clothed in reclarified light. Welcome, they said. Welcome. The celebration of your homecoming is in progress, and we have been sent to bring you. Array yourselves and come. Homecoming, Lady Sunshine said. Is this true earth? They laughed. The woman said, No, true earth is every human world. And Lady Sunshine suddenly perceived, O severe equals true earth equals beatus. The magoon, Lester, the lustrous one, said, Yes, yes, and now I know how to make the ninety worlds true earth. Of course, the boy said, that is what you came to learn. Lady Sunshine said, but if this is not true earth, what place is it? This is Livermore, the old man said. This is the world where everything is possible to those who can perceive. When it was fully time for Lady Sunshine and the Magoon to leave Livermore, there was another celebration. Then the others made a grid in their minds to hurl the white spaceship into space. They went first to Osevier by long passage. Hyperspace was no trial now to the Magoon, for he knew better. Madame Osevier said, so, you are returned at last. You took long enough about it. You gave me permission to find out where my best interests lie, Lady Sunshine said. And here you are. I should not have thought it would take you this long. 
Who is this grotesque that accompanies you? Lady Sunshine said, This is the Magoon of Beatus. He is my love and partner. You have never had good judgment, said Madame Osevia. You have never known what was important and what was not. My patience with you is nearly at an end. You must rid yourself of this monster if you would be my instrument. I will not be your instrument, said Lady Sunshine. I know now where it is that my best interests lie, and they do not lie with you. I disown you, said Madame Osevere. You are not a serious person. Lady Sunshine and her partner, the Magoon, travelled to Beatus. There they turned the mighty machines of the planet to new purpose. They changed the blue fog into dissipating mist and performed other wonders. Lady Magoon and the sunshine of Beatus. And that was not the last of what they did. They healed many worlds, among them Osevia. Alexei and Corey Panshin write, We were married in June 1969, just before the bright and hopeful days of the 60s that produced Sergeant Pepper and Lord of Light were declared officially dead by Richard Nixon, Spiro Agnew, and John Mitchell, six months before Altamont. Darkness and confusion hadn't yet seized control. Woodstock, the last muddy flower of the counterculture, was still two months away. But signs were already in the air. In the week before we were married, Alexei finished his third Anthony Villiers story, Mask World, a book with a darkness of tone that wasn't there in the two that came before it. Both our apartment leases ran out that summer. Alexei is in New York, Corey's in Cambridge. We looked for a new place to live, but we could find no place for ourselves in the city. Then, in August, through a chain of circumstances totally strange, we found ourselves living in isolation on a farm in Elephant, Pennsylvania. Do you know the story of the elephant in the dark? If you passed through Elephant, Pennsylvania in the dark, you wouldn't even know it was there. The farm is on a hilltop. At night, the stars are bright overhead. People and society are only rumors, glows at the horizon. But what is the center of things, and where is the periphery? Elephant has been a place to think, a stillness in the midst of storms, a calmness in the midst of confusion. We have done a lot of thinking here about who we really are and what we are doing. Our three-year series of columns in Fantastic, probing into the mysterious nature of science fiction, was a product of Elephant. Elephant has also been a place in which to change. The greatest part of Farewell to Yesterday's Tomorrow, a book of short stories about the possibility and necessity of change, was written in Elephant. So is our novel, The Son of Black Morka, which is about giving up one self-definition in favor of another. So was Lady Sunshine and the Magoon of Beatus. If the darkness and night of Mask World were an unconscious anticipation of the decadence and repression of the early 70s, then what have we unconsciously anticipated in Lady Sunshine? A lifting of clouds? New brightness? For a Single Yesterday by George R. R. Martin Keith was our culture, what little we had left. He was our poet and our troubadour, and his voice and his guitar were our bridges to the past. He was a time-tripper, too, but no one minded that much until winters came along. Keith was our memory, but he was also my friend. He played for us every evening after supper. Just beyond sight of the common house, there was a small clearing and a rock he liked to sit on. He'd wander there at dusk with his guitar and sit down facing west. Always west. The cities had been east of us. Far east, true, but Keith didn't like to look that way. Neither did the rest of us, to tell the truth. Not everybody came to the evening concerts, but there was always a good crowd, say three-fourths of the people in the commune. We'd gather around in a rough circle, sitting on the ground or lying in the grass by ones and twos. And Keith, our living hi-fi in denim and leather, would stroke his beard in vague amusement and begin to play. 
He was good, too. Back in the old days, before the blast, he'd been well on his way to making a name for himself. He'd come to the commune four years ago for a rest, to check up on old friends and get away from the musical rat race for summer. But he'd figured on returning. Then came the blast. And Keith had stayed. There was nothing left to go back to. His cities were graveyards full of dead and dying, their towers melted tombstones that glowed at night. And the rats, human and animal, were everywhere else. In Keith, those cities still lived. His songs were all of the old days, bittersweet things full of lost dreams and loneliness. And he sang them with love and longing. Keith would play requests, but mostly he stuck to his kind of music. A lot of folk, a lot of folk rock, and a few straight rock things and show tunes. Lightfoot and Christofferson and Woody Guthrie were particular favorites. And once in a while, he'd play his own compositions, written in the days before the blast. But not often. Two songs, though, he played every night. He always started with They Call the Wind Mariah, and ended with Me and Bobby McGee. A few of us got tired of the ritual, but no one ever objected. Keith seemed to think the songs fit us somehow, and nobody wanted to argue with him. Until winters came along, that is, which was in a late fall evening in the fourth year after the blast. His first name was Robert, but no one ever used it, although the rest of us were all on a first-name basis. He'd introduced himself as Lieutenant Robert Winters the evening he arrived, driving up in a jeep with two other men. But his army didn't exist anymore, and he was looking for refuge and help. The first meeting was tense. I remember feeling very scared when I heard the jeep coming and wiping my palms on my jeans as I waited. We'd had visitors before, none of them very nice. I waited for them alone. I was as much a leader as we had in those days, and that wasn't much. We voted on everything important, and nobody gave orders. So I wasn't really a boss, but I was a greeting committee. The rest scattered, which was good sense. Our last visitors had gone in big for slugging people and raping the girls. They'd worn black and gold uniforms and called themselves the Sons of the Blast. A fancy name for a rat pack. We call them SOBs, too, but for other reasons. Winters was different, though. His uniform was the good old U.S. of A., which didn't prove a thing, since some army detachments are as bad as the Rat Packs. It was our own friendly army that went through the area in the first year after the blast, scorching the towns and killing everyone they could lay their hands on. I don't think Winters was part of that, although I never had the courage to flat-out ask him. He was too decent. He was big and blonde and straight, and about the same age as the rest of us. And his two men were scared kids, younger than most of us in the commune. They'd been through a lot, and they wanted to join us. Winters kept saying that he wanted to help us rebuild. We voted them in, of course. We haven't turned anyone away yet, except for a few rats. In the first year, we even took in a half dozen city men and nursed them while they died of radiation burns. Winters changed us, though, in ways we never anticipated. Maybe for the better. Who knows? He brought books and supplies, and guns, too, and two men who knew how to use them. A lot of the guys on the commune had come there to get away from guns and uniforms in the days before the blast. So Pete and Crazy Harry took over the hunting and defended us against the rats that drifted by from time to time. They became our police force and our army, and Winters became our leader. I'm still not sure how that happened, but it did. He started out making suggestions, moved on to leading discussions, and wound up giving orders. Nobody objected much. We'd been drifting ever since the blast, and Winters gave us a direction. He had big ideas, too. When I was spokesman, all I worried about was getting us through until tomorrow. But Winters wanted to rebuild. He wanted to build a generator and hunt for more survivors, and gather them together into a sort of village. Planning was his bag. He had big dreams for the day after tomorrow, and his hope was catching. I shouldn't give the wrong impression, though. He wasn't any sort of a tin tyrant. He let us, yeah, but he was one of us, too. He was a little different from us, but not that different, and he became a friend in time. 
and he did his part to fit in. He even let his hair get long and grew a beard. Only Keith never liked him much. Winters didn't come out to concert rock until he'd been with us over a week. And when he did come, he stood outside the circle at first, his hands shoved into his pockets. The rest of us were lying around as usual, some singing, some just listening. It was a bit chilly that night, and we had a small fire going. Winter stood in the shadows for about three songs. Then, during a pause, he walked closer to the fire. Do you take requests? he asked, smiling uncertainly. I didn't know Winters very well back then, but I knew Keith, and I tensed a little as I waited for his answer. But he just strummed the guitar idly and stared at Winters' uniform and his short hair. That depends, he said at last. I'm not going to play Ballad of the Green Berets, if that's what you want. An unreadable expression flickered over Winters' face. I've killed people, yes, he said, but that doesn't mean I'm proud of it. I wasn't going to ask for that. Keith considered that and looked down at his guitar. Then, seemingly satisfied, he nodded and raised his head and smiled. Okay, he said. What do you want to hear? You know, leaving on a jet plane? Winters asked. The smile grew. Yeah, John Denver. I'll play it for you. Sad song, though. There aren't any jet planes anymore, Lieutenant. Know that? It's true. You should stop and think why. He smiled again and began to play. Keith always had the last word when he wanted it. Nobody could argue with his guitar. A little over a mile from the common house, beyond the fields to the west, a little creek ran through the hills into the trees. It was usually dry in the summer and the fall, but it was still a nice spot. Dark and quiet at night, away from the noise and the people. When the weather was right, Keith would drag his sleeping bag out here and bunk down under a tree, alone. That's also where he did his time tripping. I found him there that night, after the singing was over and everyone else had gone to bed. He was leaning against his favorite tree, swatting mosquitoes and studying the creek bed. I sat down next to him. Hi, Gary, he said without looking at me. Bad times, Keith? I asked. Bad times, Gary, he said, staring at the ground and idly twirling a fallen leaf. I watched his face. His mouth was taut and expressionless, his eyes hooded. I'd known Keith for a long time. I knew enough not to say anything. I just sat next to him in silence, making myself comfortable in a pile of fresh fallen leaves. And after a while he began to talk, as he always did. There ought to be water, he said suddenly, nodding at the creek. When I was a kid I lived by a river, right across the street. Oh, it was a dirty little river in a dirty little town, and the water was as polluted as all hell. But it was still water. Sometimes at night I go over to the park across the street and sit on a bench and watch it. For hours sometimes. My mother used to get mad at me. He laughed softly. It was pretty, you know. Even the oil slicks were pretty. And it helped me think. I miss that, you know. The water. I always think better when I'm watching water. Strange, right? Not so strange, I said. He still hadn't looked at me. He was still staring at the dry creek, where only darkness flowed now, and his hands were tearing the leaf into pieces. Slow and methodical they were. Gone now, he said after a silence. The place was too close to New York. The water probably glows now, if there is any water. Prettier than ever, but I can't go back. So much is like that. Every time I remember something, I have to remember that it's gone now. And I can't go back, ever, to anything, except, except with that. He nodded toward the ground between us. Then he finished with a leaf and started another. I reached down by his leg. The cigar box is where I expected it. I held it in both hands and flipped the lid with my thumbs. Inside, there was the needle and maybe a dozen small bags of powder. The powder looked white in the starlight but seen by day it was pale, sparkling blue. I looked at it and sighed. Not much left, I said. Keith nodded, never looking. I'll be out in a month, I figure. His voice sounded very tired. Then I'll just have my songs, 
and my memories. That's all you've got now, I said. I closed the box with a snap and handed it to him. Cronine isn't a time machine, Keith, just a hallucinogen that happens to work on memory. He laughed. They used to debate that way back when. The experts all said cronine was a memory drug, but they never took cronine. Neither have you, Gary, but I know. I've time-tripped. It's not memory. It's more. You go back, Gary, you really do. You live it again, whatever it was. You can't change anything, but you know it's real all the same. He threw away what was left of his leaf and gathered his knees together with his arms. Then he put his head atop them and looked at me. You ought to try and trip some day, Gary. You really ought to. Get the dosage right, and you can pick your yesterday. It's not a bad deal at all. I shook my head. If I wanted to time trip, would you let me? No, he said, smiling but not moving his head. I found the cronine. It's mine. And there's too little left to share. Sorry, Gary. Nothing personal, though. You know how it is. Yeah, I said. I know how it is. I didn't want it anyway. I knew that, he said. Ten minutes of thick silence. I broke it with a question. Winters bother you? Not really, he said. He seems okay. It was just the uniforms, Gary. If it wasn't for those damn bastards in uniform and what they did, I could go back. To my river and my singing. And Sandy, I said. His mouth twisted into a reluctant smile. And Sandy, he admitted. And I wouldn't even need croning to keep my dates. I didn't know what to say to that, so I didn't say anything. Finally, wearying, Keith slid forward a little and lay back under the tree. It was a clear night. You could see the stars through the branches. Sometimes, out here at night, I forget, he said softly, more to himself than to me. The sky still looks the same as it did before the blast, and the stars don't know the difference. If I don't look east, I can almost pretend it never happened. I shook my head. Keith, that's a game. It did happen. You can't forget that. You know you can't. And you can't go back. You know that, too. You don't listen, do you, Gary? I do go back. I really do. You go back to a dream world, Keith. And it's dead, that world. You can't keep it up. Sooner or later, you're going to have to start living in reality. Keith was still looking up at the sky, but he smiled gently as I argued. No, Gary, you don't see. The past is as real as the present, you know. And when the present is bleak and empty, and the future more so, then the only sanity is living in the past. I started to say something, but he pretended not to hear. Back in the city when I was a kid, I never saw this many stars, he said, his voice distant. The first time I got into the country, I remember how shocked I was at all the extra stars they'd gone and stuck in my sky. He laughed softly. Know when that was? Six years ago, when I was just out of school. Also last night. Take your pick. Sandy was with me, both times. He fell silent. I watched him for a few moments, then stood up and brushed myself off. It was never any use. I couldn't convince him. And the saddest part of it was, I couldn't even convince myself. Maybe he was right. Maybe for him that was the answer. You ever been in the mountains? he asked suddenly. He looked up at me quickly, but didn't wait for an answer. There was this night, Gary, in Pennsylvania, in the mountains. I had this old beat-up camper, and we were driving through, bumming it around the country. And then all of a sudden this fog hit us, thick stuff, gray and rolling, all kind of mysterious and spooky. Sandy loved stuff like that, and I did too, kind of, but it was hell to drive through. So I pulled off the road, and we took out a couple of blankets and went off a few feet. It was still early, though, so we just lay on the blanket together and held each other and talked, about us and my songs, and that great fog and our trip and her acting and all sorts of things. We kept laughing and kissing, too, although I don't remember what we said that was so funny. Finally, after an hour or so, we undressed each other and made love on the blanket, slow and easy, in the middle of that dumb fog. Keith propped himself up on an elbow and looked at me. His voice was bruised, lost, hurt, eager and lonely. She was beautiful, Gary. 
She really was. She never liked me to say that, though. I don't think she believed it. She liked me to tell her she was pretty, but she was more than pretty. She was beautiful, all warm and soft and golden, with red blonde hair and those dumb eyes that were either green or gray, depending on her mood. That night they were gray, I think, to match the fog. He smiled and sank back and looked up at the stars again. The funniest thing was the fog, he said, very slowly. When we'd finished making love, and we lay back together, the fog was gone, and the stars were out, as bright as night. The stars came out for us. The silly, goddamn, voyeuristic stars came out to watch us make it. And I told her that, and we laughed, and I held her warm against me, and she went to sleep in my arms while I lay there and looked at stars and tried to write a song for her. Keith, I started. Gary, he said, I'm going back there tonight, to the fog and the stars and my Sandy. Damn it, Keith, I said, stop it. You're getting yourself hooked. Keith sat up again and began unbuttoning his sleeve. Did you ever think, he said, that maybe it's not the drug that I'm addicted to? And he smiled very broadly, like a cocky, eager kid. Then he reached for his box and his time trip. Leave me alone, he said. That must have been a good trip. Keith was all smiles and affability the next day, and his glow infected the rest of us. The mood lasted all week. Work seemed to go faster and easier than usual, and the nightly song sessions were as boisterous as I can remember them. There was a lot of laughter and maybe more honest hope than we'd had for quite a while. I shouldn't give Keith all the credit, though. Winters was already well into a suggestion-making period. Things were happening around the commune. To begin with, he and Pete were already hard at work building another house, a cabin off to the side of the common house. Pete had hooked up with one of the girls, and I guess he wanted a little more privacy. But Winters saw it as the first step toward the village he envisioned. That wasn't his only project, either. He had a whole sheaf of maps in his jeep, and every night he'd drag someone off to the side and pour over them by candlelight, asking all sorts of questions. He wanted to know which areas we'd searched for survivors, and which towns might be worth looting for supplies and where the Rat Packs liked to run, and that sort of thing. Why? Well, he had some search expeditions in mind, he said. There was a handful of kids on the commune, and Winters thought we ought to organize a school for them to replace the informal tutoring they'd been getting. Then he thought we ought to build a generator and get the electricity going again. Our medical resources were limited to a good supply of drugs and medicines. Winters thought that one of us should quit the fields permanently and train himself as a village doctor. Yeah, Winters had a lot of ideas, all right. And a good portion of them were pretty good, although it was clear that the details were going to require some working out. Meanwhile, Winters had also become a regular at the evening singing. With Keith in a good mood, that didn't pose any real problems. In fact, it livened things up a little. The second night that Winters came, Keith looked at him very pointedly and swung into Vietnam Rag, with the rest of us joining in. Then he followed it up with Universal Soldier. In between lyrics, he kept flashing Winters this taunting grin. Winters took it pretty well, however. He squirmed and looked uncomfortable at first, but finally entered into the spirit of the thing and began to smile. Then, when Keith finished, he stood up. If you're so determined to cast me as the commune's very own friendly reactionary, well, I guess I'll have to oblige, he said. He reached out a hand. Give me that guitar. Keith looked curious but willing. He obliged. Winters grabbed the instrument, strummed it a few times uncertainly, and launched into a robust version of Oki from Muskogee. He played like his fingers were made of stone and sang worse, but that wasn't the point. Keith began laughing before Winters was three bars into the song. The rest of us followed suit. Winters, looking very grim and determined, plowed on through to the bitter end, even though he didn't know all the words and had to fake it in spots. Then he did the marine hymn for an encore, ignoring all the hissing and moaning. When he was finished, Pete clapped loudly. Winters bowed, smiled, and handed the guitar back to Keith with an exaggerated flourish. Keith, of course, was not one to be topped easily. He nodded at Winters, took the guitar, and promptly did... Eve of Destruction. 
Winters retaliated with welfare Cadillac, or tried to. Turned out he knew hardly any of the words, so he finally gave that up and settled for anchors away. That sort of thing went on all night, as they jousted back and forth, and everybody else sat around laughing. Well, actually, we did more than laugh. Generally, we had to help Winters with his songs, since he didn't really know any of them all the way through. Keith held his own without us, of course. It was one of the more memorable sessions. The only thing it really had in common with Keith's usual concerts was that it began with They Call the Wind Mariah and ended with Me and Bobby McGee. But the next day, Keith was more subdued. Still some kidding around between him and Winters, but mostly the singing slipped back into the older pattern. And the day after, the songs were nearly all Keith's kind of stuff, except for a few requests from Winters, which Keith did weakly and half-heartedly. I doubt that Winters realized what was happening, but I did, and so did most of the others. We'd seen it before. Keith was getting down again. The afterglow from his latest time trip was fading. He was getting lonely and hungry and restless. He was itching, yet again for his Sandy. Sometimes, when he got that way, you could almost see the hurt. And if you couldn't see it, you could hear it when he sang, loud and throbbing in every note. Winters heard it, too. He'd have had to be deaf to miss it. Only I don't think he understood what he heard, and I know he didn't understand Keith. All he knew was the anguish he heard, and it troubled him. So, being Winters, he decided to do something about it. He came to Keith. I was there at the time. It was mid-morning, and Keith and I had come in from the field for a break. I was sitting on the well with a cup of water in my hand, and Keith was standing next to me talking. You could tell that he was getting ready to time trip again, soon. He was very down, very distant, and I was having trouble reaching him. In the middle of all this, Winters comes striding up, smiling in his army jacket. His house was rising quickly, and he was cheerful about it, and he and Crazy Harry had already mapped out the first of their search expeditions. Hello, men, he said when he joined us at the well. He reached for the water, and I passed my cup. He took a deep drink and passed it back. Then he looked at Keith. I enjoy your singing, he said. I think everybody else does, too. You're very good, really, he grinned. Even if you are an anarchistic bastard. Keith nodded. Yeah, thanks, he said. He was in no mood for fooling around. One thing, though, has been bothering me, Winter said. I figured maybe I could discuss it with you, maybe make a few suggestions, okay? Keith stroked his beard and paid a little more attention. Okay. Shoot, Colonel. It's your songs. I've noticed that most of them are pretty... down, let's say. Good songs, sure, but sort of depressing, if you know what I mean. Especially in view of the blast. You sing too much about the old days and things we've lost. I don't think that's good for morale. We've got to stop dwelling so much on the past if we're ever going to rebuild. Keith stared at him and slumped against the well. you got to be kidding, he said. No, said Winters. No, I mean it. A few cheerful songs will do a lot for us. Life can still be good and worthwhile if we work at it. You should tell us that in your music. Concentrate on the things we still have. We need hope and courage. Give them to us. But Keith wasn't buying it. He stroked his beard and smiled and finally shook his head. No, Lieutenant, no way. It doesn't work like that. I don't sing propaganda, even if it's well meant. I sing what I feel. His voice was baffled. Cheerful songs. Well, no, I can't. They don't work, not for me. I'd like to believe it, but I can't, you see. And I can't make other people believe if I don't. Life is pretty empty around here, the way I see it. And not too likely to improve. And, well, as long as I see it that way, I've got to sing it that way. You see? Winters frowned. Things aren't that hopeless, he said. And even if they were, we can't admit it or we're finished. Keith looked at Winters, at me, then down into the well. He shook his head again and straightened. No, he said simply, gently, sadly. And he left us at the well to stalk silently into the fields. Winters watched him go, then turned to me. I offered him more water, but he shook his head. 
What do you think, Gary? he said. Did I have a point? Or did I? I considered the question and the asker. Winter sounded very troubled and very sincere, and the blonde stubble on his chin made it clear that he was trying his best to fit in. I decided to trust him a little. Yes, I said, I know what you were driving at, but it's not that easy. Keith's songs aren't just songs. They mean things to him. I hesitated, then continued. Look, the blast was hell for everybody. I don't have to tell you that. But most of us out here, we chose this kind of life because we wanted to get away from the cities and what they stood for. We miss the old days, sure. We've lost people and things we valued, and a lot that made life joyful. And we don't much care for the constant struggle, or for having to live in fear of the rat packs. Still, a lot of what we valued is right here on the commune, and it hasn't changed that much. We've got the land and the trees, and each other, and freedom of a sort. No pollution, no competition, no hatred. We like to remember the old days and the good things in the cities. That's why we like Keith singing. But now has its satisfactions, too. Only, Keith is different. He didn't choose this way. He was only visiting. His dreams are all tied up with the cities, with poetry and music and people and noise. And he's lost his world. Everything he did and wanted to do is gone. And, and well, there was this girl. Sandra, but he called her Sandy. She and Keith lived together for two years, traveled together, did everything together. They only split for a summer so she could go back to college. Then they were going to join up again. You understand? Winters understood. And then the blast. And then the blast. Keith was here in the middle of nowhere. Sandy was in New York City. So he lost her, too. I think sometimes that if Sandy had been with him, he'd have gotten over the rest. She was the most important part of the world he lost, the world they shared together. With her here, they could have shared a new world and found new beauties and new songs to sing. But she wasn't here, and... I shrugged. Yeah, said Winter solemnly. But it's been four years, Gary. I lost a lot, too, including my wife. But I got over it. Sooner or later, mourning has to stop. Yes, I said, for you and for me, but I haven't lost that much. And you, you think that things will be good again. Keith doesn't. Maybe things were too good for him in the old days. Or maybe he's just too romantic for his own good. Or maybe he loved harder than we did. All I know is that his dream tomorrow is like his yesterday, and mine isn't. I've never found anything I could be that happy with. Keith did, or thinks he did. Same difference. He wants it back. I drank some more water and rose. I've got to get back to work, I said quickly, before Winters could continue the conversation. But I was thoughtful as I walked back to the fields. There was, of course, one thing I hadn't told Winters, one important thing, the time tripping. Maybe if Keith was forced to settle for the life he had, he'd come out of it, like the rest of us had done. But Keith had an option. Keith could go back. Keith still had his Sandy so he didn't have to start over again. That, I thought, explained a lot. Maybe I should have mentioned it to Winters. Maybe. Winters skipped the singing that night. He and Crazy Harry were set to leave the next morning to go searching to the west. They were off somewhere stocking their jeep and making plans. Keith didn't miss them any. He sat on his rock, warmed by a pile of burning autumn leaves, and outsung the bitter wind that had started to blow. He played hard and loud and sang sad. And after the fire went out and the audience drifted off, he took his guitar and his cigar box and went off toward the creek. I followed him. This time the night was black and cloudy, with a smell of rain in the air, and the wind was strong and cold. No, it didn't sound like people dying, but it moved through the trees and shook the branches and whipped away the leaves, and it sounded restless. When I reached the creek, Keith was already rolling up his sleeve. I stopped him before he took his needle out. Hey, Keith, I said, laying a hand on his arm. Easy. Talk first, okay? He looked at my hand and his needle and returned a reluctant nod. Okay, Gary, he said, but short, I'm in a rush. I haven't seen Sandy for a week. 
I let go his arm and sat down. I know. I was trying to make it last, Gare. I only had a month's worth, but I figured I could make it last longer if I only time-tripped once a week. He smiled. But that's hard. I know, I repeated. But it would be easier if you didn't think about her so much. He nodded, put down the box, and pulled his denim jacket a little tighter to shut out the wind. I think too much, he agreed. Then, smiling, he added, Such men are dangerous. Mm, yeah, to themselves, mostly. I looked at him, cold and huddled in the darkness. Keith, what will you do when you run out? I wish I knew. I know, I said. Then you'll forget. Your time machine will be broken, and you'll have to live today. Find somebody else and start again. Only it might be easier if you'd start now. Put away the cronine for a while. Fight it. Sing cheerful songs, he asked sarcastically. Maybe not. I don't ask you to wipe out the past or pretend it didn't happen, but try to find something in the present. You know, it can't be as empty as you pretend. Things aren't black and white like that. Winters was part right, you know. There are still good things. You forget that. Do I? What do I forget? I hesitated. He was making it hard for me. Well, you still enjoy your singing. You know that. And there could be other things. You used to enjoy writing your own stuff. Why don't you work on some new songs? You haven't written anything to speak of since the blast. Keith had picked up a handful of leaves and was offering them to the wind, one by one. I've thought of that. You don't know how much I've thought of that, Gary. And I've tried. But nothing comes. His voice went soft right then. In the old days it was different. And you know why. Sandy would sit out in the audience every time I sang. And when I did something new, something of mine, I could see her brighten. If it was good, I'd know it, just from the way she smiled. She was proud of me and my songs. He shook his head. Doesn't work now, Gary. I write a song now and sing it and... So what? Who cares? You? Yeah, maybe you and a few of the others come up after and say, Hey, Keith, I like that. But that's not the same. My songs were important to Sandy, the same way her acting was important to me. And now my songs aren't important to anyone. I tell myself that shouldn't matter. I should get my own satisfaction from composing, even if no one else does. I tell myself that a lot. But saying it doesn't make it so. Sometimes I think, right then, I should have told Keith that his songs were the most important thing in the world to me. But hell, they weren't. And Keith was a friend, and I couldn't feed him lies, even if he needed them. Besides, he wouldn't have believed me. Keith had a way of recognizing truth. Instead, I floundered. Keith, you could find someone like that again if you tried. There are girls in the commune, girls as good as Sandy, if you'd open yourself up to them. You could find someone else. Keith gave me a calm stare, more chilling than the wind. I don't need someone else, Gary, he said. He picked up the cigar box, opened it, and showed me the needle. I've got Sandy. Twice more that week, Keith time-tripped, and both times he rushed off with a feverish urgency. Usually he'd wait an hour or so after the singing, and discreetly drift off to his creek. But now he brought the cigar box with him, and left even before the last notes of me and Bobby McGee had faded from the air. Nobody mentioned anything, of course. We all knew Keith was time-tripping, and we all knew he was running out, so we forgave him and understood. Everybody understood, that is, except Pete, Winter's former corporal. He, like Winter's and Crazy Harry, hadn't been filled in yet. But one evening at the singing, I noticed him looking curiously at the cigar box that lay by Keith's feet. He said something to Jen, the girl he'd been sleeping with, and she said something back so I figured he'd been briefed. I was too right. Winters and Crazy Harry returned a week to the day after their departure. They were not alone. They brought three young teenagers, a guy and two girls, whom they'd found down west, in company with a group of rats. In company is a euphemism, of course. 
The kids had been slaves. Winters and Crazy had freed them. I didn't ask what had happened to the rats. I could guess. There was a lot of excitement that night and the night after. The kids were a little frightened of us, and it took a lot of attention to convince them that things would be different here. Winters decided that they should have their own place, and he and Pete began planning a second new cabin. The first one was nearing its crude completion. As it turned out, Winters and Pete were talking about more than a cabin. I should have realized that since I caught Winters looking at Keith very curiously and thoughtfully on at least two occasions. But I didn't realize it. Like everyone else, I was busy getting to know the newcomers and trying to make them feel at ease. It wasn't simple, that. So I didn't know what was going on until the fourth evening after Winter's return. I was outside listening to Keith sing. He just barely finished They Call the Wind Mariah and was about to swing into a second song when a group of people suddenly walked into the circle. Winter's led them, and Crazy Harry was just behind him with the three kids, and Pete was there with his arm around Jan, plus a few others who hadn't been at the concert when it started but had followed Winter's from the common house. Keith figured they wanted to listen, I guess. He began to play. But Winter stopped him. No, Keith, he said. Not right now. We've got business to take care of now, while everybody's together. We're going to talk tonight. Keith's fingers stopped, and the music faded. The only sounds were the wind and the crackle of the nearby burning leaves. Everyone was looking at Winter's. I want to talk about time tripping, Winters said. Keith put down his guitar and glanced at the cigar box at the base of Concert Rock. Talk, he said. Winters looked around the circle, studying the impassive faces as if he was weighing them before speaking. I look too. I've been told that the commune has a supply of cronine, Winters began, and that you use it for time tripping. Is that true, Keith? Keith stroked his beard as he did when he was nervous or thoughtful. Yeah, he said. And that's the only use that's ever been made of this crony, Winter said. His supporters had gathered behind him in what seemed like a phalanx. I stood up. I didn't feel comfortable arguing from the ground. Keith was the first one to find the crony, I said. We were going through the town hospital after the army had gotten through with it. A few drugs were all that were left. Most of them were in the commune stores in case we need them, but Keith wanted the cronine, so we gave it to him, all of us. Nobody else cared much. Winters nodded. I understand that, he said very reasonably. I'm not criticizing that decision. Perhaps he didn't realize, however, that there are other uses for cronine besides time tripping. He paused. Listen and try to judge me fairly, that's all I ask, he said, looking at each of us in turn. Cronine is a powerful drug. It's an important resource, and we need all our resources right now. And time tripping, anyone's time tripping, is an abuse of the drug, not what it was intended for. That was a mistake on Winter's part. Lectures on drug abuse weren't likely to go over big in the commune. I could feel the people around me getting uptight. Rick, a tall, thin guy with a goatee who came to the concerts every night, took a poke at Winters from the ground. Bullshit, he said. Cronin's time travel, Colonel. Meant to be used for tripping. Right, someone else said. And we gave it to Keith. I don't want to time trip, but he does, so what's wrong with it? Winters diffused the hostility quickly. Nothing, he said. If we had an unlimited supply of cronin. But we don't. Do we, Keith? No, Keith said quietly, just a little left. The fire was reflected in Winter's eyes when he looked at Keith. It made it difficult to read his expression, but his voice sounded heavy. Keith, I know what those time trips mean to you, and I don't want to hurt you, really I don't. But we need that crony, all of us. How? That was me. I wanted Keith to give up cronine, but I'd be damned before I'd let it be taken from him. How do we need the cronine? Cronine is not a time machine, Winter said. It is a memory drug, 
and there are things we must remember. He glanced around the circle. Is there anyone here who has ever worked in a hospital? An orderly? A candy striper? Never mind. There might be in a group this size, and they'd have seen things. Somewhere in the back of their skulls, they'd know things we need to know. I bet some of you took shop in high school. I bet you learned all sorts of useful things. But how much do you remember? With cronine, you could remember it all. We might have someone here who once learned to make arrows. We might have a tenor. We might have someone who knows how to build a generator. We might have a doctor. Winters paused and let that sink in. Around the circle, people shifted uneasily and began to mutter. Finally, Winters continued. If we found a library, we wouldn't burn the books for heat no matter how cold it got. But we're doing the same thing when we let Keith time trip. We're a library, all of us here. We have books in our heads. The only way to read those books is with cronine. We should use it to help us remember the things we must know. We should hoard it like a treasure, calculate every recall session carefully, and make sure, make absolutely sure, that we don't waste a grain of it. Then he stopped. A long, long silence followed. For Keith, an endless one. Finally, Rick spoke again. I never thought of that, he said reluctantly. Maybe you have something. My father was a doctor, if that means anything. Then another voice, and another. Then a chorus of people speaking at once, throwing up half-remembered experiences that might be valuable, might be useful. Winters had struck pay dirt. He wasn't smiling, though. He was looking at me. I wouldn't meet his eyes. I couldn't. He had a point. An awful, awful point. But I couldn't admit that. I couldn't look at him and nod my surrender. Keith was my friend, and I had to stand by him. And of all of us in the circle, I was the only one standing. But I couldn't think of anything to say. Finally, Winter's eyes moved. He looked at Concert Rock. Keith sat there, looking at the cigar box. The hubbub went on for at least five minutes, but at last it died of its own weight. One by one, the speakers glanced at Keith, and remembered, and dropped off into awkward silence. When the hush was complete, Keith rose and looked around, like a man coming out of a bad dream. No, he said. His voice was hurt and disbelieving. His eyes moved from person to person. You can't. I don't... Don't waste, Cronine. You know that, all of you. I visit Sandy... And that's not wasting. I need Sandy, and she's gone. I have to go back. It's my only way, my time machine. He shook his head. My turn. Yes, I said, as forcefully as I could manage. Keith's right. Waste is a matter of definition. If you ask me, the biggest waste would be sending people back to sleep through college lectures a second time. Laughter. Then other voices backed me. I'm with Gary, somebody said. Keith needs Sandy, and we need Keith. It's simple. I say he keeps the cronine. No way, someone else objected. I'm as compassionate as anyone, but hell, how many of our people have died over the last few years because we've bungled it when they needed doctoring? You remember Doug two years ago? You shouldn't need cronine for that. A bad appendix, and he dies. We butchered him when we tried to cut it out. If there's a chance to prevent that from happening again, even a long shot, I say we got to take it. No guarantee it won't happen anyway, the earlier voice came back. You have to hit the right memories to accomplish anything, and even they might not be as useful as you'd like. Shit, we have to try. I think we have an obligation to Keith. I think Keith's got an obligation to us. And suddenly everybody was arguing again, hassling back and forth, while Winters and Keith and I stood and listened. It went on and on, back and forth over the same points, until Pete spoke. He stepped around Winters, holding Jan. I've heard enough of this, he said. I don't even think we've got no argument. Jan here is going to have my kid, she tells me. Well, damn it, I'm not going to take any chances on her or the kid dying. If there's a way we can learn something that'll make it safer, we take it. 
Especially I'm not going to take no chances for a goddamn weakling who can't face up to life. Hell, Keithy here wasn't the only one hurt, so how does he rate? I lost a chick in the blast, too, but I'm not begging for Croning to dream her up again. I got a new chick instead. And that's what you better do, Keith. Keith stood very still, but his fists were balled at his sides. There are differences, Pete, he said slowly. Big ones. My Sandy was no chick, for one thing. And I loved her. Maybe more than you can ever understand. I know you don't understand pain, Pete. You've hardened yourself to it, like a lot of people, by pretending that it doesn't exist. So you convinced everybody you're a tough guy, a strong man, real independent. And you gave up some of your humanity, too. He smiled, very much in control of himself now, his voice sure and steady. Well, I won't play that game. I'll cling to my humanity and fight for it if I must. I loved once, really loved, and now I hurt. And I won't deny either of those things or pretend that they mean any less to me than they do. He looked to Winters. Lieutenant, I want my Sandy, and I won't let you take her away from me. Let's have a vote. Winters nodded. It was close, very close. The margin was only three votes. Keith had a lot of friends. But Winters won. Keith took it calmly. He picked up the cigar box, walked over, and handed it to Winters. Pete was grinning happily. But Winters didn't even crack a smile. I'm sorry, Keith, he said. Yeah, said Keith. So am I. There were tears on his face. Keith was never ashamed to cry. There was no singing that night. Winters didn't time trip. He sent men on search expeditions into the past, all very carefully planned for minimum risk and maximum reward. We didn't get any doctor out of it. Rick made three trips back without coming up with any useful memories. But one of the guys remembered some valuable stuff about medicinal herbs after a trip back to a biolab, and another jaunt recalled some marginally good memories about electricity. Winters was still optimistic, though. He turned to interviewing by then to decide who should get to use the crony next. He was very careful, very thorough, and he always asked the right questions. No one went back without his okay. Pending that approval, the croning was stored in the new cabin, where Pete kept an eye on it. And Keith? Keith sang. I was afraid, the night of the argument, that he might give up singing, but I was wrong. He couldn't give up song any more than he could give up Sandy. He returned to Concert Rock the very next evening, and sang longer and harder than ever before. The night after that, he was even better. During the day, meanwhile, he went about his work with a strained cheerfulness. He smiled a lot and talked a lot, but he never said anything much. And he never mentioned croning, or time-tripping, or the argument. Or Sandy. He still spent his nights out by the creek, though. The weather was getting progressively colder, but Keith didn't seem to mind. He just brought out a few blankets and a sleeping bag, and ignored the wind and the chill, and the increasingly frequent rains. I went out with him once or twice to sit and talk. Keith was cordial enough but he never brought up the subjects that really mattered, and I couldn't bring myself to force the conversations to places he obviously didn't want to go. We wound up discussing the weather and like subjects. These days, instead of his cigar box, Keith brought his guitar out to the creek. He never played it when I was there, but I heard him once or twice from a distance when I was halfway back to the common house after one of our fruitless talks. No singing, just music. Two songs over and over again. You know which two. And after a while, just one. Me and Bobby McGee. Night after night, alone and obsessed, Keith played that song, sitting by a dry creek in a barren forest. I'd always liked that song, but now I began to fear it, and a shiver would go through me whenever I heard those notes on the frosty autumn wind. Finally, one night, I spoke to him about it. It was a short conversation, but I think it was the only time, after the argument, that Keith and I ever really reached each other. I'd come with him to the creek and wrapped myself in a heavy woolen blanket to ward off the cold, wet drizzle that was dripping from the skies. Keith lay against his tree, half into his sleeping bag, with his guitar on his lap. He didn't even bother to shield it against the damp, which bothered me. 
We talked about nothing until at last I mentioned his Lonely Creek concerts. He smiled. You know why I play that song, he said. Yeah, I said. But I wish you'd stop. He looked away. I will, after tonight. But tonight I play it, Gary. Don't argue, please. Just listen. The song is all I have left now to help me think. And I've needed it, because I've been thinking a lot. I warned you about thinking, I said jokingly. But he didn't laugh. Yeah, you were right, too. Or I was, or Shakespeare, whoever you want to credit the warning to. Still, sometimes you can't help thinking. It's part of being human, right? I guess. I know. So I think with my music. No water left to think by, and the stars are all covered, and Sandy's gone. Really gone now. You know, Gary, if I kept on day to day and didn't think so much, I might forget her. I might even forget what she looked like. Do you think Pete remembers his chick? Yes, I said. And you'll remember Sandy, I'm sure of that. But maybe not quite so much. And maybe that's for the best. Sometimes it's good to forget. Then he looked at me, into my eyes. But I don't want to forget, Gary, and I won't. I won't. And then he began to play the same song, once, twice, three times. I tried to talk, but he wasn't listening. His fingers moved on, fiercely, relentlessly. And the music and the wind washed away my words. Finally, I gave up and left. It was a long walk back to the common house, and Keith's guitar stalked me through the drizzle. Winters woke me in the common house, shaking me from my bunk to face a grim gray dawn. His face was even grayer. He said nothing. He didn't want to wake the others, I guess. He just beckoned me outside. I yawned and stretched and followed him. Just outside the door, Winters bent and handed me a broken guitar. I looked at it blankly, then up at him. My face must have asked the question. He used it on Pete's head, Winters said, and took the cronine. I think Pete has a mild concussion, but he'll probably be all right. Lucky. He could be dead real easy. I held the guitar in my hands. It was shattered, the wood cracked and splintered, several strings snapped. It must have been a hell of a blow. I couldn't believe it. No, I said. Keith? No, he couldn't. It's his guitar, Winters pointed out. And who else would take the cronine? Then his face softened. I'm sorry, Gary, I really am. I think I understand why he did it. Still, I want him. Any idea where he could be? I knew, of course, but I was scared. What, what will you do? No punishment, he said. Don't worry. I just want the cronian back. We'll be more careful next time. I nodded. Okay, I said, but nothing happens to Keith. I'll fight you if you go back on your word, and the others will too. He just looked at me very sadly, like he was disappointed that I'd mistrust him. He didn't say anything. We walked the mile to the creek in silence, me still holding the guitar. Keith was there, of course, wrapped in his sleeping bag, the cigar box next to him. There were a few bags left. He'd used only one. I bent to wake him, but when I touched him and rolled him over, two things hit me. He'd shaved off his beard, and he was very, very cold. Then I noticed the other bottle. We'd found other drugs with the cronine way back when. They weren't even guarded. Keith had used sleeping pills. I stood up, not saying a word. I didn't need to explain. Winters had taken it all in very quickly. He studied the body and shook his head. I wonder why he shaved, he said finally. I know, I said. He never wore a beard in the old days when he was with Sandy. Yes, said Winters. Well, it figures. What? The suicide. He always seemed unstable. No, Lieutenant, I said. You've got it all wrong. Keith didn't commit suicide. Winters frowned. I smiled. 
Look, I said, if you did it, it would be suicide. You think cronine is only a drug for dreaming. But Keith figured it for a time machine. He didn't kill himself. That wasn't his style. He just went back to his Sandy. And this time, he made sure he stayed there. Winters looked back at the body. Yes, he said. Maybe so. He paused. For his sake, I hope that he was right. The years since then have been good ones, I guess. Winters is a better leader than I was. The time trips never turned up any knowledge worth a damn, but the search expeditions proved fruitful. There are more than two hundred people in town now, most of them people that Winters brought in. It's a real town, too. We have electricity and a library and plenty of food. And a doctor, a real doctor that Winters found a hundred miles from here. We got so prosperous that the Sons of the Blast heard about us and came back for a little fun. Winters had his militia beat them off and hunt down the ones who tried to escape. Nobody but the old commune people remembered Keith, but we still have singing and music. Winters found a kid named Ronnie on one of his trips, and Ronnie has a guitar of his own. He's not in Keith's league, of course, but he tries hard, and everybody has fun. And he's taught some of the youngsters how to play. Only thing is, Ronnie likes to write his own stuff, so we don't hear many of the old songs. Instead, we get post-war music. The most popular tune right now is a long ballad about how our army wiped out the sons of the blast. Winters says that's a healthy thing. He talks about new music for a new civilization, and maybe he has something. In time, I'm sure, there will be a new culture to replace the one that died. Ronnie, like Winters, is giving us tomorrow. But there's a price. The other night, when Ronnie sang, I asked him to do Me and Bobby McGee. But nobody knew the words. George R. R. Martin writes, The facts go like this. I was born in September 1948. Home was Bayonne, New Jersey, a big oil refining town just across the bay from New York City. I grew up there, mostly in a federal housing project that sat by the deepwater channel connecting New York and Newark bays. So I spent a lot of time watching big ships come and go, fascinated by their flags. I went to grade school, Mary J. Donahoe, and high school, Marist High, read a lot, mostly comics and SF, and wrote. Since the dawn of time, it often seems at least since the dawn of my time. I made my first sale when I was in grade school. It was a short monster story, the first of a series. I printed it in pencil on notebook paper and sold it to another kid in the project for a penny. The price included a dramatic reading by yours truly. In those days, I did great werewolf sounds, but I have since forgotten how. I wrote and sold four other stories in the same series, for fees up to a nickel, which even in those days wasn't much, but I liked making werewolf sounds, and my literary career was going great until one of my reader listeners started having nightmares, with werewolves in them, I guess. His mother complained, and suddenly I was back to writing stories for my trunk. My trunk has a lot of old stories in it, since I never throw away anything. Then there was high school, during which time I decided I wanted to be a writer because everybody kept laughing when I told them I wanted to be an astronaut. In high school, I read a lot more SF, started a chess team, got thrown off the school newspaper in a censorship dispute, and began to devour comic books and write stories for comic fanzines. You know, amateur magazines put out by fans. That was when I discovered my stories looked a lot more impressive in print than in pencil, even though they didn't pay me anything, and I didn't get to make werewolf sounds, not even one. In 1966, I finally left Bayonne, off to Evanston, Illinois, to attend Northwestern University. I came out five years later with an M.S. in journalism, but sometime in there I started writing SF and submitting to professional magazines. One day in the summer of 1970, a hairy orange first reader at Galaxy found one of my stories in his slush pile, and his boss bought it, and that was my first sale since grade school. They paid me $94, which is only a little bit better than a nickel. Since then I've sold nearly 30 stories, and I've been nominated for a Hugo and a Nebula and a John W. Campbell Award. Lost all three. Sigh. At the moment I live in Chicago, fly around and run chess tournaments on weekends, right on weekdays. I no longer do monster stories, but my ex-roommate says that I make great flying saucer sounds. Bloodstream by Lou Fisher On Wednesday morning, in response to the postcard, Craig Stafford brought his 11-year-old son to the New York State Medical Center. 
which in Kingston was located in the quadrant of the License Bureau. Randy's examination started right on time, and in less than an hour the computer in Albany had read the sensors and scanned the blood, urine, and skin analyses and turned the hollow rays into digital bits of physiological data. From then on it was only a matter of waiting for the transmission lines to free up for the report. The doctor was smiling as the printout spewed from his desk-side terminal. "'Good news, Mr. Stafford,' he said, tearing the paper from the console with a professional flourish. "'Randy's in excellent condition. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that this is the best report I've seen this week.' Stafford frowned. "'That means you'll be taking him.' "'Well, I wouldn't put it that way.' "'What way, doctor? How would you put it?' The doctor glanced again at the bottom line of the report, the sum of the digits. "'Randy's a lucky boy,' he said. "'Actually, there's less than half a chance of making it on the first examination. And many children, unfortunately, are never considered healthy enough, despite our chemotherapy programs. But your son is ready now. No problem, he can go to the hospital this week.' For an instant, Stafford thought it sounded almost convincing. But then as he got out of his chair, the tight marks deepened in his long face, and his compatibly long fingers curled into fists of defiance. It occurred to him that Randy was still out in the waiting room, anxious to hear the happy verdict. But to Stafford, it was the worst possible result. He had hoped for a negative report. He had hoped at least for a postponement. He said, I don't want him to go. But it's the hospital. Forget it. I just don't want him there. Leave him alone. I can't permit, the doctor paused. He folded the computer listing, creasing each seam, and put it into a pre-printed envelope. That's a bad attitude, Mr. Stafford. He began again in a bedside manner inherited from past medical generations. First of all, the law is absolute and uncontestable, as you well know, for the good of the general public. It's obviously not a matter for voluntary choice. How can a child decide? How can you decide for him? No, no, it's simple enough. If he qualifies for the hospital, he goes there. And if you understand the purpose of the hospital, you must want Randy. I know all about it, Stafford countered, even if I didn't get to go there myself. You put a strong, healthy kid in the hospital for almost a year. You have him contract every known disease one by one. Then you cure him one by one. So he's loaded with permanent antibodies and immune to everything and spends the rest of his life in perfect health. Well, that in itself is bullshit, Stafford went on, striding closer to the desk and leaning over it. Sure, the good old AMA has it all worked out. Give the kid cancer, diabetes, all the heart disorders, a couple of hundred viruses, and everything else that God knows. Build up his immunity so he can live to 180. Live with a body full of scars and plastic parts and memories of a year in hell. If the doctor was the least bit disturbed, he didn't let on. Going about his business, he put the envelope in a stiff folder and removed a small blue card that was attached to the front of the folder. "'You have the wrong impression,' he said flatly. "'Without the hospital, your son would be lucky to reach ninety. Stafford shook his head. "'It's not worth it.' "'Of course it is. "'You know that Randy would get many of the illnesses naturally as his life went on.' by taking them all at once, under supervision, and at an early age when he can fight them off. He can gain quick cures and double his life expectancy. What about all the suffering? Well, there's some price to be paid, the doctor said. Frankly, Mr. Stafford, the only easy way to build up antibodies is through the use of vaccines. But vaccines are effective for only a limited number of diseases. They are not permanent, especially after the age of 100, and humans have become somewhat resistant to them. Vaccines, after all, are a much weaker dose than the real thing. Stafford's shoulders sagged. The doctor nodded. It'll be all right, he said, as he double-checked the blue plastic card. Apparently satisfied, he handed the card to Stafford. There was nothing to see but a few punched holes and a serial number. Stafford looked up questioningly. The doctor explained. Randy must check into the hospital on Friday afternoon. The processing will go quite rapidly if you have this card with you. Will you be able to bring him yourself? Yes, Stafford told him. It's not my work here. He turned the plastic card over and over in his fingers, leaving faint, damp marks on both sides. He knew he couldn't stop what was happening. Once Randy passed the health review, the hospital was the compulsory next step. 
Actually, he should be a proud father, like everyone else in his situation. But that terrible year! Some of them die, he said. The doctor stood up and came around the desk as if to cue an end to the pointless discussion. That's true, he admitted. Some die. In many cases, though, they are children in borderline physical condition who never should have been admitted. Their parents probably used official influence to get them in. Myself, I think we should make the requirement stricter. At any rate, don't worry. We have a 94% survival record. Very good odds, you know. Worse than I thought, was Stafford's bitter reply. Pocketing the admission card, he started toward the outer office to get his son, knowing that he would have to meet Randy's cheers with at least a faint smile of enthusiasm, like a laugh in the dark. At home, Myra was waiting for them outside the front door, up on her toes, her pretty face full of hope, her delicate hands clasped between her small breasts, all of her lit up in anticipation. Stafford waved artificially from the car in the driveway, but it was Randy who ran up to give her the word. Mom, I'm going, he said excitedly. He was also up on his toes, reaching for her. Short for his age, and slim, and somewhat soft. Much like Myra's side of the family, Stafford thought. Still strong and healthy in his own right, as the doctor had proven this morning. Randy would probably survive the immunizations. But in what condition? Through what agony? At what cost? Stafford trembled briefly and moved away from the car. Friday, Mom, Randy was saying. I'm going to the hospital on Friday. It's all set. Myra hugged him. That's so wonderful, Randy. Oh, I prayed and prayed, and I'm happy for you. Her bright eyes were not aware of her husband's leaden steps as he came up to join the celebration, and even the metallic edge on Stafford's words didn't break through her glow of wishes come true. Once more, he asked his son, do you really want to go? Sure, Dad, Randy answered, acting victorious. Only the best people go. Mom says so. Everybody wants to go to the hospital. But everybody can't go. Yeah, especially Joey, Randy said a little more quietly. If Joey was going with me... Never mind, Myra put in. You'll make new friends at the hospital. Now go upstairs and change clothes, and then you can go over to tell Joey the news. With her arm resting on Randy's shoulder, she guided him to the access way. And when she came back to Stafford, it was with a further explanation. Joey took the exam last week, and he was underweight. They turned him down. His mother was frantic. She was so sure. Stafford made a vague gesture that indicated nothing, but that temporarily covered his end of the conversation. A moment later, when he was sure that his son was out of earshot, he gave in to the feelings that were knotted in his stomach. The whole thing stinks, he said. But Myra had heard his opinion many times before. Please don't start that now. It's all settled and there's nothing more you can do about it. But damn it, Myra, you've seen the hospital. You know what it's like in there. It's not that bad. Not that bad? How can you... Stop it, Craig. This time there was a snap to her usually mild voice, and he could see the start of angry tears. You're being ridiculous and you know it. It's a great chance for Randy. She wheeled and stalked out of the room, leaving Stafford cut off from further debate. He was tired of arguing about it anyway. The doctor, his wife, his son, the world, the whole goddamn world. No one ever listened. He sank into the cushions of his tele-reading chair, but he drew no comfort from it. Neither did a deep breath do anything to extinguish his nerves. Shuddering, he wondered why he always saw a completely different hospital. Maybe he was wrong, or unreasonable, or just stubbornly old-fashioned. After all, the hospitals were created by medical geniuses as an answer to mankind's plea for a longer life, and every father dreamed of having his children admitted, of giving his children something more than he had, a shot at two hundred years. Almost every father. Somehow, he couldn't stand the image of Randy in the hospital. He could see him there writhing near death, in masses of agony, rattles of pain, suffering, screaming, sleeping only with drugs. And one after another, asthma, leukemia, tumors, cataracts, pneumonia, no relief, no end, not for a year. At that point, he heard Randy calling from upstairs. He found the boy stretched out across the bed, face down. He touched Randy's shoulder, and the muffled voice blurted, I don't want to go. 
Stafford sat next to him. But you said you did. That was before, Dad. Now I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen to me. There's going to be a bunch of people I never saw before, and they never saw me before. And I don't like hospitals anyway. I want to stay here. Take it easy, Stafford told him. Then he bit his tongue and said, I wouldn't send you there if it wasn't all right. He took his son's arm affectionately, helping him to turn over and up, trying to discover the real look on his face. If Randy was afraid now, he thought, what would happen when he was really in the midst of that ghoulish infirmary, when he was plugged into electronic nurses and tubes of plasma, when they came at him with hypodermic needles and surgical knives, when the errant strains of earthwide bacteria swarmed through his eleven-year-old body, or when he found out that it hurt all the time. Sitting up on the bed, Randy swallowed hard and put a little bravery back in his chin as if realizing that the meeting was man-to-man man as well as father-to-son. He said, I'd probably be okay if Joey was going, too. If he was there, you bet I wouldn't be scared at all. Can't you tell him to let Joey go with me? Maybe he'll make it next time, Stafford replied. He rustled Randy's dark hair, then his hand slipped down to Randy's neck, pulling him just a little closer. Tell you what, though, I'm going to ride out and take a look at the hospital tomorrow to make sure they've got things in good shape for you. Being in the second of his three off years, Craig Stafford had acquired the habit of sleeping until ten o'clock in the morning, mainly because Myra, who tired easily, managed to sleep that late every day of every year. But on Thursday morning, Stafford had his breakfast coffee at the Thruway Saverin as the day was just beginning, and he pulled his car into the hospital grounds at the very start of visiting hours. The fence was a miles-long plastic ribbon that formed a semicircle down to the Hudson River. Within it, Stafford followed the wide road that led up to the hospital. Once there, he tried to read, but couldn't concentrate on, the huge plaque of dedication that had been signed by President Cooper in 1996. The building itself loomed up in front of him. Like its many duplicates across the country, it was forty-five stories high, windowless, and immaculately white, and assuredly, soundproof. The few other visitors in the south wing of the fifth floor were women, and they moved silently with Stafford around the railing that circled above the ward. Below him, the huge room of beds was encased in a clear plastic dome that made it open and public, offering an unhampered view of the entire arena. The outside walls were a checkerboard of servo gear and electronic aids. The beds were the latest in four-by-six floaters. The lighting was indirect non-reflective, which meant that it could be left on all day and all night with only minor automatic adjustments to its intensity. And in the main aisles that crisscrossed between the beds, a moving center strip, it seemed like a treadmill, allowed the skittering men and women in white uniforms to review their hundreds of patients. To Stafford, it was a pitiful zoo. He stopped walking, folded his arms on the railing, peering in. He wasn't sure why he'd come or what he was looking for, reassurance, no doubt, but it wasn't there. Instead, there was visible evidence of torture and murder. In the beds, every one of them filled, he saw the empty faces of unknown children, sad and hopeless strangers trapped in nothing they had asked for. From where he stood, he couldn't hear their screams, but he felt every one that echoed inside the enormous cage. A red-haired girl ripped the stuffing from her pillow. Another girl pounded her stomach with angry fists. A boy coughed and choked and went on crying. Another boy tore a gash in his face. One boy slept. "'Which one is yours?' a woman's voice asked, and Stafford turned to give her half of his attention. She was close to Myra's age, but a little bigger all around. "'Not here yet,' Stafford replied without emotion. "'Oh, that's certainly too bad,' she lamented. "'But don't give up. He might make it.' Or is it a girl? Tell me, have you tried vitamins? It's a boy, my son. Oh, then you must try exercise, too. Exercise and vitamins. He's really all right. In fact, he's scheduled here for this Friday, tomorrow. She brightened sincerely. I'm certainly glad for you. That's mine over there, at the head of the third row. See him? That's Mike, our oldest child. The boy Stafford saw was a quivering wreck. The cheeks were sunken, the hair was awry, and the eyes were clamped shut 
as if to avoid the cold stares of the dials and gauges and cathode ray tubes that were arranged in a forest around him. Stafford was about to offer his sympathy, but the woman wasn't in tune. He's almost finished with cirrhosis of the liver, she boasted. Next week he'll probably start on arthritis. That's an easy one. Takes only a few days. Stafford nodded skeptically, unable to find the right answer or the right tone of voice. Like Myra, he thought, the woman had been brainwashed with the benefits of advanced medicine and was completely oblivious to the cruelty that completed the process. He stood by for a moment before he walked away from her. Then, as he moved on, his eyes searched the ward from child to child, seeing Randy in every bed, sick and hurt, begging for relief. Finally, he turned his back to it all and started slowly towards the elevator. Down. As the doors slid open on the main floor, Stafford caught sight of the arrow sign that pointed to the office of the director, and the same impulse that had brought him to hell, or to the hospital, struck another hot link in his nerve chain and sent him striding down the corridor in the indicated direction. Luruist, the director of the hospital, was fat. Most of the excess flesh was around his waistline, indented by his belt. Some of it also lay around in his cheeks, which, together with flashing teeth, made him seem always happy. All in all, he looked like a man who appreciated second helpings, morning chats, and the huge executive offices. He, of course, did not see any cause for Stafford's complaints. "'Your son is in very good health,' Luruist said, reading the record from the green glow of a display tube. "'You've got nothing to worry about.' "'I just don't want him here,' Stafford repeated. He was standing at the far end of a banquet-sized desk and had begun the conversation by pounding on it. Luruis clicked off the tube. "'Best thing that could happen to him. Wish to God I could take it myself.' Why, when the boy gets to be twice your age, he'll look and feel better than you do now. Maybe. Do you doubt it? Sure I doubt it. It hasn't been done long enough to know one way or another. Show me a generation of two hundred-year-olds. That's academic, Luruist argued with smiling complacency. It's all based on sound medical knowledge, and there were countless treatments on experimental subjects, animal and human. We were able to triple the lifespan of some of the smaller animals. Anyway, it was proven in all cases that the level of antibodies produced in the bloodstream was more than enough. I don't care about that, Stafford shouted. He was beginning to feel battered and worn. Did those medical geniuses ever measure the emotional scars that come from a year in this place? Did they ever try it themselves? What do you think? Did they care about anything but antibodies? Luroist flopped back in his chair. Only his eyes reflected a change in the stoic outlook, and those eyes were fixed on Stafford's face. What the hell is the matter with you, Stafford? Stafford gave it some thought. The pain, the suffering, the whole year. I can't have Randy go through it. The director raised a brow. Oh, one of those guys, huh? He tapped his fingers on the edge of the desk, and his voice became less superficial. Well, we run into your kind now and then. And sometimes we work out a deal, but it'll cost you, say, a thousand super dollars. For what? asked Stafford. To keep Randy out? Luruist shook his head. No way to do that. But what we can do, is Randy your real son? Not adopted or anything? Of course he's mine. Would I be? Then I suppose we can do business, the director said. He leaned forward and used one hand to underline his words. But the deal is off the record. Strictly off the record, understand? Anyway, we can fix it so that your son will feel no pain at all. Safely, Stafford wondered, then had his doubts. I don't see how you can do that. Why not? Pain is only a message that's sent through the nervous system to the brain. The secret is to divert the message. Lura was put some of the secret into a smile. So we divert the message, he continued. We block the nervous system in just the right places. We take the pain away from the patient and transfer it to another person of his immediate family. You mean that I'd feel the pain instead of Randy, Stafford said, half breathing, half speculating. It could be arranged, was the reply, if you've got the thousand. Stafford's mind was a tape of quick thoughts. It was easy enough to get the money. The pain was another matter. Could he himself take a year of it? He'd seen enough to know it's awful touch. 
but the strength of a large man was a lot tougher target than the inexperience of a small boy. And somehow, just knowing that Randy was escaping it, so it would hurt, Stafford told himself firmly and finally. The physical pain would be no worse than the mental anguish it saved. But he still wasn't convinced. He said, It doesn't seem possible. It's very possible, Lurowitz assured him. Look, we don't publicize it because people would claim that it's like black magic. And maybe it is. There you are, Stafford. Call it black magic. I don't like black magic. All right, then I'll tell you the truth. It's based on a medical practice that was thoroughly discredited at the end of the century. But a couple of experts on our staff kept playing around with it, and the best thing they found was pain transfer. We've used it successfully a number of times. That's not much of an explanation. Cut it out, Stafford. Laura was seemed to be growing weary and ill-tempered. I'm not going to give you a classroom lecture. Either you want to do it or you don't. Make up your mind. Stafford moved his legs apart to a ready stance. I'll bring the money with me tomorrow. Cash, please, said Lurowist. The guard at the gate checked with registration, then signaled them on with a flick of his hand. Randy was wedged in the front seat of the car with his head leaning on his mother's shoulder. Stafford glanced down. For some reason the boy seemed younger than ever, almost a baby again. How do you feel? Stafford said. Okay, I guess, his son answered quietly. Myra tightened her arm around him. Do you remember everything I told you? Remember that the doctors and nurses are there to help you. And don't forget to look for us on weekends. She paused, recounting. Mom? What is it, dear? Joey didn't even come over to say goodbye this morning. Never mind that. There are plenty of boys just your age right here in the hospital. Randy wiped his eyes. Dad? You'll be all right, Stafford said, and he saw a parking space far down the line. Once they reached the check-in area, the blue plastic card lived up to its promised expediency and brought on a single piece of paper to be signed and two male escorts in white uniforms who greeted Randy with brave, cheery words and much-used smiles both before and after they hooked on to him. Then, quickly, Stafford saw him go. He turned Myra around and led her to the elevator, which they took up to the 17th floor. It was quite crowded. Friday afternoons were used for general admissions, and 17H was the ward of the day. They edged to a place on the rail close to the plastic window. They got there in time to see Randy ushered to a bed, his mouth open, the clean, crisp hospital gown dragging slightly below his feet. Myra stood on her toes and waved. Stafford bit hard. I'll be back in a few minutes, he told her. On the lower level, once again, in the lavish office, Stafford put the money on the desk and waited while the director counted it. He still felt that it might be some sort of con game, some weird scheme without fulfillment or redress. At best, it was a gamble. He said, Are you sure it'll work? Lurowis shoved the money into a drawer. I don't see why not. It always has, he explained. A top man on the staff will be giving the treatments. Each treatment will divert the pain from your son for months at a time. And as that happens, the nerve sensations will automatically find you, his own flesh and blood. I hope you're strong enough to take it. I'm ready, Stafford said. Then I'll send up the word, and you'd better start for home immediately. For the first time, a note of sympathy could be heard in Lorowist's voice. Good luck, Stafford. Myra felt his touch and turned her head to him. Oh, you're back. I'm glad, she said anxiously. There's something strange going on with Randy. Do you see that man in the dark suit? Stafford looked down into the ward. A dark-suited man with a small black case was standing at Randy's bedside. What about him? Well, he just came along and stopped the doctors from giving Randy his first injection. I can't imagine who he is. Probably a specialist, Stafford said, knowing it was the truth. The hospital always makes sure that everything gets off to the right start. Let's watch for a moment and see what he does. What he did was open the black case and take out a handful of stainless steel needles. The shafts were of various lengths and seemed to be knurled down to within an inch of the points. What he did was twirl the needles rapidly as he inserted them, two in each of Randy's ears, four more at selected points around Randy's spine. What he did was attach an electronic aid to the end of each needle. 
Immediately, a red line graph began pulsing on a wall display, and Randy's hands began to shake. Stafford watched it all, astounded. Acupuncture, he mumbled, mostly to himself, but Myra picked it up. Why, I thought nobody used that anymore. Stafford calmed himself. He considered his words carefully. Evidently, they use it here, Myra. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. This is one of the best hospitals. Inwardly, he was still amazed. Acupuncture. What had Luruist said? A medical practice that was thoroughly discredited at the end of the century. The ancient art of acupuncture. Chinese medicine, needles in the skin. Well, why not, was Stafford's second thought. What else but acupuncture could produce the miracle of diverting Randy's pain? And suddenly it occurred to him that he should have left the hospital right after he made the arrangements. Really, Craig, Myra was saying, I think we ought to ask about it. I've never heard of anyone. Let's just leave it to the experts, Stafford replied firmly, checking his watch. It took a while to get Myra away from the ward and out to the car. But then Stafford drove rapidly, recklessly, anxious to get home before anything started on him. He wondered how soon it would be. Of course, Myra would have to know, he told himself. He'd need all her help to get him through it. Would she understand? He glanced over, finding her outwardly happy and proud, but also seeing a deeper strain of worry and loneliness. Well, she'd feel better when she found out. At that instant, she grabbed his sleeve. She clutched her stomach. She doubled over and bit into his arm. Then she twisted her head to stare up at him, her eyes wide and pleading, as she let out the first scream. Lou Fisher writes, First of all, I must confess to all the readers of this anthology that I am not a prolific writer. This note by itself is a considerable addition to my total output, and one that I will probably include in future tallies to make them seem like more. It's not that I don't want to write in continuous streams, that I don't want meaningful fictions to pour out of me like they pour out of Barry Malsberg or Evan Hunter or any of the prolific writers I admire. I dream of writing like that. But the magic eludes me, whatever it is. In my case, there are a number of good-sounding excuses. There is a full-time job as writer-editor of programming manuals for a computer company, and a house that needs handling and three cars that need oil. Of course, there is an energetic wife who needs to share her experiences, and two teenage daughters who need to be guided, ha, huh, through their tumultuous years, not to mention hours of all-out devotion to tennis, softball, volleyball, golf, bowling, bridge, cribbage, and reading. Anyone can see that I go to extremes to use up my time, so I won't feel guilty about not writing. It doesn't work. There is plenty of time left over, and it has never been the problem. The problem, obviously, is in the mind, in the spirit. Now that I've started to confess, I might as well go all the way. For the first time, I will lean over my records and see what I have done in the way of published works. It will turn out to be much less than what I had hoped for when I first started to call myself a writer. Okay, here it is, starting in 1958. Eighteen stories in a number of splashy men's magazines four paperback novels, also in the men's field, and five, only, science fiction stories. That doesn't include reprints. God, all of my men's stories and novels were reprinted and reprinted in later years under new and dramatic titles. It's no wonder I never knew until now how many I actually had written. There was something else. For about a year, I wrote a monthly column of gambling advice for one of the men's magazines. The far-seeing editor decided that I was a gambling expert because the hero of my four novels was a bookie named Chet McCoy. Naturally, I am happiest writing science fiction, and lately I have been trying to stay with it. My stories so far have appeared in F and SF, Fantastic, and Galaxy. A story called Trigger Man reappeared in The Best from Galaxy, Volume 2. But about this story... Well, every once in a while, my writing urge overcomes my writing block, and an idea that's been stewing for months in my middle consciousness expands into all sorts of weird images, and I try to put it together the best I can. Existence by Joanna Russ Imitatio quasi imago in honorum 
Jacobi Blish Multa cum admiratione felicitatis sui in artibus reconditioribus. Note. Representation in the form of a picture in honor of James Blish with much admiration for his felicity in the more recondite arts. End of note. It is impossible to call up the devil when women are present. I mean real women. That is to say, hermaphrodites. For men, real men who exist, are the people who look at the women, and the women are therefore the people who are looked at by the men. So that women, when they are alone, must be either men or nothing. There are a great many women who were supposed to have called up the devil, all those witches and so on, but the question remains, what did they really call up? Or better still, did they exist? Maybe they called up something else. Or if it was true, and women really can't call up the devil, what does that make the devil? Or are women really male? I have no answers to these questions. With men, there's no problem. See the men? There are four of them. They have good, straight, legal, logical, one-track masculine minds. Wicklow, the fat one, wants to blow up the world. Ludlow, the magister magiki, is going to do it for him. Obano, the third one, will try to stop it. They have to have him there for legal reasons. And the fourth man, oops, it's a woman, is Mr. Wicklow's private secretary. One could be forgiven the mistake. He employs this woman because she has an eidetic memory and no mind of her own. She's been in love with him for years. Her name is Estrelita Baines. Estrelita means little star. The men have no first names. Why should men need first names? Wicklow, the bully, fat and merry, who bullies his secretary. Ludlow, indescribably commonplace, lean, smells bad somehow, through no fault of his own, you can't place it, and takes no pleasure in the mauling that interests Mr. Wicklow, has awful eyes. Orbano, the monk, who's been taking a lot of spiritual mauling lately, the solid, stolid peasant with big feet, nurses impossible dreams of personal glory and is violently ashamed of them. He's not speaking to anyone. Wicklow, thick cream, lots of money. All around the marble chamber, which resembles a Greek columbarium at Forest Lawn, in various positions on the tessellated floor, posing against the walls like figurines, like lamiae, like snakes, are the bad doctor's demon assistants, girls with big eyes, girls with silky thighs, lovely girls with undulant bodies, golden hair, arms like waves, moist pits, impossible bones. They smile or scowl. Beat me, tease me, love me, rape me. All around poor Estelita Baines in her grey suit and her rimless spectacles. She wears a skirt and carries a pocketbook so you can tell who she is. Her hair is pulled back in a tiny bun. It just won't grow, no matter what she does. It matters what women look like. Then they got tired of waiting after discussing what the catastrophe is to be, plague or the bomb, they disperse to their separate circles. Demons are not allergic to electric light, and so the lights go on. Circles, pentacles, alb, stole, cope, you can read all this in books. In so far as she thinks at all, Estelita Baines thinks that whatever Mr. Wicklow wants must be right. The world is lucky to be done in by him when it's going in any case. Mr. Wicklow is feeding the fire on the Lamia's magical body. Ludlow's fat cat lies very regardant and strange by the altar at Ludlow's feet, 
from time to time turning his huge eyes on his own ginger fur and giving himself a self-regarding lick. He weeps like a human. Mulier hominis est confusio. Estrelita Baines wonders why she feels so sleepy. The room is filling with smoke. Felix conjunctio. Frater Albano wonders at the words. Ludlow sounds like a bandsaw. It's impossible to make anything out. Quidquid, te, cara, delectat. Quid you up de ferre, electa? Wicklow feeds the fire. Awe, formosissima. Yam, dulcis, amica, venito. Vestiunt silve tenera merorem. Virgulta, suis onerata pomis. What is the man saying? The cat lies on its back and bats at the air. Something cold seems to glide in across the floor under the smoke. Wicklow, shaking himself awake, drops more resin into the fire. Resin and honey, sparks snap from the dead body of the lamia. Ludlow has explained everything very carefully. Magic is an art, like science. I mean, thinks Wicklow, like mathematics. Or perhaps an exact art. That's better. Anyway, there are rules, inflexible rules. It's all to do with the nature of the personages that lie behind the appearance of things. Or in connection with the appearance of things. Wicklow shakes his head to clear it, earning a sharp look from the magician. And Albano is here because of some pact the devil has made with God, or God with the devil, who can tell? But he must only observe, not interfere. That's clear. Why? The limits on good. Evil breaks the rules. Good must obey the rules. Very simple. And to our advantage. Imperatrix mundi, dione, mundi lumina. And the cold rising somehow does not clear the smoke, but makes it blacker. But Albano is almost entirely lost in the dark. The empty pentacle in front of the altar begins to glow, not light, but rather darkness visible, and into this column whirl the magician's girl demons, sucked around and around, distorted souls flattened and glowing, somehow dimmed as if caught in a water spout. A mutter comes from Frater Albano's direction, absolutely contrary to the rules. A liquid me, paciendum est, cries Ludlow. The altar flames. Stifled words come from Albano and much coughing. Weeny, weedy, quid nunc, o weer doctissime tibi adest, exclaims Ludlow. Weeky finishes Albano in his corner, barely able to speak. Waini, how do we exi? Ludlow shouts. And as these last words sink into the cold, sink into it, but do not penetrate it, do not neutralize it, refuse to mingle with it, but only trail wisps of human heat after them, the light in the pentacle condenses to a tiny star, a mote of light that seems to drift farther and farther away. It does not become less, but somehow draws back as if in obedience to the laws of some other perspective, until it is very far away, but still within the room. And then, at the point of becoming too small to see, it expands soundlessly until it fills everyone's sight, a magnesium flare, intense and colorless, in which one looks at one's neighbor and sees bleakly and without emotion that he has not even greed or wrath, but that he is hollow. I don't like this, says Estrelita Baines. Ludlow raises his wand, black eyes blazing like balls of pitch. A head seems to be forming in the room. They are all inside it. The head grins, mottled, quicksilver-mouthed, simultaneously behind the doctor and before him, at the ceiling and around their ankles. Estrelita Bain says more positively, I don't like this at all. 
And why, she continues crossly, do you always have to grin like a wolf? It's so dull. Why can't you grin like a chihuahua? At the sound of her voice, the ceiling and floor exchange places, causing an almost unbearable nausea. They settle, and Ludlow raises his wand. If she moves, and simultaneously Frat Albano, disabled by coughing, manages to croak, Reprobare, reprobos, which is the end of a verse that can be used only once. And somehow in the world, now shaking and gliding like a crack the whip, up and down, back and forth, racked with alternate light and darkness, the Magister Magiki sees dependable Estelita Baines preparing to step out of her circle. The lenses of her spectacles reflect the fragmented images of a dissolving world. He raises his wand to blast her. Broad daylight. Silence. Sunlight streams over the raised gallery at the end of the room. The Sabbath goat sits on the edge of the gallery, swinging his animal's hooves. He is as solid a horror as anything can be, emblematic from the crown of lit candles on his human head, to his erection to the star of David on his forehead, to his oozing breasts, to his slit-pupiled eyes. Goats and cats belong to him. As Toledo steps out of her circle, foolish and confused, she says, You look silly. He lifts his head and opens his mouth. The magician's cat backs carefully onto Ludlow's feet and settles there with a groan. Estrelita has taken off her glasses, as if trying an experiment. Can she see without them? But this is one of those ladies who look even worse that way. Nobody says, You're beautiful without your glasses. So she puts them back on. She wanders out between the chalk figures on the floor, studying them with interest. Her voice, one knows, will be strong, but not sweet. I don't fancy giving you my world to play with. Give up, magician. I don't exist apart from the particulars, so you can't touch me. I thought, says Frater Abano, finding the words, or the words finding him, that you would be more beautiful. Why? I'm not a picture, and I'm not the virgin either. She hikes up her stockings and begins to climb the stair at the side of the gallery. Obano covers his face with his hands. Holding her drab skirt above her knees with one hand, she trudges up the steps, dogged, plain, and slow. She kicks off her shoes. I could be beautiful if I wanted to. I could be anything if I wanted to. But there's nothing emblematic about me. I must use what's to hand. So if your aesthetic sense isn't too violently offended, gentlemen, I'll stay as I am. The Sabbath animal yawns. Little Star climbs the steps. Either the steps are higher than they look, or she isn't really walking, for it seems to take her forever to get there. And as she toils away from the three on the floor, she grows larger, though still climbing one step at a time, until, miles away, large as a monument at the head of a stair, huge as a pyramid, she can pick up the goat in one hand, which she does. Her spectacles flash like the lunar Apennines. He wriggles furiously in her fingers, and she brings him close to her face to look at him. Sitting on the gallery, feet reaching the floor and head bent to avoid the ceiling, she presses her knees carefully together, ladylike. The gallery sags and creaks. She puts her free hand behind her back, and when she brings it out again, there is in it another furiously wriggling little man, a golden squiggle to match the red and black squiggle. She holds them almost at her nose. Neither of these is the genuine article. Of course, there is no genuine article. Ludlow breaks his wand in two and points the raw ends at Little Star. She does not look up. No use, magician. What a funny little man you are, with your hot temper and your subtlety and all your logic. You have played for years with your pacts and laws and compulsions without the slightest suspicion that anyone was trying to cheat you. And you spoke for years with what you believed to be infernal personages without ever once thinking that the real mark of a personage, as distinct from a thing, was its ability to change its mind. 
Someone has been making fun of you. Ludlow continues his incantation. If the characteristic of a thing, says Little Star, is its invariability, then surely the characteristic of a person is passion, volition, and reason. And where is that to come from, if not from you? Ah, we had grand times in the early days when there were only vegetable and animal souls to draw our being from. Grand times, but bland times, I must admit. Then you came along, and we have developed amazingly since. We have developed into buttes, doctor, if I may so express myself, into real lollapaloozas, the human coloration of which never ceases to amaze me. Who are you? says Albano in a croak. I, says Estelita Baines, am the one who puts things back where they belong. I am she who confines fancies to the space between the ears, the lady who makes things concrete, the woman who insists on facts. I am the I am. I am the what is. Something of a paradox, you will admit, for a supernatural being. But I am one of the two real personages. Why are you here? cries Wicklow. Why are you interfering? And why are you my secretary? Because, says the woman mountain, I am the decider who decides that to make a real bang you must use a real bomb. Anything else offends me. That is not logical, says Ludlow, the master magician, in a hard, tight, furious voice. It is not, says Little Star, but it is both reasonable and real, and thrusting both arms under her skirt, she appears to release good and evil into the space between her legs, then doing the same with the magician and the monk, whose arms and legs twinkle a violent protest as they are shoved back into the womb. She seems to get no pleasure from it. Her lips are thin and priggish. The huge hand lowers above Wicklow, who throws himself flat on his face. I don't believe it, boss Wicklow shouts. It's not possible. Why not? I am the effluvium of billions of souls, a billion and a half women who turn uneasily in their sleep, a billion and a half men who resent the uneasiness of the women. My brother is what is not, and he is also my father, my lover, and my son. The one who broadcast dreams, the man who believes, the inside turned outside, the yes it is, the all is all, the great somebody else. And to complicate matters still further, we are really each other, but since that's impossible, we take turns. It's the women's turn today, it'll be the men's tomorrow, when the men become women, when the women become men, when they both become zebras. I'll still be here. Go away, he shuts his eyes. The trouble with men is that they have limited minds. That's the trouble with women, too. But I know everything. Go away. All right. He opens his eyes to find Estrelita Baines, his own size now, kneeling over him. There's a very disapproving look on her face. Mr. Wicklow, she says. I'm all right, says Mary Wicklow. I think, says Miss Baines, that we had better go home, Mr. Wicklow, and that after this, Mr. Wicklow, you had better consult me about anything you plan to undertake. You have wasted both your money and our time. All right, says Rich Wicklow. And I think, continues Miss Baines, that while I'm at it, I might as well tell you the plans I have for this palazzo, which is to be turned into a karate school for high school girls. Your life will not be worth living, Mr. Wicklow. I know it, Wicklow groans. You will not like it, Mr. Wicklow. Yes, yes, he says. Considering what I know about the firm, you may even have to make me a partner, Mr. Wicklow. His head snaps up. Miss Baines, she is standing just inside the door to the great marble room. She's sizing him up. She's wondering mildly where that idiot Albano and that idiot Ludlow and the cat and all those silly girls have got to. She seems remarkably graceful. She pirouettes on one heel. It's wonderful how good a woman can look when she knows there's no competition around. 
He hates her. Mr. Wicklow. He follows her. Appendix: The Latin. It's no wonder they call up the Great Mother, considering the invocations they use. If you are interested, Milia hominis est confusio, sancti clair de pertulot. Woman is man's damnation. Felix conjunctio, happy conjunction of a boy and girl. Quick quid te cara delectat etc. Everything dear to delight you. Why put it off, sweetheart? Awe formosissima, etc. Oops, can't find it. More medieval love poetry. Imperatrix Mundi, Empress of the World. Dione, another name for Aphrodite. Mundi Luminar, Light of the World. Aliquid Mihi, etc. There exists something which must be done by me. Bad Latin. Quid nunc, etc. A facetious cry for which I am indebted to T. H. White's Mistress Masham's repose. What is biting you, O learned man? Weeny weedy, I came, I saw. Weeky, I conquered. Weeny audui, ex e, I came, I heard, I left. Magister magici, nasty neologism. Reprobare reprobos. To reprobate reprobates, written by one. Joanna Ross writes, assuming this to be free advertising space, I will now put in a plug for writers who, with a very few exceptions, are day laborers, paid piecework in an industry that is shaky, badly advertised, and poor, largely due not to its choice of books or its editing of them. But to an impossible distribution system for paperbacks, in which the distributors and the retail outlets do not share in the risk, and in which books are merchandised like Kleenex, and a vehement confusion between old-style paperback selling, impulse buying, and the emerging reality that soon there ain't going to be hardbacks except for specialized books and library sales. Nobody has adjusted to this yet. Nobody knows who buys books, where, and why. It is a mess. It is rude and crude to rend the lovely veils of spidery illusion which blow so gently over our work, but for a field that prides itself on being down to earth, there is an extraordinary reluctance to look at the economic facts. Many Americans seem to be like this. Maybe art is supposed to be above all that. My own quixotic dream for the paperback book industry is a giant Sears Roebuckish centralized store, which will carry remainder books at lowered or raised prices, depending on their bibliographic value and the rise due to inflation, and have we beautiful catalogs in every hamlet, village, and town where people, now that the movies are too expensive, can go when TV pulls and find old Phyllis Whitney Gothics. Look, I found a copy of Fear in the Old Castle, or H.P.L. Look, horrible monsters from Old New England, or controversial books. How can anybody bear to talk about such filthy things in public? I'll buy it. Order them. See, no problems with shelf space. Pay for them, and get them quickly. The books would move only when paid for. Copies would not be shredded as they are now when they're not sold within about ten days. But how would prices on old paperbacks be changed? With a goddamn supermarket stamp, Nudnik. College bookstores, as three of them have told me, always sell SF if it remains on the shelves long enough. The real problems are distribution and information, really identical. Of course, such an operation would require a vast capital outlay, or would it? Specialized bookstores do this kind of thing already. At any rate, it points in the proper direction. I think the first step is for some brilliant sociologist or computer programmer out there, hello, hello, to get a grant to study just who buys books and why. Something about which there are a lot of publishers' theories and no facts. A big grant, and then say, why don't one of you readers?
Interface by A. K. Atanasio Morning sunlight running invisibly through the long, slender glass windows gives the laboratory a surreal attitude. The walls are white, circular, and indifferent. And the remote ceiling is a luminescent circle with an eleven-meter diameter. The cylindrical room itself is a menagerie of electrical equipment describing the circumference of an amphitheater recessed in the center of the room. In the amphitheater is a mechanized chair of graying leather before a television screen. The floor is well waxed. Dr. Michel Ibu advances several paces into the laboratory and looks across the amphitheater at a small bank of data collators, mute in the sunlight. Their metallic faces, catching the sun, wear several small rainbows. Dr. Ibu walks around a crowd of oxygen tanks and stands at the edge of the amphitheater. He is lanky and has a slight stoop. His face would be virtually flat except for high, prominent cheekbones laced with fine wrinkles in the black skin. His temples are gray. Dr. Reed, he calls tentatively. Be with you in a minute, a distracted female voice answers. Dr. Ibu folds his arms and grins. So this is how we meet, he thinks. A slender, dark-haired woman in a light blue lab smock emerges from behind a portable canvas partition that has a large, assertive, red exclamation point printed on it. She is tall, and her hair is loose, falling about her shoulders. Yes? she asks. Dr. Reed, I am Michelle Ibu, from the Marine Labs. She raises her eyebrows in a gesture of surprise. So you're the neurophysiologist biophysicist I've been warned about, she says without a smile. I've been tracking you down for two weeks, Ibu grins. It seems you're kept quite busy here. Frankly, Dr. Ibu, I've just been trying to avoid you. He cracks a disconcerted smile. Why? I'm not interested in working with terminal patients. How do you know I'm going to ask you to? Are you going to be coy? Who told you about the project? I received your first invitation to work on the project, and then I went to Comptroll, and I looked into it myself. I'm just not interested in working on it. But do you understand what it's about? I don't understand why you have to use a terminal patient. Look, Dr. Reed, have you had breakfast yet? Yes. Well, I'd like to talk with you, to familiarize you with the project. I'm listening. Well, why don't you let me take you down to the marine lab so I can show you what we're doing? I haven't got the time, Dr. Ibu. Okay, he says, exasperated, running one hand over his face. In a nutshell, I'm on the verge of interspecies communication. I'm working with Lenny Adolphin and Heath Underhill, an 18-year-old terminal. Underhill? Do you mean he's from Underhill Clone? Yes, but it would be more accurate to say that he's a reject from Underhill Clone. He's a CDD. The defect is on an independent geriatric allele. In a short while, two or three years, he'll start decomposing. But right now he's in perfect health and with an IQ that easily categorizes him as a genius. He was purchased for just those reasons. Underhill Clone sent me Heath when he was six months old. As a CDD, he would have been youthed immediately. But we kept him here, and when he turned seven, we introduced him to Lenny. They've grown up together. Their psyches have been interacting for most of their lives. They have a good, healthy relationship. You talk as if they're equals. If anything, Lenny is Heath's superior. The dolphin has a cerebral cortex the size of a human's, but the parietal area, the silent zone linked to abstract thinking, is almost twice as large. When I began to study dolphin sounds, I found they had an immensely more complex communication system than we do. This is what led me to question whether we might establish interspecies communication. Our biggest problem right now is structural. The dolphin language is sonic, but it's waterborne, and is therefore ten times faster than ours. We just think too slowly to talk with a dolphin. But that's where you come in. And how's that? Your field is psychobiology. Your specialty is neurology. And your research project for the past six years, since you first came to the clinic, has been autonomous visceral control. I know that you've taught subjects how to control their heartbeat, blood pressure, even certain glandular excretions. What I'd like is for you to teach Heath much of the same, only more intensively. 
But what has that to do with talking dolphins? Dr. Maddock, the psychophysicist here, has synthesized a hallucinogen that, in some way I'm not familiar with, mobilizes awareness. It distorts temporal perception so radically that, for any practical purposes, time for the user no longer exists. Most remarkably, it's possible when using this drug to shift consciousness to any part of the body. There is one drawback. Even the smallest trace quantities of this drug are enough to dislocate consciousness for hours. And he's found, working with rats, and in the six volunteer cases he's had, that it's impossible to survive without extensive conscious visceral control. Many of the primitive parts of the brain are shut down by the drug, and normally independent functions simply stop. Only one of the six volunteers survived. I still don't see where the talking dolphins come in. It's the mutual belief of Dr. Maddock and myself that within the expanded state of awareness of this drug, it will be possible to race up the mind, so to speak, to the faster rate of communication that the dolphin employs. With the proper pre-contact training, most of which in Heath's case is unnecessary, considering the simpatico between him and Lenny as it is, we may establish the first interspecies communication. We may be exposed to a culture whose structure is totally alien to us. Dr. Reed deliberates for a brief moment. Presently, she says, There are two others in this department who have been working on visceral control, Kapowitz and Jennings. Yes, but only you have had extensive experience with humans. Heath may be synthetic, but he's still human, and you're the most qualified to deal with him. All right, she says, shrugging. I have to admit you've interested me. When do we begin? You may begin whenever you're ready, she says, securing the headrest. Take it from 64 to 110. Dr. Reed walks to the front of the amphitheater and steps behind a console, from where she can monitor the heartbeat of the young man in the mechanized chair and still observe him. The subject's face is calm, and his eyes are fixed on the TV screen in front and slightly above him. Several minutes of inactivity pass, and then a small red light on the face of the screen blimps once, indicating an alteration in the heartbeat of the young man. Focus on that, Dr. Reed thinks. Another red light blimps. A moment passes, and then there is another flash, and then another. The TV screen registers an acceleration of heartbeat by displaying a cardiograph with more frequent spikes. With deliberation, the rate climbs to 110 beats per minute. Okay, now bring it down to 50, Dr. Reed orders. Immediately, another red light flashes on the screen. This occurs once more before the spikes on the cardiograph become more separated, spacing out to 50 beats per minute. Fine, she says. Now maintain that rate and increase your blood pressure. Take it to 120 over 90. Another graph flicks onto the TV screen, showing his relative blood pressure. 30 seconds pass before the graph indicates an increase in the pressure. It increases steadily, leveling off at the assigned pressure. Very good, Dr. Reed says, recording the time intervals on a clipboard. He's progressing well, I take it, a gravel voice says at her side. It's Dr. Ebu. Hold it there for another minute, she directs, and then turns her attention to Ebu. Yes, his will is remarkably well integrated. He's a good subject to work with. I'm glad to hear that you're satisfied, Ebu says. Would you say, then, that he's ready? Ready for what? Short-term suspension of visceral control? Yes. Prolonged suspension? No. You've been working with him for six weeks. How much longer before he can master his visceral responses? Master them for what period of time? Indefinitely. Dr. Reed turns back to the experiment. That's it for now, Heath. She looks at Ibu. I'll need another two weeks at least. Ibu's mouth slips open. Two weeks? My dear, do you realize how impatient I am? I'm doing as thorough a job as I can, as quickly as I can, Doctor, she says, studying her console and recording some final data. You yourself pointed out that if he doesn't master this, his life may be forsaken. Besides, if you didn't hog all of his time, this process would have been over long ago. I'm not hogging his time. It's Lenny. But that's necessary, too. Their relationship is important. She shrugs. 
I just think you're jealous of Lenny, Ibu says, mock seriously. Dr. Reed puts down her clipboard and regards him with a solemn stare. She looks vexed. Hello, Michelle, Heath says, approaching them. He is of average height, perhaps a trifle smaller. His complexion is light and smoothly clear, enhancing his pleasing features, prominent jaw and soft gray eyes. His physique is ideal. Hello, Heath, Ebo responds with a smile. Elizabeth tells me that she is very satisfied with you. Heath grins and makes a sarcastic gesture. Listen, you, Elizabeth says with feigned anger, keep that up, and tomorrow you'll get a real workout in the chair. As for you, she glares at Ibu, why don't you go tell it to your fish, or, or mammal, or whatever it is? Ibu laughs a staccato laugh, indicating his own satisfaction. I'm going to do that right now, he says, putting his arm around Heath's shoulders. It's just about time for Lenny's session. Heath faces Elizabeth. Why don't you come with us? he asks. I don't think I can afford the time now, she says. I've got all of today's data to correlate still. You can do that tonight, Heath says. Besides, I'm tired of showing off in front of Michelle and his cronies. It'd be more satisfying for me if you were there. Ibu chuckles. What can you say to that? I'm coming, she says. The young man's abruptness makes her nervous. It is a long, cool walk through the air-conditioned halls of the clinic from the neurology labs to the marine labs. Occasional artistic blurbs of multicolored geometric designs printed on walls and doors relieve some of the monotony of the otherwise bland white corridors. The marine labs take up the entire west face of the complex of buildings that make up the clinic. It faces the sea. The particular lab that they enter is more like an enormous gymnasium. The ceiling is several stories high, and many naked steel beams cross each other up there. On the tile floor of the lab, besides a series of bleachers and several large water purifying units, there is a red stripe that outlines a hundred-meter pool. Ibu leads up to the demarcation and finds a metal ring that opens a door in the tile floor. Ibu and Elizabeth descend into an observation room that is a chamber whose one wall is a glass side to the pool. The pool is connected to a large underwater tunnel that leads directly to the sea. It is rarely closed off, and all manner of sea life find their way. Dr. Ibu learned long ago that to confine a dolphin against his will was futile. They just won't cooperate. He found that the creatures responded better to his experimentation when they were treated warmly and consistently, and were allowed to come and go as they pleased. Elizabeth touches her fingertips to the glass. The water is pellucid enough to see the surface clearly. Up there, Heath is stripping. It'll be a few moments before Lenny gets here, Ibu says, looking at his watch. Does he always come on time? Always. The sound of someone singing in a falsetto seeps through the walls from unseen corridors. It is a happy tune. Tell me, Michelle, Elizabeth says, studying her reflection in the glass. She considers herself good-looking. Most men would agree. Is there any possibility of... There is a blurred, elusive movement in front of her. Focusing her eyes, she sees a dolphin, slightly larger than a man, its gray form sleek. It darts longitudinally across her field of vision. Punctual indeed, Ibu says, his flat black face bright with pride. He returns his attention to Elizabeth. Excuse me. What was it you were going to ask? She had meant to ask about Heath, and if there were any chance of his life being prolonged. She knows it is hopeless, and thinks it better not to give Ibu any more reason to suspect that she is infatuated with Heath. My answer is out there, she says, gesturing toward the water. I was going to ask if Lenny was really coming or not. A silvery blue conjuries of bubbles thrusts itself soundlessly before the glass wall, resolving itself into a human form that gracefully arcs back up toward the surface, completing a perfect parabolic sweep. Heath returns immediately, but this time he is clinging to Lenny's back, trailing his legs behind him. The duo completes several spirals and then surface for air. They'll play for a couple of hours, Ibu says. In the pool, Heath is completing the transition between two worlds. He lets the above world slip away, shrugging off its gravity. The below world, the world of muted colors and buoyant substance, adopts him. Not a foster world, though, nor less genuine, 
but more congenial than above, more real. He skims along the surface of the pool, any keeping time beside him, his bottle nose and permanent smile above water. Then, with a stretch of stroke, Heath picks up the pace, and with dazed and jumping eyeballs, he looks once more above, then dives below. He reaches the bottom, touches it with hands and knees, and then unforms and sprawls shapeless as a dead man, hanging limply in suspension. Lenny slips under him and pushes him. They latch together and streak up. The green edges of the pool whirl, dizzy with the eruption of their surfacing, and the pumping heart shakes the brilliance from the electric lights. Heath loops his arms around Lenny again, and they somersault below, easing into a slow sweep of the bottom. Heath feels his body become exhilarated with a smooth effort. His brain is hurled from platitude, the forced lungs cry for meager air, organs of sense are strained beyond their common catch, and the world and tortured body pulse into chaos. Together they unmake old realms. Having to halt, they drift to the surface. Heath gasps for breath and hears the blood grow soft and usual. Seeing the green pool's edge and his pile of clothing, he feels stale threats come up abreast and reassert their normalcy, before whose arrogance he straightens, fills his lungs, begins to dive. Yes, they'll play for hours together, Ibu says, his eyes glazed over. Dr. Corin Maddock, sitting in his cramped office with a glass panel that looks out into his cramped lab, sees Elizabeth Reed as soon as she enters the lab. She walks toward his office with a straight-backed, slow step that he is very fond of in her. He doesn't know her very well, only by word of mouth and his own sexual curiosity, but he has admired her for a long time, since his wife died. That long? Really? Having seen him staring at her, she does not bother to knock. He likes that, too. Dr. Maddock, I'm Dr. Reed, she announces congenially. Come in and sit down if you wish, Dr. Maddock offers in a voice with a trace of Australian accent. I'd ask you to make yourself comfortable, but the room's too small for that. Yes, you're really tight, even your lab. It's unfortunate, all right. Comptrol thinks that because all my work is molecular, I can do with correspondingly diminutive working space. Dr. Reed smiles and sits down in a worn green overstuffed chair, flanked by stacks of equally worn journals. I've come to talk about your drug, the psychotrope that'll be used in Dr. Ibu's experiments. US-12, Dr. Maddock confirms. I wasn't aware of its name. It doesn't have a name yet. That's just a temporary label. It stands for Unspecified Structure. I, de I determined the structure, despite the current label, long ago. I just never got around to registering an official UPAC name with Comptrol. She nods. Well, if I can be direct, I'm contributing to Dr. Ibu's project, too, and I'm curious to know exactly what the nature of US-12 is. It seems no one really knows. Dr. Maddox smiles. Though he is forty-one, his sullen eyes behind tinted silver-framed glasses look much older, dark and netted with wrinkles. Dr. Reed recalls having seen him at the computer center occasionally, and remembers him as what some of the female texts there described as dark, tall, and lonely. Though he still wears a wedding band, she also remembers having heard from someone that his wife had died a few years ago. She pities him, almost. She believes he is the kind of introverted scientist type who will probably never again go out of his way to meet another woman. U.S. 12 admittedly is strange, Dr. Maddox says. Only five or six molecules of it are required to precipitate a psychotomimetic experience in an average male. It works directly on the reticular activating system, initiating a serotonin-based chemical reaction within the RAS that very quickly affects the cerebral cortex, and in the only way I can describe it, dislocates consciousness. That specifically, Dr. Reed says, is what I'm curious about. What do you mean? You're not talking about out-of-body experiences. Dr. Maddock shakes his head. No, if anything, the opposite. By a remarkable biochemical rearrangement, the scope of awareness is infinitely enhanced by the drug. The sensory level of our consciousness is limited to the few sense organs by means of which we make our fumbling contact with the external world. This somatic level of consciousness is limited to the organs and tissue centers of the body. A large enough dosage of US-12, 4 to 5 milligammas, 
which I suppose most of us would call trace quantities, activates the cellular level of consciousness. There are as many distinct levels of consciousness as there are anatomical, cellular, subcellular, and neural structures within the body, and this drug can activate any of them. But that's not related to Dr. Ibu's work. No, it isn't. He merely wants to increase the somatic consciousness of his subject to enable quicker neural responses. We'll use eight molecules for that. Have you experimented with that quantity before? Six times. What were your results? Five of those subjects died as a result of being unable to cope with the effects of the drug, specifically loss of autonomic visceral control. What about the other one? He survived, but he had been trained to, indirectly though. He was a yogin. That's how he stumbled onto the necessity for conscious control of visceral responses. But if I'm not mistaken, that's your role in the project, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well then, we may be working together quite soon. Dr. Reed frowns quizzically. I'll be supervising the administration of the drug during the preliminary experiments. There are some exercises the subject should master before he's introduced to the drug. Other than that, though, he'll be chiefly your charge. By the way, what's his name? Heath, she shouts, her hands funneling her mouth. She feels a moment of desperation. The young man has drawn far ahead of her and is running along the wet, flat sand following the slow curve of the shrunken sea. Three hundred yards to his left, the small waves are breaking, running in shallow streams along the smooth beach. Huge black rocks, crusted with gray barnacles below the high water line, rip out of the sand at random intervals, upsetting the perfect flatness of the landscape in a peculiar way. They remind Heath of bent witches, draped by heavy, dark shrouds. He splashes through a knee-deep pool and runs up to a narrow, natural jetty made up of a collection of small black boulders. He stands with his back to the low sun and the broad expanse of the sea reach. After a few minutes, Elizabeth, her hair falling long past her shoulders and stringy with salt, jogs up to the jetty and sits down at Heath's feet. She is breathing hard from her run, and there are small droplets of sweat at her temples. She is wearing denims cut very short and the top of a white bathing suit. I can't run any farther, she breathes. Okay, let's stay here and watch the sunset, Heath says, squatting beside her. The slanting beams of sunset ripple off the distant thin line of ocean and touch the many pools of water around them with a fiery glow. The repeated call of some bird, sharp and discordant, is all that disturbs the silence of the world. Heath sits with his chin resting in one hand, his profile catching a vague line of light that follows the outline of his features. Soft lines, but with sharp touches, maturity emerging from childhood. His fair hair curls around the small ears and along the sleek tendons of his neck, not quite hiding a blue vein. Elizabeth shifts so that they are touching, pleased by the warmth and firmness of his flesh. For the first time she is caught up in the thought that he might accept her physically. Istigkeit, Heath says, without removing his eyes from the horizon. That's the word Meister Eckhart liked to use. Isness, she translates. He turns, focusing his steady gaze on her. That's a funny thing to say, isn't it? But that's what this reminds me of. Being. The chant of the sea rolling in with the sea breeze and those colors. Three different things that produce one feeling. They are simply one. Elizabeth turns to look away, and he watches how her hair slips back from her rounded shoulder. She's confused, he realizes, but she doesn't want to pursue. Ignorance is a bliss we can never afford, he murmurs. We have to understand the self as thoroughly as we can. She glances at him, catching the odd tone, but her mind is still on their touching, thinking about how it might be extended, thinking how to narrow their proximity. You're sounding pedantic, she says curtly. She stretches her legs out. They are long and slender, and she's proud of them. Heath pretends not to notice. He studies her face, seeing the up-angled cheeks, the lime-toned eyes, the olive complexion, and the expressive mouth. 
Don't blame me for that, he says flatly. I learned to talk in a laboratory, not a classroom. So, she asks with uninterest. So I may not talk like normal people. We shouldn't have wandered this far from the city, she says, facing to look down the strand they had walked up. He sees that she hasn't been listening to him, focuses on her words, wondering why she sounds frustrated. He looks down at her legs, sees the white flesh of her thighs spilling from the tight denims. How have you been getting along with Corin? she asks suddenly. Let's not talk about that now. No, let's, she presses. Tomorrow is the first preliminary experiment. I want to know if you and Corin have had any more scraps. His training is important, I'm concerned. As a scientist? He asks with a grin that his boyish features make mischievous. She trains her eyes on the remote undulation of the falling waves. How else would I be interested? He speaks quickly because here is a fact and a change of subject. I may not be human, but I do have real feelings, and I know that you're attracted to me. She stares hard at him, a defiant ripple along her jaw. When are you going to stop harping on your identity? I hate that. He feels a pang of foolishness surge through him. I can only be what I am, he says in a strained voice. I can't delude myself. But you don't have to be so hard all the time. You're strong, you're intelligent, and you're beautiful. And I'm a carrier of defective DNA, he adds in a sardonic tone. A CDD. What does that do for my strength and my intelligence and beauty? They're all synthetic and more temporary than a third of your life. Listen, Heath, I've heard it all before, she says sharply. Why don't you cut it? In the silence that comes between them, a breeze fingers their hair. You're acting like a child, she says, breaking the pause with a bitterness that is final. She stands up and walks toward the water. He watches her slow, deliberate stride, observing how the sleek muscles tighten and loosen, flowing under the tan skin. She is physically perfect, thanks to modifications of her own alleles. He pushes that thought out of his mind and entertains the idea of going after her. He unbends, stretching in the suddenly cooler air. He begins to walk after her slowly, swinging his legs loosely, stooping several times to pick up and examine seashells, and then snapping them toward the sea. In his head, an extravagant fantasy begins to gel into an idea. He feels suddenly bold. He saunters up beside her and runs a damp hand along the curve of her back. Are you attracted to me? He asks, stopping and holding her by both of her elbows. Why do you think I can't stand to watch you tear yourself apart? Just say yes. Yes. She feels her back and her thighs harden. I felt that way about you for a long time. She hears the nervousness in his voice. He moves his hands up her arms, past her shoulders, glancing her neck, and pressing his palms to her cheeks, he moves his lips over hers. This, it seems to her now, is a bandit pleasure. They walk, holding each other tightly, to a large overhanging black rock. They sit down at its base, and Heath pulls her close to him. She is warm and soft. Her eyes are large and clear and make her willingness apparent. His hands are gentle, and he caresses her in such a way that she feels he is confident. That pleases her. His hand undoes her denims and her white top, and then retreats to his canvas shorts. Her dusky body reclines, the neck and the swelling breasts, the curve of the hips, the belly with its beginning traces of dark down, the full thighs, the legs stretched out wide apart, and the black fleece, provocative, proffered, henceforth available. He smiles and bends over her in the failing light. No verum me, no verum te, he thinks wryly. There is a long and pleasing physical interlude that ends reluctantly in the twilight. When he has collapsed, Elizabeth pushes his weight off. In the ensuing stillness, the cool darkness licking the sweat from their bodies, she experiences a moment of clarity. She realizes that there is no longer any feeling. She had failed or refused to see that her passion was produced by the restraints that were opposed to her sexual impulse. 
Now lying limp, she sees the object of her desire as a frustrated adolescent gripped by the absolute fear of an imminent and unavoidable future. To think that she had craved his total acceptance so adamantly makes her smile without mirth. She knows he feels some degree of pride, and this irks her. The return walk to the clinic is long and tedious. In front of the canvas partition with a large red exclamation point printed on it, Dr. Ebo and Dr. Reed stand. They are looking into the pit of the amphitheater where Dr. Maddock, sitting on a stool, is addressing a white-smocked Heath. Heath shifts his weight in the leather chair, his eyes closed, hearing the dull voice of Dr. Maddock resonate in his right ear. I'm going to place a breathing mask over your nose and mouth, Maddock is saying. Take one deep breath and hold it for as long as you can. There will be no immediate effect, except for slight dizziness. Heath has read all of Maddock's papers on the psychotrope. He knows its structure, the paths of its synthesis, and its physiological effects perfectly well. And he is annoyed that Maddock still treats him as if he knew absolutely nothing. The mask is clear plastic and fits snugly. Heath drags the thick air in slowly, recognizing the mixture of oxygen and helium by its sweet odor. But undetectable within it are a handful of large, clumsy adrenochrome molecules. The mask is removed, and tightening his lips, Heath lets the muscles in his arms and legs relax, waiting for the first effect, which will be an outstanding intensification of visual stimuli. If you open your eyes, Maddox says, in a few moments you'll become aware of an alteration in your color perception. Heath's lids slip open. The expectant dizziness has not come. As yet he is feeling unaffected. Dr. Reed has moved into his line of vision. She walks to a console where she can monitor his metabolism. She is wearing a skirt and no stockings, and he admires her legs, toast-colored. Looking up, he sees that she is watching him, and he gives her a sly, mischievous grin that makes her look away. Just in front of her, the metallic face of the console catches the sunlight that is streaming into the laboratory. To Heath, the light is shattering off the metal in complicated broken lines and spirals, webbing bright stars and fainter ones that are reflecting with it. He snaps his attention out of its focus, realizing that the first effect of the drug has manifested itself. Elizabeth's hair, tumbling about her shoulders, seems to glow with a living light. The natural wave of the hair presses against the space around it, bending the air almost as if with heat waves. Her green eyes are like crystals, faceted, casting off color in all directions, and her face, impassive, caught in an instant of remote or vacuous emotion, is like a detail from a Vermeer, perfectly still and radiant. Heath lets his gaze scan the room becoming more and more aware of the relationships between patterns. Two silver oxygen tanks with blue waistbands stand at attention in the twilight of a shadow cast by an overbearing piece of computer machinery. All of this comes together like some modern interpretation by Brock or Juan Gris. It's a still life, but without realism, lacking depth. He again pulls his attention away, realizing that he must stop his mind from wandering independent of his volition. Down that path, when the full effect of the drug comes over him, lies madness. Instead, he must strive to maintain a constant and unstrained alertness. Within the next sixty seconds, Maddox's voice begins again, you will experience your first temporal lapse. Remember to keep your attention fixed on your metabolic responses programmed on the screen, and not to allow them to trespass beyond the indicated tolerance points. When the lapse is over, indicate so to me with a raised hand. Heath looks up at the screen before him, where four graphs are registering his heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and brain waves. On each of the graphs, two red lines indicate the safety limit of that graph. For any of the four graphs to range into those regions means almost certain death. Closing his eyes, he concentrates on his mental disciplines. They are all now that is between him and oblivion. Sitting there, with a the sterile light of the laboratory filtering pink through his lids, he recalls Spinoza's statement that 
Blessedness is not the reward of virtue, but is virtue itself. And whereas before this had been to him a vaguely pregnant piece of intuition, now it is clear, and he cannot understand why he could not fully grasp it before. But to someone who has trained himself in goodness, training his desires, his will, as he has trained his own responses, diligently, relentlessly, virtue really is blessedness. Heath opens his eyes. There is an absolute quiescence about the laboratory. Movements. Elizabeth moving her hand, Ibu walking behind her, are slowing down. They continue to break until Ibu, in the midst of negotiating a turn, is casting an unchanging shadow. Sunlight itself appears different, darker in hue, like a thin plasma stretched to web thickness over the entire room. He attempts to speak, but opening his mouth demands intense concentration, and the heart and blood pressure graphs both nosedive toward toleration limits. He reasserts his mental discipline, focusing his attention over the entire neural extent of his being. He endures by his own will. Now, with his metabolism regulated semi-consciously, a vast expanse of time lies before him. The temporal lapse, he recalls, will last only two minutes, but that, in this almost timeless state, will be experienced as indefinite duration. Heath shifts his attention to Ibu. His skin is dark black, almost blue-black. The flat face, caught in mid-stride, is slightly drawn, but the features are plain. The practically non-existent nose, merely two flaring nostrils the thin lips tight against the face, and the texture of the skin itself very smooth like polished stone. The whole face emits energy, and Heath realizes that he is seeing more of Ibu's face than he had ever been aware of. It is now more than just spatial relationships. It is visionary beauty. He shuts his eyes again. The rosy darkness unmasks inner sensations that he had never faced before. He can feel his eyes, still tense from their exposure to light, retaining a ghost image of the laboratory. He is aware of the entire eye, warm from the light, the entire multi-layered swamp of rods and cones, hungry for light. He holds his eyes open to mere slits. Streams of light energy flood into him, so that his head becomes dizzy with sensation. He shuts his lids. It's true what Bergson said that the sense organs are eliminative. But now this drug has unfettered him. Within his darkness he can feel his whole body. Other than his open awareness to messages from the autonomic nervous system, he is conscious of a linkage to every cell within his body, so that he knows he can map any somatic sensation. But there is more. He feels himself sinking down into the soft tissue marsh of his own body, drifting slowly down dark capillary canals, propelled through endless cellular factories, ancient fibrous clockworks. Presently, after an indeterminable time, Heath gathers his attention and opens his eyes to see if the temporal lapse has completed itself. There is a brief flash of seeing the laboratory, white, brilliant with Maddox's face, motionless and very near, and then it passes, dissolving into a shimmering filigree of pulsating white waves. For an instant, Heath panics, and the light intensifies, but then he realizes what he is seeing, the subcellular worlds of neural energy shuttling everywhere within him. It is an endless sea of dancing particles, and even though he knows what it is, he feels cold and apprehensive. His violent longing to return to normalcy makes a fiercer chill run through him, and he fights a strange, oncoming ice age of the will. He tries to remember seeing. He holds a winter landscape in his mind. Known tracks, habitual roads are covered now by a blank sameness. There are many trees bunching up to the horizon, hazy skeletons in the cold. Try the respirator again, Maddock orders softly. But he's breathing perfectly well, Reed retorts. The oxygen may loosen him from the coma, Maddock explains, looking at his watch. He's been catatonic for twelve hours now. But why, Maddock? Ibu asks in a raspy voice. I don't know. How long before the drug runs itself out? Ibu asks. It ran itself out nine hours ago, Maddock replies calmly. Well, why is my boy like that? I don't know. Why don't you know? Haven't you done this before? Yes, of course. 
You know that. But only one has survived. This project is my life, Maddock. He'd better survive. I'm sorry, Michelle. This is beyond my control. Ibu's face is taut. Keep me posted. He turns sharply and leaves the lab. This is everything to him, Elizabeth apologizes. I told him about the risks, Maddox says quietly, readjusting a sensor on the boy's temple. He holds the respirator to Heath's nose and mouth. Elizabeth watches him, noting the detached efficiency with which he toils over the reclining boy. Not once during the past tense hours has he raised his voice or displayed anything but complete self-control. She is impressed by this. Let's get a glucose unit in here, he says. We're just going to have to sit back and wait. Ibu returns four times in the next six hours, the last time merely standing over the boy and clenching his fists. Maddock, he says, not facing the doctor, if my boy dies... I'm going to file a report with Comptroll against you. Maddox says nothing. He sips his coffee and thumbs through a journal. Ibu, his eyes red, walks slowly out of the lab. Elizabeth, who is sitting behind the console, looks across at Maddox. Why didn't you say something? What was there to say? He can't file a report. You did nothing wrong. I know. And he knows, too then you shouldn't have let him threaten you like that. Maddox says nothing. He riffles through several pages. You're due for some sleep, Elizabeth says after a brief silence. Yes, I guess so, he says, standing up. He checks over the console and walks toward the door. I'm sorry, he says, looking back. Twenty-four hours after the experiment had begun, Ibu leaves the laboratory and Dr. Reed comes in. It is raining outside, and the large room has a lazy nocturnal feeling to it. Maddock is sitting at the console, flipping the pages of another journal. He is not wearing a tie, as he usually does. His dark, heavy hair is uncombed, and his sullen eyes are listless. He watches Elizabeth's straight-backed, slow step as she walks around to examine Heath. The physician has just left, but Maddock feels there is no harm in her looking. She is more beautiful than his wife was, he realizes, but she does not have the same quiet ways of doing things that he loved his wife for. She has too much emotional remove, too. She is demanding and cold, Maddock sees. She comes around the console and moves a chair so that she is sitting beside him. The fragrance of her body lotion, vague and feminine, reaches him, and he remembers the warm odor of his wife. A week ago, with the strength of surprise, he had seen a rumpled advertisement photograph of a woman who reminded him of his wife. It had shocked him. It lay on the third step down of a subway entrance. He took it up. The nose and chin did not really match, after all. But the harm was done. Why don't you get more sleep? Elizabeth asks him. No, I'll stay here for a while. What are you thinking about? My wife. Ibu, who has just returned, stops in the doorway unnoticed. Forgive me for asking, but how did she die? Maddock remains quiet. He recalls vividly the wild night, walking in the dark and the wind over broken earth, half-made foundations and unfinished drainage trenches and the spaced-out circles of glaring lights marking streets that were to be, walking with her, but so far from her, his arms full of linen, that daring venture to the laundry, going downriver four blocks away to the train somewhere underground that was to bring them to their living place. As if by design, from out of the dark air and the cold wind, four figures emerged. Cruel decision. Enjoy. A boy with a pimply face pulled the magenta ribbons from her hair. The short-bearded one gripped a fold of her skirt. The pale, severe one pushed him from his wife and approached her with icy and painful motives and gestures half familiar from worlds of shadow violence. There was a brief struggle by the hidden river, and when it was over, he turned from them and fled. I'm sorry, Corin. I didn't. Well, why don't you tell her, Maddock? Ibu says, stepping several paces into the laboratory. Stay out of this, Maddock says, his voice breaking. I don't want to discuss it. 
She was raped one night while Maddock watched, Ibu says. She died that night in a hospital, and he was nowhere to be found. It took a witness and two good lawyers to get him off the hook. Maddox stands up and walks quietly out of the room. Elizabeth glares at Ibu and walks out after Maddox. He is standing at the end of an adjacent corridor, staring out one of the glass walls at a courtyard six stories below. The rain has streaked the window, making the wide, desolate concrete court look even more dismal. He had met his wife one hot evening in Amman. She was not beautiful then, nor was she ever, but she was attentive to what he said, and he liked her voice and quiet mannerisms. She was American, and so they hit it off together right away, because he was an Australian working for his American citizenship papers at the American-sponsored clinic at Tel Aviv. They spent two weeks together in Amman. The day before he was due back in Jerusalem, fighting erupted again, and the roads were blocked off. And later his wife went to work at one of the field hospitals, and though Corin was classified as valuable personnel, he had grown very fond of Anne and followed her to the field. He applied what little medical training he had to fulfilling his role as a medic, and at night he spent all of his time with her. They had been sleeping together for two months when an envoy, in passing, brought orders to return Maddock to Tel Aviv. They had wanted to get married then and there, but most of their papers were missing. She wrote to him often. He wrote back less often. She wrote about the wounded and about how much she loved him and needed him and wanted to have his babies. He wrote about his research, about the kind of home he wanted them to have, about how much money he could save for them. After a time he was discharged and given his citizenship papers. He wanted to go straight to America and had his research material shipped immediately. But Anne was reluctant to leave at once because her parents were in America and all the friends she didn't want to see. They quarreled about it, and he left, feeling bitter, but with her promise that she would follow in a few months. He rented a flat outside of San Diego, near the clinic. He wrote more often to Anne, but her letters were shorter and arrived less frequently. It frustrated him to have so much to say and not be able to get an immediate response. It was lonely and hot in Amman, and Anne made friends with the son of an Arab colonel. He was himself only a corporal, but he was very impressive, and besides, it was lonely and hot that time of year. She wrote to Koran that she had met the son of an Arab colonel, and that he was friendly, and she was sure that he wouldn't mind the soldier taking her to lunch now and then, because it was awfully hot and lonely. They finally made love at his apartment, and she soon moved in with him, writing to Koran that she was more involved now with the soldier, and that it was only a childish quick affair, and that she would come to the States when it was over, and they would get married, for she said she really loved him and said she felt nothing whatever for the soldier. Maddock did not write back. At first he thought he would never see her again. But he was very fond of her, and he thought he loved her. Two months later he made arrangements with her to come to him. They spent over a year making him understand it was only a quick childish affair, and then they married. The pressure's really getting her down, isn't it? Her contralto is jolting, and Maddock turns from the window. Don't let Ibu pressure you, she says. I don't care what he says, nor do I care about your wife or your past. I'm sorry I started that. Maddock says nothing. I like you, she says to him. I thought you should know. She turns and walks back to the lab. Thirty-seven hours, forty-three minutes, and eight seconds after the beginning of his initial exposure to U.S. 12, Heath awakens. It's night, he mumbles, sitting up. How long have I been out? Thirty-eight hours, Elizabeth says, as if in greeting. She undoes the sensors and rubs both of his cheeks. You really had us scared. Heath grins slyly, his face beginning to flush. You especially? he asks. Michelle, if anyone, she says, brushing a loose piece of tape from his face. After having seen him impassive for all those hours, Elizabeth feels an uncertain excitement just to watch him move and hear him talk. Maddock and Ibu appear almost simultaneously in the door. Michelle runs up to Heath, his face lighting up. Heath, my God, are you all right? he blurts. I'll go get the physician, Elizabeth says, leaving the room. I didn't realize how much time had passed, Heath explains. 
What happened? Maddock asks. Apparently I internalized my awareness, he says. I knew exactly where I was all the time, but I had no concept of duration. Then you just willed yourself out? Maddock asks. Yes, the same way I willed myself in. Why the hell did you will yourself out in the first place? Ibu asks. Elizabeth and a physician enter, and the doctor immediately begins his examination. I was bored, Heath answers, sitting up straighter. You were bored? Ibu repeats. After the time lag began, I had nothing to do. What did you experience? Elizabeth asks. It's difficult to explain. Don't move your eyes, please, the physician says, fixing Heath's lids open. I actually saw cellular activity in my body, visually, clearly, Heath says. And then I went deeper, and I saw neural activity, an incredible array of brilliant light energy. I was a little frightened of it all. That's pure nonsense, Ibu says sternly. Don't be so quick, Maddock warns. We know that the brain receives information about every process in the body. All of the biologically useless information is screened out by the reticular activating system. And it is the RAS that is affected first by the drug. It's very possible that Heath had shifted his awareness to that center of the brain. It's also very possible that Heath merely hallucinated the entire experience, Ibu says. I feel that's something we should leave for the psych people. Maddox shrugs his shoulders. You didn't remember our lessons, he says to Heath, who is now flat on his stomach. Remember, I told you to fix your attention on a single object or idea, otherwise you'd lose your awareness during the temporal lapse. Yes, I know, he says, but I didn't expect the experience to be that total. It was more than just my eyes. It was everything that I am. He's going to need some sleep, the physician says. I'd like him move to an observation room, too, just as a safety precaution. Fine, Ibu says. Do whatever you feel is best. He faces Maddock. I'd like to speak with you, outside. In the corridor, Ibu assumes a paternal air. Corn, I've known you for seven years, and I was instrumental in getting your research qualified here. I'm not saying this to make you feel indebted, but I do want you to have a sense of how important this project is for me. I'm not holding you responsible for what happened. I flew off the handle. But you know that's my character. You also know that I'm a scientist, as you are. We are not like the psych people. We work in areas where we can apply the laws of nature. So, because we are scientists, and because I had this project, I don't want you using my subject to test any of your theories. I don't want to hear about internalization. I want him to externalize, to reach out and communicate with that dolphin. And remember, I own Heath. He's my lab property and I have the last say about what he does and doesn't do. Clear? Of course, Maddox says indifferently and turns to leave. Corin? Yes? Keep in mind that despite his IQ, he's still just a teenager. Sure. Heath's room is narrow and not very long. The ceiling is one fluorescent light. The two longer white walls are broken up by large prints by Ernst Fuchs. At the far end of the room, opposite the door, is an oval window that looks out onto the bay. Two large, flat speakers emerge from the face of one wall over his desk. When Maddock enters, Heath is lying on his low bed listening to Gesualdo's Moro Lasso, which is playing rather loudly. Heath rises and turns down the music. Hello, Corin. What brings you to this quarter of the known world? he asks with a chuckle. Maddox sits on the edge of Heath's desk. I want to talk to you about tomorrow's preliminary. Look, I've got it straight about the time lag. Maddox holds up his hand. Not that. I want to ask you to give up the project entirely. Heath raises his eyebrows inquisitively. I'd like you to work for me, Maddox says. No, I can't do that. Why? I'm personally committed to this project. You mean Lenny? Aye, that's it, mate, Heath says, miming Maddox's accent. Won't you consider it? There's no reason to. That dolphin and I are too close as it is for me to stop now. Sometimes in the pool I feel that I can communicate with him. I'm not about to lose an opportunity like this. Maddox nods his head and stands up. 
Above Heath's bed is a Chinese ceramic square of exceptional subtlety and beauty. It depicts a cuckoo about to alight on a thin branch. He stares at it for a moment and then leaves. Heath takes a long drag from the face mask. He looks down at Maddox's hand, focusing on his wedding ring. He stares at the ring until the golden glow diffuses and then collects itself in a single sharp star of reflected light. He moves his eyes across the extent of his field of vision. Maddox's glasses, tinted by the sunlight in the room, look opaque. Ibu is standing just on the edge of the amphitheater, his long white lab coat draped about him like a cloak. He is standing still, and Heath moves his eyes away from him until he finds Elizabeth, who is sitting by her console, clipboard propped in her lap. She is wearing a white skirt and has her long, tanned legs crossed. Her suspended foot is wagging anxiously, and Heath pays it special attention. The lighting of the room seems to dull, as if a cloud is passing the sun. Gradually, Elizabeth's foot rocks to a stop. The time lag has commenced. Heath notices the small bones in the ankle, which create soft shadings. He examines the region where her foot enters the white shoe. A small callus is there, barely visible from his perspective, which he picks out because he knows it is there. He tracks his eyes over the shoe, noting each scuff mark carefully, scrutinizing the seams. Finally, he rests his eyes on the heel, and then begins all over again at the ankle. He does this thirty-one times before the foot begins to wag again. The foot is moving slower than it had been, and Heath notices that if he focuses his eyes, the foot moves more quickly. He is on the interface of different rates of time. He raises his hand to indicate that he is out of the time lag. Maddock places a set of black headphones over his head, covering his ears. Are you comfortable? Maddock asks, adjusting a tiny microphone that snakes around his cheek. Heath hears the question normally, but his visual perception of Maddock's lips is not synchronized with his audio perception. He nods. Fine, Maddock says. He looks over his shoulder at the pudgy physician who is standing there. The physician catches the glance and approaches Heath. He examines Heath's reflexes. When he is done, he nods at Maddock approvingly. Okay, let's play, Maddox says, swinging around on his stool so that he is facing a desk machine with a typing face. He punches out a pattern, and five digits flash on the screen before Heath for an instant. Heath moves his hand over a similar machine resting just above his thighs. He taps out the same figure. Maddox repeats the procedure, this time with six digits, flashing more briefly on the screen. Finally, he lets the computer take over, moving at a rate his fingers cannot. For over an hour they play, with more numerals and geometric patterns, more and more quickly. By the end of the session, Heath's fingers are a blur, the screen blinking nonsensically. Maddock shuts down the computer. Heath settles into the white leather. How'd I do? he asks with a grin. You're remarkable, she says, her voice muffled in his shoulder. Elizabeth and Heath are lying naked on his bed. The Sanctus in Beethoven's Mass in D is seething through the room. She is lying on her stomach, her dark hair is spreading its tendrils over his chest. When the music is over, Elizabeth gets up from the bed and scans the row of tapes just above Heath's desk. She selects the Vespers by Claudio Monteverdi. After injecting the cartridge into the player, she moves to the window. The sea is still breaking violently, and night has steamed into the bay. Two white lights are moving along the horizon. They are lusterless in the thin fog and remind her of cabin windows on a stranded hulk heavy with sand. Heath watches her from the bed. Where were you born? he asks. In Medacket. Where's that? Massachusetts, on Nantucket Island. Why do you ask? Just curious. He turns his head to look into the darkness by the door, and then he asks, Why did you change your mind? About what? About sleeping with me? You don't snore. Heath laughs, a very natural laugh. Is it because Maddock disappoints you? Elizabeth says nothing, but walks up to the bed and sits down. He's still strongly affected by his wife, he says. He would never go for you. 
For him you have no limey tangerine written all over your yummy body. How can you say that? I've listened to him talk, and I know how you operate. I don't like him. He's a coward. He only believes he's a coward. Same difference. What do you see in him? Are you jealous? Maybe. Am I being crude? How hard are you trying? Not very. Again, I'm just curious. I like Corin. Why? He's brilliant. For me, he's the easiest person to communicate with. Besides you, of course. Of course. He's not the stereotype psychophysicist with chemical formulae for love and hate. He's truly interested in the human psyche. Do you know he actually asked me to continue internalizing so that he might study the time dilation effect of his drug? If it wasn't for Lenny, I know I'd do it. Michelle would kill you. True, but I don't like Michelle. He strong arms everybody. He's highly regarded by Comptroll, and he's in well with the security force. He can get anything he wants. He's a bully. His personality is twisted. Value judgment. Heath grunts and rolls over so that he's facing her. Again, she asks. Sure. Do you love me? No. In the pool, Lenny is circling. Maddock, in a green polo shirt that reveals a physique with no signs of middle age, is briefing Heath, who is sitting forward in a large mechanized chair at the edge of the pool. Several heavy computer components on casters outflank the chair. Ibo is standing on the other side of the pool with Elizabeth and a short, bald man who is a comptroll representative. Off the record, Michel, the bald man is saying. How does this computer tie-up work, and where'd you get the idea? The dolphin world is almost strictly acoustic, Ibu explains, just as ours is visual. The total amount of information received by dolphins and humans from their environment is roughly the same, but the types differ. Before the war, research on dolphin sounds was not uncommon. Here in the States, in fact, dolphins were taught to mimic our speech. Well, in this experiment, something very similar is being done. Our subject has had his world speeded up, so to speak, to permit him to work comfortably with a sound system that will feed acoustic patterns into the pool at about the rate of dolphin communication. Quite simply, we're going to start establishing rudimentary communication today. We don't really expect any profound intercourse for some time. Why must you use the boy at all? What's wrong with computers? Ibu smiles. A typical question from a comptroll man, he says. That type of communication has been attempted time and again by myself and others, with minimal success. We don't know why, yet, but dolphins have a predilection for man. I'm betting my professional career and a lot of your money that I can exploit that predilection. Heath, our subject, has grown up with that dolphin. By broadcasting his voice to the dolphin, we're making it clear that he, the dolphin's companion, wants to communicate. We've had excellent results with preliminary experiments along this line. Heath, sitting back in the chair, looks at the frozen world around him. Ibu, Elizabeth, and the comptroll man at the far end of the pool look like mannequins posed realistically. The banks of computer components that an instant before were faces of winking lights have tilted, the lights freezing. He shifts his gaze to the water, where he can see the gray, submerged form of Lenny. After studying the still surface of the water several times, Heath realizes that the temporal lag is lasting too long. It should have ended long ago. He tries to look at Maddock, but he is out of his visual scope. He looks across the pool. The mannequins there have changed their position slightly. Now he knows that the time lag is excessively long. Returning his gaze to the pool, he detects a faint odor. He smells the esters of some sweet substance like aloe. It's the drug. There is a leak in a tube just alongside of his neck. The odor becomes more acrid, pinching his nostrils. He tries to hold his breath, but the light vapors rise up his nose. He fights to maintain his calmness. Too much of this can kill me, he realizes. Such a stupid accident. Absurd. Or is it an accident? The water of the pool has become completely transparent, so that it no longer exists. Suspended in the pool is Lenny, looking up at him. The dimensionality of the vision startles Heath, and he attempts to avert his eyes, but he cannot. He is totally paralyzed. Did Maddock do this, he wonders. Is Maddock forcing me to internalize? 
He tastes the vapors in his nostrils, and the roof of his mouth in his eyes, a biting sweetness. Dizzy. He feels that he can no longer keep his eyes open without becoming nauseated, yet he cannot close them. The air around him becomes hot and close, and he has trouble breathing. His stomach is nervous, sending spasms of sour pain down into his bowels. Lenny, hanging before and below him, has become Heath's entire visual universe. Every detail, every gradation of shading on the dolphin's body is revealed to him. Suddenly he is very close to Lenny, so close that he can feel the smooth skin on the dolphin's nose and can see every close detail of the dolphin's left eye. The tactile visual image grates on his mind with an undreamlike quality that arrogates his fright. This is real, he thinks with a calmness that surprises him. I've externalized myself. He draws closer to the eye, aware that he is commanding some kind of psychokinesthetic extension of himself. He sees a silhouette in the black iris, ghosts of motion, but with no proximity. He floats up even closer, free of the contiguities he has always known. And then he is within the cloudy mirror, and like some wide-eyed Alice, turns to look back at the world he has left. But there is nothing there in the gray light. A cry catches in his absent throat, while the thin walls of the alien cornea thicken like distance, and he is most alone. Ibu scrambles along the side of the pool, stopping short of Maddock. What's wrong? he asks, suppressing his anger. I don't know, Maddock replies. Has he internalized? It looks that way. A physician who has been standing by a computer component runs up and bends over Heath. He looks up at Ibu. Get this apparatus off him and have him move to an observation room. Ibu and Maddock quickly respond. After Heath has been removed from the lab, Ibu faces Maddock, says, You're going to have to explain this. Elizabeth, who has been standing behind Ibu, asks, Why? You've known about the risks all along. Maddock shakes his head. Elizabeth. Ibu steps back, relaxed, studying Elizabeth silently. You can't hold Corin responsible, she says. Dr. Reed, Ibu says in a quiet tone, your job on this project is over. Please don't concern yourself with my job. The short, bald man from Comp Troll steps up behind Ibu. What's happened, Michelle? It seems that Dr. Maddock has made an extravagant error. Our subject has OD'd. Elizabeth faces Maddock. He avoids her eyes, and it takes her a moment to put down the upsurge of rage that threatens to overcome her. She speaks in a faltering voice. Dr. Maddock was not responsible for what happened. The risk of the subject inter... Dr. Reed, Ibu barks. That's enough from you. The risk of what has just occurred, she continues, has always been understood by all concerned. Ibu slashes the back of his hand across her face so that she stumbles back with the impact. I said that's enough. Maddock steps forward, eyes flashing. Ibu fixes his stare on him. Yes, Maddock? Maddock drops his gaze to the floor. The comptroll man glares at Ibu, asks Maddock, Just what has happened to the boy? I don't know. Don't you understand the effects of your drug? Not fully. Then why is it being employed? Dr. Ibu and I, Ibu fires an intent look at Maddock. Don't try to transfer the responsibility, Maddock. Apparently, the comptroll man intervenes, the drug being employed is not backed with a proper research to qualify its use. I think we should shut down this project until more data regarding the drug can be acquired. He walks toward the exit. Ibu flashes Maddox one threatening glance and then follows after. Elizabeth touches Maddox's arm. This time, I'm sorry. He walks to the exit. She watches him until he's out of sight. Coward, she breathes. The sun is striking over the void observation room as Dr. Ebel walks in. Six vacant beds occupy the long room, each one under a slender window. Audible from an adjacent room is a lute nest, plucking away at Rocky Raccoon. Ebel walks toward the music. He enters the adjacent room, and against the glare of a window he recognizes the curly-headed physician who is playing the song. Seeing Ebel, he puts aside his instrument and stands up. "'Your boy was discharged earlier this morning.' the doctor says. I know that. 
I was told that the final reports would be ready for me by now. Let me see. The physician walks to a cluttered desk and fumbles among the papers. He comes away with a blue folder, the contents of which he examines at length. Well, what's the story? Ibo asks. It seems he's in excellent physical shape, suffered no damage whatsoever from the experiment. However, he remains silent while he studies the folder again. Well, there's a marked difference in his personality profile. The psych who examined him indicates here that your boy is less aggressive, displays signs of potentiating away from the death fixation all of his previous examinations have turned up, and, to put it bluntly, he's lost his sexual identity. What does that mean? He's lost his sexual potential. You might even say he's very close to being asexual. I always thought that you and Liz were having an affair, Maddox says. He is sitting on a park bench of twisted metal. Was it that apparent? Heath asks. Maddox nods, grinning softly. Maybe for you it would have been, Heath says. They are in a sunburned park on Sunday in the wide waste beyond the city. Two teams in grey deploy through the sunlight. What was that supposed to smack of? Maddox asks. I just think that you admire Liz and would have noticed something like that. Coming in stubby and fast, the baseman gathers a grounder in fat green grass, picks it stinging and clipped as wit into the leather. A swinging step wings it dead-eye down to first. Smack! boy," Heath says. Well done, Maddock agrees. He wipes the sweat from his brow, removing his glasses to do so. Tell me about what happened with Lenny again. The catcher reverses his cap and squats in the dust. The pitcher rubs the ball in his pants, chewing, spits behind him. He nods past the batter, taking his time. I extended myself. There was that gas leak. I wasn't responsible for that, Heath. I believe you, he says, though he is not sure. Anyway, I extended beyond my body. I actually merged consciousness with Lenny. That's what I want you to expound on. The batter settles, tugs at his cap. A spinning ball comes at him, and he steps and swings to it, catching it with hickory before it ducks. Socko, baby! Heath yells. Cleats dig into the dust. The outfielder on his way, looking over his shoulder, makes it a triple. Tell me again about the dolphin consciousness, Maddox says. Why do you persist? Heath asks. No one would believe you if you told them. I want to know. All right, but let's get away from this game. It's too compelling. They walk toward a remote colony of trees, the afternoon sun pacing their shadows before them. Everything I'm going to tell you now, he says, I've acquired by the mind meld I experienced with Lenny. I don't know if I can make you understand it. He says nothing more for several seconds as he gathers his thoughts. The difference between dolphins and humans is not a matter of intelligence or spirituality. It's a difference in direction. Man is constantly striving outward. All of his serious sciences attempt to explain and cope with what is around him. The dolphins, on the other hand, have done just the opposite. They've moved inward, researching the inner universe that each individual dolphin possesses. While we've banded together into social units to probe everything around us, the dolphins have remained essentially individuals, but they have progressed inwardly at a collective rate. But how is that possible? Maddock asks. You're suffering from a problem that most of us are stymied by. As far as physical science is concerned, we have long since gone beyond the 18th century notion of dead hunks of matter moving in the black void of space. Yet our psychological sciences are still restricted to 18th century mechanistic notions. Minds are simply located hunks of gray matter moving in the black void of time. The dolphins, however, realize that the mind of their species just like the mind of mankind, is a collective and interpenetrating field. The unconscious is not personal. But in order not to be swamped by infinite information, the brain functions as what Aldous Huxley called a reducing valve. It shuts out the universe so that the individual can do what is in front of him. The million signals a second must be reduced to a few.
But the intuition and the imagination maintain an opening to the unconscious, which contains all the information that could not register in immediate consciousness. Where we ignore intuition and imagination in favor of deduction and the logical sequence, the dolphins have exploited those faculties to penetrate into their collective unconscious and to advance inwardly as we have advanced outwardly. And that's why they have no culture as we recognize it. No cities, museums, no artwork or history books. All of that, and much more, is available to them in their unconscious. But how do they mark their progress? In a more unified way than we do. We have history, they have their whole collective memory right back to the beginnings of their species. They're not hindered by time because they've almost eliminated their immediate consciousness. Since the immediate consciousness must work in a step-by-step -step incremental sequence of events, its perception of time is linear. Certainly all the information cannot be restricted to that line, and so the time of the unconscious is out of time. The line must be widened and lengthened until it becomes a sphere if you want to achieve the consciousness of the dolphin. And while I was one with Lenny, I experienced that. You were aware of the future? There was no future. Time was not linear. They enter shadows shattered by sunlight and sit beneath the trees. You know, Heath, since you first told me about them, I've wanted to join you. Why don't you? I can't take you, S-12. If you had the training, you could. There's a long pause, then... I'll have to think about it. Heath frowns. One thing you learn when you minimize immediate consciousness, and that is not to think too much. You have to be able to act gracefully, and thinking makes you heavy and clumsy. Any decision in life can be decided any number of ways. I've learned to think like a strategist and act like a savage. A quick length moves as a slip of silver light not disturbing the slick surface of the pool. Lenny circles the pool twice and then breaks the water in a jumping invitation to Heath, who is standing on toes at the edge. He strips off his cotton shirt and knifes into the water. Lenny is cruising the bottom of the pool and rises to meet him. Together they dance in the filmy world, bobbing slowly to the surface for air. Skimming the surface, Heath shakes the water from his face and sees the stark figure of Dr. Ibu at the poolside, staring down at him. He strokes toward him, lifting himself into the heavy gravity. I've been looking for you, Ibu says, sitting on his heels. I heard Comptroll shut down the project temporarily, Heath says, wiping water from his eyes. I thought I'd be the last person you'd want to see for a while. Where have you been? With Manic. I don't like you seeing him. Why? He's subversive. In what way? Isn't it apparent? He's no scientist. He's a mystic. He doesn't want to understand. He wants to be enlightened. How can you say that? I know very well that Maddock asked you to work for him, so he could study the internalizing effect of his drug. How'd you find out? He approached me and told me. He wanted to buy you, of course. I don't like to be discussed financially. You told me that I can do what I want when I want. You told me you're never going to exercise your ownership rights. Oh, let's be realistic, Heath. I do own you. I can do whatever I want with you. Heath looks down at his knees and says nothing. I don't want you working for Maddock, Ibu says. What makes you think I will? Nothing. But I know that he's applied here and at two other clinics to continue his research with US-12. I'm going to do everything I can to thwart him, the way he thwarted me. He didn't thwart you. It was his failure that shut down my project, that has meant your whole life has been lived in vain. My life has been fulfilling. I am satisfied. Just disappointed that you didn't get your money's worth. And you're blaming Malik for a technical flaw is nonsense. Nonsense or not, you're not going to cooperate with him. I forbid it. Heath looks at him passively, as if studying his features. And don't get smart with me, Ibu says. My signature can have you youthed at any time. He makes his last remark as he is standing. Then he turns and walks away with clipped steps. Heath stares out over the water until Lenny slices the surface, beckoning him with sharp, happy cries. 
Holding his nose, he slips into the pool. I feel dead, he thinks. I feel as if I were the residue of a stranger's life, that I should pursue you. He sinks toward the bottom, and Lenny passes over him. I feel imperfect, unable to tell you that I understand you, but cannot follow, and that it was a mistake that placed you in that world and me in this, or that misfortune placed these worlds in us. After the first lesson in Dr. Reed's laboratory, Maddock rises from the white leather chair, stifling a yawn. How'd I do? Elizabeth steps out from behind her exclamatory partition, regarding her clipboard, and with a pencil-and-mouth accent replies, Lousy. That bad? Probably worse, but I've an uncontrollably optimistic attitude. Well, how long will it be? She raises her eyebrows and widens her eyes in feigned surprise. Didn't they teach you that a scientist's chief virtue is his patience? They never mentioned that at Australia, but then that's purely a technical school, and you can't expect such refined ethical training. She laughs warmly. Where'd you study? he asks. Harvard, ten years. He moves around her and puts on his buckskin vest. It fits him well, but Elizabeth thinks it is somewhat incongruous with his white shirt and white slacks and shoes. It's lunchtime, he announces. May I join you? If you'd like. The elevator dip and the four turns to the cafeteria are accompanied by a strained silence. Maddock puts his hands in his pockets and tries to walk as casually as he can. He selects the meatloaf with mashed potatoes and string beans, she, the swordfish, and baked potato. Both have tea. Sitting under the parabolic steel arc of a main support, they are silhouetted by a china blue sky that hovers over the thousands of green acres that separate the clinic from San Diego. You've quite a physique, she says, spreading her potato. Your physique isn't so bad either. Oh, come on, Corwin, that lion died before the war. His face flushes hot and red. He stuffs his mouth with mashed potato. Do you work out a lot, she asks. Occasionally, but I haven't that much time. I'm involved with Nayaka's karate forum. Genuine surprise crosses her face. Sincerely? Don't be too impressed. I've been at it for seven years now, and I'm still his worst student. They eat for a moment in silence. I've been meaning to ask you about Heath, she says. He's changed quite a bit, hasn't he? Maddock feels some disappointment at the bend of the conversation. Why ask me? You and he do spend a considerable amount of time together, don't you? I thought that you knew him better than I do. Not lately, she answers honestly. He hasn't avoided me, but he hasn't been around to pursue me either. You miss that, I assume. He's decidedly attractive. I wouldn't know. She regards him with a contemplative expression. He sees that, and is afraid of what she's about to say, so he speaks first. The incident at the pool was almost mystical for him. At least that's what he told me. All of his interests have changed. For the better or worse? You'll have to decide that for yourself. She walks down the boulevard alone. It is late afternoon. The sunlight is thick yellow, and she feels like she is about to cry again. She remembers that she hasn't felt this way in almost eight years. It makes her tired to think it's been that long. She stops at a corner and tries to get her bearings. She has to return to the clinic before nightfall. There is no place for her to stay in the city. She has no money. She turns down an intersecting road that leads to the highway that leads to the expressway. She wipes the tears from her eyes, but they return immediately. She thinks about being alone in Cape Cod that summer eight years ago. She had had many technical lovers by that time, and she had lost count. But she loved him as she had loved only one person before him. She recalls how it hurts your eyes to watch the sunrise coming off the bay. They had quarreled that night before she had gone out. He had whored the whole time they were together, and then, when that was over, he had wanted one of his whores to move in with him. She despised him then and ran off, as she has run off now. No money, just hurt. She had walked for hours, but that had failed to kill her despair. It was night when she had made it into Boston. She had no place to stay, so she stayed with a nicotine-perfumed journalist who had picked her up on a park bench. His apartment was cramped, his breath was stale, and his only compliments were that he liked dark-haired women 
and was enthusiastic about needing no pillow under her buttocks. She hitched to Cambridge the next morning, and as soon as she got to her flat, she got sick. She stands on the macadam, her thumb out. Two cars hum by before a dirt-caked, formerly red, old-fashioned gas piston jerks to a stop. She hops in, and the car is lurched off before she regards the driver. He is bulky, strong-looking, and with close-cropped hair and bright, lidless eyes. He's wearing only an undershirt without sleeves, and there is a green and blue stain on his bicep that she strains to recognize as a tattoo. He is close to fifty and unshaven. Hi, my name's Bill, he says. His voice is expectantly deep and gruff. I'm Elizabeth. Where are you going, Liz? The expressway. Fine, so am I. Where down that? The Diego Clinic. What do you want with that, he asks, giving her a narrow-eyed glance. He smiles broadly. His teeth are yellow-brown. What do you want with them scientist types? I work there. He opens his window and spits out. You mean you're a scientist, he says with a chuckle. Yes. He stops laughing. Sorry, ma'am, he says, his face serious. You look much too fine to be a scientist. But I am. You're fine, all right. The car turns onto the expressway and accelerates. They drive for fifteen minutes in silence. Then he pulls off the expressway and careens down a winding dirt road. She looks at him. What are you doing? He says nothing, merely smiles his dirty smile. Stop the car, she orders. Will do, love, will do, he says, laughing. The car rocks to a stop, and Elizabeth jumps out before he can grab her. She starts running toward the expressway, hears the car door slam behind her, and the quick scratch of his pursuit. Now hold on, love, he calls. When he is directly behind her, she spins about, feeling inside the pocket of her jacket. He grabs her left arm and pulls her toward him. In one smooth, unified motion, she withdraws the knife from her pocket, hisses it open under his chin, and slashes his neck. Blood drools over his chest, and he jumps back with a startled gasp. She turns about and runs to the expressway. The fourth car that passes picks her up. The driver, a bony businessman, sees the blood on her hand and cuff, but says nothing. He is going past the clinic and leaves her off at the ramp entrance. It is time for the ocean to move on. Somehow sheathed in the warm current of the pool, he'd lost his desire for the sea. He usually left with the tide, but today he feels comfortable staying. He falls, shuddering, among the detritus of kelp that has washed into the pool from the ocean. His belly touches the smooth bottom as he runs aground on his own shadow. In the world above, two legs dangle, thrashing for the fun of it, thirty feet above the weary shadow. Lenny noses up for air. He rises slowly, a long gray feather slendering up through the dense air of the sea. His eyes of bolted glass are fixed on a roundness as of sun and white flesh, glittering like stars above his brain. The dolphin rises gradually. He is very tired. As he rises, his shadow pales and enters the colorless bottom, dissolved in the whirling liquid that his thrusting tail spawns. A sense half of anguish overcomes him. A desire to sleep in the currents fights against the strong and chaining links of hungry lungs. He knows the path up is direct. But the dolphin is tired. He dawdles a while, swerves, pauses, turns on his side, and cocks a round eye up at the dense thrashing. In the calm water, ten feet down, twisting, he thinks himself around and around in a slow circling of doubt, powerless to be a dolphin. He rises slowly. Heath climbs out of the pool, kneels facing Maddock, and pulls his canvas trunks up. He's sick, Heath says. Can we do anything? Very little. He stands up, dripping. I fed him. I'm going to just let him be until tomorrow. He may get over it. He walks to a pile of clothing and extracts a thick pink towel and begins drying himself. Have you seen Elizabeth today? he asks Maddock. Yes, I had my lesson. How are you progressing? It's only been four weeks. How's Liz? She seemed to be upset, but she wouldn't talk about it. Yeah, Heath sighs, stripping off his trunks. Do you know what's happened? 
We went into the city yesterday. I really didn't want to. That was my mistake. You should never surrender yourself to anything. Always battle to the end. What? I should have told her here and not gone into the city with her, but I didn't think she'd take it that hard. You mean she loves you? Don't be silly. Love is respect and admiration. It has nothing whatsoever to do with sex, despite anything and everything those marriage manuals say. Sex is a biological drive. But you told her that you're not interested in her anymore. Yes. She started arguing about it. Got quite vicious, too. Then she just ran away. Heath finishes toweling himself and then crawls into his clothes. Always treat everything with respect, he says. That was my heroic flaw. He grins broadly. I gave myself up to Elizabeth for a time. You can't do that. You can't surrender yourself to anything, not even your death. That's how dolphins think. Do they put much emphasis on death? More than anything else. You must often think of your death, wonder about it, explore it. Do that so your life will be more defined. That sounds rather grim. No, it's just the paradox of our reality. Only the tragic sense of life is capable of sustaining an enduring strength and joy. Once you told me that we must act more and think less. Do I smell the dregs of a paradox? You're smelling the stink of your confusion. Act your life out, don't think it out. You can't think your death out. That you'll act when the time comes, whether you want to or not. But the constant knowledge of it provides the clarity we need to act without looking back. It's too pat for me. Heath smiles. What else is life but a journey to death? It is late night or early morning. The large laboratory housing the pool is not shaken by the rising wind, but a plate glass window rattles. Heath stands alone at the pool's edge, where the dripping of the filter machine, at any silence of the wind, can be heard tapping like a blind man through the lab. Lenny floats in the pool, most gray, turning up his grinning head. He is without life. Heath covers his face with his hands and prepares to sob, but he does not. There is no reason to. Everything he has been taught, everything he has learned from the dolphin, does not permit tears. Instead, he wonders why. He is convinced that Lenny was poisoned. There can be no other explanation. But who? And how to proceed to find the murderer without misleading sophism? Or is that possible? Elizabeth? She was at the clinic yesterday. And certainly she is angry enough, and that makes up for cruelty. Ibu? That makes no sense. Lenny was a vital part of his beloved experiment. Maddock? Incredible jealousy. Hardly likely. But was he responsible for that gas leak that was almost fatal? Using that as a pawn to strike Ibu? And now using Lenny too? Possible. There is enough suppressed emotion. It is possible. But only that. Possible. Who, really? A stocky, towering man, with a football-shaped head and a nose almost flat against his big-boned face, enters the dim-lit room with the grace of a ballet dancer. Like a large cat, he squats obscenely in the center of the room. Another door opens, and Dr. Ibu steps out on a carpet of light. He is wearing only a cotton robe. His face is haggard with want of sleep. He had not truly wanted the dolphin killed. He had changed his mind even as he was administering the poison. But that is irrevocable. It was a means of venting his torment, as irrational and prodigal as anything that is man's. I want Maddock dead, he whispers. The big man sits quite still, staring forward as if he has heard nothing. I will invite him here tomorrow night, Ewell continues. He will have to pass through the marine lab to get here. I have made arrangements with the security patrol that night so that they will avoid the area. Four dangerous adolescent delinquents, drugged and looking for adventure, will break into the lab just as Maddock is passing through. He will be assaulted and most unfortunately drowned in the pool. We will supervise the affair, but not interfere. The hulking man rises and leaves. It is 9.30. Dr. Maddock is standing in his laboratory examining a distilling apparatus. There is nothing about him but glassware mating with glassware. 
A single row of fluorescent lights is on overhead, and most of the small lab is crowded with shadows. The fragrance of volatile esters is strong. He looks up at the wall clock, which has just clicked 9.33, and reminds himself that he is due at Ibu's apartment at 10. He turns to lower the heating unit under the boiling flask. It is an abrupt turn, too precipitous, and his cuff catches the end of a stand. There is a crack, the sound of splintering glass, followed by a moment of uncertain panic as Maddock faces about to see the damage. A sweet aloe odor catches him full in the face, and he collapses to the floor with the realization of what it is. He falls on his back, and the row of fluorescent lights retreats further and further. Maddox senses memories rolling in his mind, the few weeks of training with Elizabeth. The room, his workbench, the air above him, bent waves from a Bunsen burner, all compress themselves in his field of vision. He tries to recall everything Elizabeth has told him. He pulls himself to his feet. It will be a minute, maybe longer, before the time lag hits him. It all depends on how much of the drug caught him. He cups his hands over his mouth and staggers from the lab. Behind him, he hears the distant crash of glassware. The corridor he stumbles down, he sees in a broken symmetry. His legs are beginning to feel rubbery, and he knows he won't make it to Heath's room. Time becomes a sequence of layers, so that each step seems to propel him durationally and not spatially. If he stops moving, he has the terrible feeling that all time will stop. Do I know enough to survive? He falls to his knees with a groan and slides along the wall of the corridor. His arm, which is falling before him, suspends itself in the air. He watches it, aware that at the same instant a tight fist has clenched itself in his chest. I can't breathe. There is a stark pain that shoots along his left shoulder and down his back. He feels the blood in his veins slowing. No. The tightening increases. No. No. The cramp and the pain ease, and then subside. Silence. His mind is now a bin without a bottom, filling with visual sensations. His suspended arm appears to be a magnificent work of art, positioned just for his observation. The white sleeve, like a closed Chinese fan, appears very delicate. But he knows it is a mountain that not even faith can move. It is a long time later when the arm collapses in his lap. He moves his head, but everything is wrong. The colors are not right. These walls were white once. Now they're anything but that. He struggles to his feet and falls again. He crawls along the corridor several feet and then attempts to rise. With much difficulty, he gets his leg under him and he forces himself to his feet. He staggers for a moment, and then he vomits, collapsing again. He retches for several minutes, holding the pain in his sides with both white-knuckled hands. When the spasms have stopped, he braces himself against the wall and stands. Lacking all coordination, he limps down the hall, holding his eyes to mere slits to reduce the nauseous shifting of his vision. He reaches an elevator and takes it down to the floor he wants. Riding, he vomits again and collapses. After getting to his feet, he edges his way toward the marine lab. Entering, he recognizes only the salt water odor. The room is dense with shadows, and he's afraid to advance farther, remembering how Lenny was found yesterday, like a fetus dead in the womb. There is movement, he thinks. He looks for it again and sees it. He tries to call out, but he cannot vocalize. The movement disappears. There is a dull thud, and then the heavy sigh of generators being turned on, and the electric lights flood the room. Maddox staggers back and falls, stumbling over his feet. Shoes clamber toward him, and a figure blots out the light. It is Heath. Corin, what's happened? There are words heard through a cotton blanket. Heath opens Maddox's mouth and smells his face. The aloe odor is faint. Did you do the drug? Maddox rolls his eyes, gasps. Yes. Okay, he says, picking him up by the armpits. Let's get to my room. They struggle together into the lab toward the exit on the other side. It's a good thing I was coming to see you, he says. How'd you survive the time lag? There is a metallic scream. A door is being kicked open. At the far end of the pool, four young men dressed in stained overalls and carrying nightsticks climb over each other into the room. Screaming war cries, they charge toward Heath and Maddock. 
Heath pushes Maddock against the generator. If you can move, get out of here, he says. Heath runs to meet the assailants and then slumps forward. He spins to his left as he sees the foremost attacker raise his arm to bring his nightstick down on Heath's new position. He leaps up and catches his opponent's arm with both of his hands, pulling it back and down, simultaneously driving his knee into the man's groin. There is a crackle as the shoulder joint snaps. Before the man crumbles, Heath lifts the club from him and blocks the attack of the next man. He buries his free open hand under the man's sternum and falls behind him, using his body as a temporary shield. The two other men have drawn knives and are approaching slowly, trying to outflank him. He charges one of them, screaming wildly, and then in mid-step turns his body about and hurls his nightstick with a yelp at the unapproached assailant. The club catches the man between the eyes and splits his skull. The final attacker is upon Heath, his knife catching Heath's arm. They struggle together briefly and then tumble into the pool. In his element, Heath disarms his opponent by applying pressure to his wrist and then drags him to the bottom of the pool, where he strikes the man's windpipe and drowns him. He surfaces slowly, his arm oozing blood. Leaning at the edge of the pool, he looks for Maddock, who is gone. He remains clinging to the side, breathing hard. Then, from behind a computer component, Dr. Ibu and a powerfully built man emerge. They approach Heath, and the large man offers his hand. He helps the boy out of the water. Thanks, Heath says, holding back a sneeze. Ibu looks at the giant and nods. The man grabs Heath and bends him backward over his knee, forcing his forehead back with the palm of his hand until the neck bone snaps. Then he casts the rag doll body into the pool. Maddox stumbles back into the lab. Three reluctant security men are with him. He runs along the pool but stops short when he sees Heath's body floating. We just arrived, officers, Ibu explains. It appears that four thugs had broken in. Two of them are dead, and so is my subject. They murdered him. From Heath's window, Elizabeth watches the ebb slip from the rocks, the sunken rocks lifting streaming shoulders out of the slack. The slow west is sombering its torch. A ship's light shows faintly far out over the weight of the ocean on the low clouds. A footfall makes her turn slowly. It is Maddock. Hello, he says. She returns her gaze to the sea. I've looked for you so I might say goodbye, he says. You're leaving? Cumberland has reviewed my work and is giving me a grant to continue research. When do you leave? Tomorrow, my materials being shipped after me. She continues to look out of the window for a long time and then faces Maddock. I shouldn't warn him, should I? Maddock shakes his head. He wouldn't approve. He turns to leave. Corin? He looks over his shoulder. She smiles. He smiles back and is gone. She looks out of the window again to the sea, where great waves awake and are drawn like smoking mountains bright from the west. It is quite late when Ibu enters Maddox's lab. He is dressed as usual in his lengthy white lab coat and dark blue tie. Maddox, dressed entirely in white, is easily spotted in the dark lab, sitting on one of his lab tables, accompanied by rows of glassware. Come in, Michelle. Ibu walks up to Maddock and stands before him. I hope you'll excuse my intrusion, Corin, he says. I wasn't doing anything, not even thinking. A remarkable feat. It comes with practice. You're leaving tomorrow? Yes. You've gotten a grant to continue your work? Yes. How fortunate. My own project has been reviewed here again and considered too impractical. It's been shut down permanently. How unfortunate. Yes, you can choke. You've lost nothing. I squandered nothing. Do you imply that I have? I am merely suggesting that you might have. Well, it so happens that you are very right, Corin. I have squandered all of my resources. All of them. What are you going to do now? Do I detect a hint of apprehension? Ibu smiles. I am jealous of you, Korn, but more importantly, more intensely, I am angry with you. In fact, it is you that I see as the cause of my misfortune. 
He slips his hand into his pocket, and Maddock tenses. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to kill you. He withdraws something white. It's only a handkerchief. He unwraps it and moves to hold it to his face, but with a turn of his wrist he faces it toward Maddock and reveals a thin aerosol can. Ibu sprays a fine mist. The odor, sweet like aloe, envelops Maddock's face. He throws his arms out wildly, kicking and falling backward. The sound of glassware shattering is very far away. Iron hands on his collar jerk him into a standing position. How ironic, letting your own drug do you in. Ibu laughs loud and long. Maddock is breathing hard through his mouth, his hands at his throat. Ibu spins him about so that they are facing. Maddock feels that in the darkness of the room everything is dominated by degrees of smallness. Ibu appears to be at the far end of a long tunnel, like some small trinket of an African god. My god, Maddock! Ibu mockingly shouts. You've just accidentally inhaled a gas mixture of your own drug. He pushes Maddock so that he skips backward, falling against the bench. More glassware collapses in the distance. And now, scared for your life. Oh, you do get so scared for your life, don't you, Corin? Ibu laughs again, gripping Maddox's collar and dragging him out of the lab. Scared for your life, you run madly out of your lab. You run and run, Ibu screams. You run and run until everything slows. Everything stops. Ibu heaves him down the corridor, and Maddox sprawls to the floor and slides. Inside his head, the confusion rages for a moment. Only a moment. His chest is tightening uncontrollably, and the burning pain sears his whole back and left side. No! Yes, moan, you bastard! No! No! Ibu's laughter is uncontrollable, echoing in the corridor and in Maddox's ears until the physical universe comes to a halt. He tries to focus on a mark on the floor, but his vision is blurring. His glasses are half off and he cannot focus his eyes. His head feels as if it has been disconnected from his body, but the pain is gone. He has mastered his responses again. The time lag ends with a burst of spaced-out, distant laughter. Maddock feels quite calm, despite it, quite serene. Ibu pulls Maddock to his feet. So you survive the initial tests of your own creation, but you are still dazed, and you stagger blindly down the hall, groping. Ibu pushes Maddock forward, holding him by his hair and arm. The corridor seems to stream past him, but he can control his vision now. His glasses are intact, and he has some grip on his senses. You come to the elevator, and you wait for it, uncertain where you are headed, only running scared. Footsteps, quick footsteps, crash down the hall. A young orderly rounds the bend. Hey, what's going on? he calls. Ibu releases Maddock. The orderly draws closer, and Ibu whips his aerosol can out, spraying the man in the face. The boy gags once, and slams himself against the wall, a surprised look on his face. You fool, Maddock! In your mindless flight you kill an innocent man whose only intent was to help you. The elevator arrives, and Ibu kicks Maddock in. When it stops, Ibu drags him out and down the corridor. The smell of the sea is strong. Driven mad by your drug, you walk aimlessly into the marine lab. Here you will unwittingly drown yourself. You must not surrender yourself. For Maddock, suddenly everything begins to clarify itself. He stands in the doorway to the lab. The pool is still, a soft blue light is reflecting off it. There is absolute silence in there. The smell of brine is cool and relaxing. The combined effect reminds him of a temple. Can violence be permitted here? Ibu pounds him in the back of the neck, and Maddock lunges into the room more from his own power than from the force of the blow. In his mind, his years of defensive training flash almost visibly through his awareness but he knows that it does not matter whether he understands it or not. He must feel it. It must be automatic. Action, not thought. A hulking figure appears to his left, approaching him. Maddock rises to his feet and crouches. The drug has enhanced all of his perceptive powers. Simultaneously, he can watch the giant and Ibu study their movements, know their thoughts. He begins sidling to the right, toward the pool. What do you think you're doing, Maddock? Ibu calls, hilarity breaking his voice. You're not seriously going to fight. 
he erupts into peals of laughter. Maddox stares through the shadows at the giant. The man's body looks like knotted whipcord and layers of solid muscle. He feels no fear, only serenity, his mind and body one. One will. He circles warily opposite the huge man, his muscles poised and ready. Maddox sees the motion from behind him. It is Ibu, and he delays responding for a fraction of an instant, waiting until he can skip to the side. He maneuvers, and Ibu hops past him clumsily. Maddox shifts his weight and kicks out and up, catching Ibu on the side of the head. The black man falls down heavily. Now Maddox circles the giant. With unexpected speed, the man pounces, catching Maddox's right arm. Maddox screams loudly and drives his fingers to the man's throat. The giant howls and pulls away, the realization sweeping over him that this is no untrained fighter. Maddox presses the fight now, circling, but not attacking. The giant leaps high, fainting, so that Maddox draws back to the pool's edge. Trapped. The giant, crouched low, large hands ready, closes in. He sweeps out with his arms in a blurred movement. Maddox shifts his weight, using the drug to follow the giant's movements, and ducks below the arms. Then he springs up, screaming, driving his right foot forward and high. It catches the giant in the face, full force, and topples him. Maddox moves swiftly, and delivers a death blow to his temple. He looks up. Ibu is standing, blood glistening on his cheek. He is breathing hard, frightened. The dim light catches on a knife he is holding, and he charges. Maddox crouches, accepts the charge. Over Ibu's shoulder he sees approaching shadows. He catches the knife arm in one hand, drives his foot into Ibu's groin, and pushes him away. Four security officers scramble behind Ibu, pistols withdrawn. Shoot him! Ibu yells, his voice frantic. Maddox remains crouched, hands at shoulder height, eyes intent. Death is acted, he thinks. They level their guns, hesitant. He's mad! Shoot him! You know me! Shoot him! There is a barrage of fire. The impact lifts Maddock off his feet and kicks him into the pool. When the echoes stop and the smoke has cleared, his body resurfaces, the blue light reflecting on it. A. A. Atanasio writes, Interface is the first science fiction I ever wrote. I began it in the seventh grade in Mr. Nunes' algebra class. It stewed in my unconscious cauldron five years before I found it in a bedraggled notebook and rewrote it. I never thought anything creative would come out of Nuna's class, but such is the synchronous symphony of being oneself. Since completing Interface, I have been hemorrhaging ink writing poetry and fiction. My work habits, however, have expansive faces. When I begin writing, something leads the days through me the way the wind herds light through the bones of the unburied. During the months that I don't write, I walk the flat of the blade, seeking the edge where the dark is sliced from the light. I am constantly stumbling over my tail. Aside from the tarot, the calendar of shadows which shows me its small eyes, I have no close relations. But like the magician who rolls over in his sleep and wakes the fool, the world sustains me on unknown paths, and I am not lonely. We have invented ourselves. Have you forgotten already? Blooded on Arachne by Michael Bishop. Ethan Dedicus stood at the turnstile in the Saffron Depot with the other disembarked passengers of the Dawn Rite. Outside, the wind blew and the world fell away. Among the dronings of people sounds, it was his turn. I've come to be blooded, he told the man at the stile. Because of the noise, he had to repeat himself, shouting. Go to the eight sage, the stile tender said out of a skinned looking face. Ethan looked around. Bodies, polarized glass, a series of plastic domes, red sandstone beyond, a pinprick sun. I don't... There, by the footslide. That one, boy. The hag sage with the spider crown. Move on, Ethan Dedicus. You make us lag. He went through. Bodies pressed behind him, angry of elbow, flashing loud of teeth. Hands shoved at him. Hands pushed him this way and that. By the footslide, the eighth sage was staring at him, a man, maybe old, with skin the color of burgundy wine and brown satchel clothes that swallowed him. The spider crown was made of blue metal, 
and the tips of its eight legs seemed to grow into the hag sage's narrow skull. I'm Ethan Dedicus, the boy said. I've come to be blooded. Who sends you, Ethan? The martial arm. I'm to be a star bearer, an officer of the arm. Isn't that why you're here, eight sage? Didn't you come to meet me? I know you, Ethan Dedicus, but I have to know if you know what you want. Now you can come with me. The hag sage turned, ignoring the crowd in Scarlet Sky Depot, and maneuvered agilely onto the footslide. How old? The boy wondered how old the eight sage assigned me. He followed the burgundy man. Can you tell me your name? he shouted. Integrity Swain, child of learned artifice, the maybe old man said, grabbing Ethan's arm and pulling him alongside. The name was a genealogy, not solely a descriptive designation. Learned Artifice had been this hag sage's father, and their people lived in the salt gardens on the margin of Arachne's desolate sea bottoms. That was where you went when you were blooded, and that was all you knew until the eighth sage made you aware of more. Sage, only sage is what the outlaw people call me, boy. Then they were out of Scarlet Sky Depot, on the precipice stair that fell into the basin where Port Egerton lay. White larvae nestled plastically against the red sandstone. Other people went quickly into air tunnels that led down to the administrative complex. The wind blew. The pinprick sun hurled glitterings across the sky. And even here, the noise of a world continuously eroding and reshaping itself made real talk impossible. Dizzied, Ethan put an arm over his eyes to block the blowing sand, the scathing light, the fear of falling. Sage, he shouted. The tubes! Can't we take the tubes down? We aren't going into Port Egerton, Lamb's eyes. I must report to the martial arm. You report afterward. And the maybe old blutter of boys led him away from the drop tube terminals, away from the precipice stair, across an expanse of plateau. They fought the wind to a chimney of rocks beyond Scarlet Sky Depot, now a shimmering bubble within a bubble within a bubble at their backs, and plunged down the wide abrasive chimney into silence. On a ledge they halted, and Ethan Dedicus could see nothing but the dark red rock surrounding them. Above, maybe the sky. Below, faceted cliffs without bottom. In the wide stone chimney he trembled with a calmness as eerie as drug sleep. What do we... We wait, Ethan Dedicus. Why do we wait here, Sage? For transport. And because you aren't to see a friend face until the blooding's done. You aren't to think of earth or probe ship voyagings. We provide now, my people of the salt gardens. And the blooding? What must I do? Survive, of course. The hag sage chuckled. We play old games on Arachne. And the maybe old blutter of boys squatted on the ledge so that his brown vestments billowed around him and his burgundy hands hung over his knees like the bodies of skinned rabbits. He stopped talking, and darkness began climbing up the faceted cliffs below. Ethan leaned on the cold rocks, studied sage's spider crown, and waited and stiffened with his aloneness. On the other side of the plateau, down in the Red Basin, there were people just like him, not just wind-burned hag sages, not just the promise of cranky spider herds, arrogant in their gardens of salt and sandstone. Impatience burned in Ethan Dedicus like a secret fuse. Then from deep in the chimney of rock a golden spheroid rose toward them, a ring of luminous orange coursing about its circumference. The coursing ring emitted a hum more musical than a siren's song. The entire canyon glowed with the spheroid's ascent. Sage! The nucleoscape from Garden Home. Our transportation. Such a vehicle! I didn't think... The spied herds of Garden Home aren't barbarians, unblooded one. Humming, the nucleoscape hovered beside them. The brilliant orange ring swept upward and became a halo over the spheroid rather than a belt at its middle. A door appeared, and a ramp reached out to them like a silver tongue. The H. Sage, ignoring the chasm that fell away beneath the ramp, entered the nucleoscape. Reluctantly, Ethan Dedicus followed, 
his eyes fixed on the darkness inside the humming spheroid. Then he was inside, and the howling ruggedness of Arachne seemed light years away. Beside the maybe old blutter of boys, he found himself in a deep leather chair the color of Mediterranean grapes. The chair swiveled, but the curved walls of the nucleoscape bore nothing upon them but silken draperies. Directly overhead there was a stylized insignia depicting a spider as drawn from the top. When the nucleoscape's ramp retracted and its doors sealed shut, man and boy could not see out, alone, in a gargantuan atom. Soon they began to move. Unearthly music droned in their ears. Sage, this is a wonderful thing, this vehicle. Couldn't you have had it come to Scarlet Sky Depot? Did you have to make me climb down a hundred rocks to hitch a ride to Garden Home? The nucleoscape belongs to the Spiderherds, boy, not to your outlive folk in Port Egerton. A long-ago gift of galactic cum and the martial arm. You don't like climbing, eh? Ethan said, Will it take us to Garden Home? Close, close. We'll have to walk a few last kilometers down from the perimeter cliffs. The eight sage laughed. But only because I like to climb, to walk, to hike. And your feet, lamb's eyes, how will they fare? Ethan was silent. In only a few minutes, it seemed, the nucleoscape had stopped. It hovered, hummed insanely, and ran out its ramp for the maybe old man and the boy to disembark upon. They went out into the night and the chill onto a brutal ledge. The nucleoscape closed up behind them and dropped goldenly into the abyss, disappearing like a coin sinking through water. Overhead, the stars mocked. Come with me, Ethan Dedicus. Along the ledges, down the uneven sandstone steps, the eight sage and the boy struggled. At last they came upon a salt plain and left the escarpments behind. In the starlight, monstrously alone again, they walked across an empty whiteness. They walked all night. When dawn began reddening the yardongs that had at last begun to appear in the desert, grotesque, plastically shaped rocks suggesting the work of a demented sculptor, they finally sighted Garden Home. There, Sage said, punish your feet some more, darling Ethan. In the morning's attenuated light, Ethan Dedicus saw the salt towers surrounding the central butte of Garden Home. Garden Home, an assemblage of yellow synthoskin tents huddled in a cove beneath the encircling pillars of white, Forty or fifty such tents, all of them large. The encircling pillars, larger yet, pitted with arabesque holes by Arachne's winds. It was a dream city, but as cruel and as real as eroded rock. How can you live out here, Ethan asked. Nowhere else is so dear. For three hundred years there have been spied herds in Garden Home, supported at first by galactic cum, but living here now like even our own arachnids. And each year the martial arm sends us its string-clinging neostarbs to be blooded, such as you, lamb's eyes. Why was Galactic come a patron, Sage, in the beginning? Someone must care for the spiders, they said, must keep them away from the new depot. In their saliva is a terrible virus that can affect almost any kind of living cell, a virus to which the arachnids themselves are evolutionarily immune. We must study the stalking widows, they said. We must have people who will watch them and destroy their poisons. The first scientists who watched them invented the sem bodies you carry in your veins, Ethan Dedicus, to keep your blood lucid star when and star where. The spied herds of Garden Home are the children of the makers of the sem body, the children of the outlie folk who kill disease for always. They were close enough to see people among the yellow tents. Why must you stay here now, Ethan asked. Why must anyone remain in this angry desert of salt? To call the spiderlings home, boy, to sing them back to garden home when they have gone ballooning. Ethan remembered something vague. Isn't that but once a year? Aye, but we love our leggy beasts. They are as thought bright as you or any string clinging man bud in the martial arm. We stay because we belong to them because we talk the spied-herd stalking widow talk. You talk to them? 
and understand their talk? Talk to them, croon to them, pipe to our spiderlings the homing call of garden home. The stalking widows are a people too, unblooded Dedicus. Ethan said nothing. They strode into a crowd of burgundy people who moved among the plastic buildings. A few of these people hailed the eight sage wordlessly by dancing their fingers like spider legs. The sun was now full up. Its strange light glittered on people, tents, and stones alike. Ethan felt lost, alone in the long shadows that rippled from the fanciful salt pillars. Lovely, sensuous, weird. They were in front of a tent, a piece of plastic facing unzipped, and a woman darker than the red wines of Jerez stepped from behind the yellow flap into their paths. The boy saw that she was not a maybe old woman. She was antiquity given flesh. Her hair was stringy magenta. Her albino eyes stared out of the crimson-brown stain of a face rivuleted with time webs. She wore brown sacks. A witch for really real, the boy thought. And the witch twisted her head upward in order to see him from her stoop. Hello, N.T. Swain, she said to the eight sage. A voice like the high notes played on Music Man Belzer's eolectic flute. Is this the boy you bring us to put out for blooding? Ethan Dedicus he is, Integrity Swain said. And then the blutter of boys added, This is the widow's dread wife, Ethan. Embrace her well. The neophyte star-bearer embraced her. Surprisingly, she had no smell, even though her face flesh was against him close. Then she drew back. Albino eyes stooped to see him and crinkled in their mask. Come inside, unblooded one. Breakfast for you. Then to the top of Garden Home to see the stalking widows and their cheering. They entered the large tent and ate sand locust from earthen bowls. Ethan noticed a vacuum well in the center of the tent, a sparkling chrome mechanism that could tap water from deep within any planet's crust. Odd to see it in the hands of this semi-premi people, so backwardly backward. The widow's dreadwife fetched him a bowl of water, and her fluty voice echoed in the big synthoskin canopy. It never rains on Garden Home, nor on the sea bottoms beyond. We spied herds would die if Galactic Calm took back our well. True it is, Sage said. The stalking widows and the sand locusts have their own ways to water, but the vacuum well is ours. Blood our boys and keep our well, they say. And you eat only the sand locust? No, no, the dread wife said. Dull eatings, if so. Also eaten are murdered husbands of the spider people. Egg sacks, sea bottom murky moles, and our own dead when such dyings come. The dread wife laughed, a falsetto piping. I am soon to be eaten, I think. Unblooded Dedicus asked no more about the spied herd's diet. They went out into the hot, bright morning, dread wife, hag sage, and boy. Through the paths among the yellow tents they ambled to a natural stairway leading through salt glens to the roof of Garden Home. This wide, uneven roof overlooked the sea bottoms, which were hidden from the city and the cove by the enclosing pillars themselves. Before they reached the high place, they stopped beside several valleys in the rock where spied herds tended their charges and sang to the stalking widows out of dutiful throats. Look upon them with your lamb's eyes, boy, Sage pointed. Down there you'll see the people who go eight-legged and wraithly in their hearts. And so he looked down into a bleached, grassless glen, and saw a burgundy boy of his own age singing in the lovely patois of Garden Home to a horde of ghostly, still-standing mistresses, fifty or sixty stalking widows, tall white ladies whose bodies were almost transparent, moved jauntily about in the glen, and the spider boy moved among them. Ethan could not believe it. They were as tall as elephants. The burgundy boy stooped now and again to stroke the colorless hairs on his lady's bellies, sometimes even blowing voluptuously on the wind-sensitive trichobothria furring their legs. When he did this, his ladies reared up, waved their foremost limbs, and opened their jaws, but more from pleasurable excitation than from fear or anger. 
The boy's song, the boy's breath, worked on them almost sexually, but without the end result by which they divorced themselves forever from their spider husbands, the boy was not eaten. Can they hear his singing? Ethan asked. I didn't think some spiders could hear. On Arachne, the red wife said, they hear, they hear. The spectacle hypnotized Ethan Dedicus. The wind in his own hair prompted pointless stirrings in his loins. Then the burgundy boy in the glen saw the three of them looking down and waved his loose fingers at them in the characteristic greeting of the spide herds. Threnody hold, the red wife said, a masterful touch singer. They went on. They looked down into other valleys, saw other spied herds touch singing, watched the stilt-legged giantesses dance, and Ethan Dedicus felt the planet's heat in him like unrequited desire. They reached the roof of Garden Home and stood looking across the sea bottoms, stretching endlessly away to the horizon. And beyond, Ethan thought. The wind blew blastingly here, but not as hard as it had on the plateau outside Scarlet Sky Depot. They did not have to shout to make themselves heard. We drop you in the bottoms on the moray, the dread wife said. What? Ethan looked down at her sharp profile. That's where your blooding begins, as you know, Sage said. But we begin tomorrow. What do I do out there? Come back to us, sweetling, the widow's dread wife piped. Come back to us with blood on your hands, all bedighted in a grown-up's skin. Hello, baby Translu, Sage suddenly shouted. He hailed a girl of seven or eight who had just appeared at the top of the path on the other side of the butte, and who was walking across its wind-pitted surface toward them. The girl had a wide oriental face, stained a tentative mauve. She drove before her a group of spiderlings, so colorless they seemed to be made of glass. They were a third of the size of the prancing ladies they had seen in the salt glens, but still as tall as baby Translu herself. Mere babies, they moved on splinter-thin legs, as clumsy as newborn colts. Only the scopulae on the pads of their feet kept Arachne's winds from blowing them away. Ethan stepped back as the little girl and her spiderlings approached. He wanted to fall into the planet's sky and drown. Come here, Translu. Say hello to the summer's Neostarb, here to be blooded. Hello, Translu said. Her spiderlings, nine or ten in all, tottered about the four human beings and ruminantly waggled their mouth parts. Petapalpi, a combination of hands and soft teeth, these mouth parts. A strange melding. Baby Translu stared at Ethan. The dread wife asked her, Have you brought these cheering for the wind, small girl? These be firsties, Translu said. More on the Mari. Goose summer we have. They go fly. It's gossamer time, Sage translated. The spiderlings disperse. These that Translu has attempt the wind today, but tomorrow thousands will go ballooning. Many will die. Every year a thousand spiderkins fly, and one boy is blooded. Go on, the red wife said. Put them about it, Pert Smurl. Baby Translu did a gangly little dance and sang to her babies in the lilting patois that Ethan couldn't understand. She turned and pirouetted and danced along the butte to a place where several salt spires thrust up into the sky. The spiderlings followed, still legging in her wake and flashing glassily in the sun. Watch how it is, Sage told Ethan. The spiderlings, as if on the pert smurl's commands, climbed the pitted rocks and fought both wind and gravity with sticky feet. Ethan lifted his head to watch. Clinging precariously to the spires as they moved, the spiderlings turned in slow circles and ejected strands of silk which floated on the wind. Their underslung spinnerets paid out more and more glistening thread, more and more, and more and more. The sky was a pale crimson suspended in a crystalline net, a color captured in webs. There they go, Translu, Sage shouted. And the leggy babies still clinging to their skyey umbilicals, lifted from the rocks. Upward they were dragged, like parachutists, jumping backward for the door of an invisible aircraft. Ethan felt as if he were watching a film being run the wrong way. Up, up, 
up the spiderlings floated. But where are they going? Ethan asked. Out there are the sea bottoms, nothing else. Out there is all of Arachne, the maybe old man said. What happens to them? Some of them die. Some of them come back. None of the people of the stalking widows live anywhere but here at Garden Home. Then why should these little ones go out at all? Why disperse, if only to die or come back? Goose summer it is, lamb's eyes, the H. Sage said. They go out. And when baby Transloo's babies were lost in the webby welkin, the hag sage, the dread wife, and Ethan Dedicus descended the paths of the salt garden butte to the yellow tents in the cove. The winds died, the afternoon trekked by, and night came out like a dark maiden wearing candles. There was food and talk. Then Ethan laid himself down among the bodies of murmuring spied herds, closed his eyes, and slept his first sleep on Arachne. While he slept, the maybe old man touched his face and whispered, I love the boys I blood. Remember that, lamb's eyes. Ethan heard an orange humming. Groggy, he rolled over and woke up on the sea bottoms. He got to his feet. The sun was already up. He turned around in every direction. Whiteness, 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 whiteness. Sage! There was not even an echo. Only a dead word falling from his mouth and a hint of wind. The desert air smothered the word, and he wondered if he had shouted anything at all. The sun glowered. Sage! Again and again he turned around. It was impossible to be this alone. How could they have done this to him? With the nucleus gave only. He remembered its humming. Be sure, be sure. Kneeling, he looked at the floor of the sea bottom and saw no tracks, no footprints, no telltale striations on its hard white surface. He stood up. He turned around again. There were no landmarks anywhere. Where was his hag sage? Sage, you burgundy bastard! This was his blooding. Drug sleep they had hyped him with in Garden Home and put him out to cope. The widow's dread wife had told him how it would be. Sage had said, Survive. We play old games on Arachne. Ethan Dedicus was a neostarb of the martial arm, and neostarbs were blooded. So be it, he would play. He would think and grapple and run. Very well. What had they given him to play with? What survival pieces had he at hand? Ethan Dedicus looked at himself and enumerated. The silver-blue, seemingly seamless uniform in which he had come to Arachne. Light, indestructible, proof against weathers. A curved knife, heavy, elaborate of haft, hurtful. Two narrow cylinders of water fitted like cartridges into the belt on which he had found the knife. A maybe supply for two days. Nothing else but his wits. Sage, he shouted. Sage, how are you, blooder of boys, when you leave your charge to blood himself? Irony of name-making, cruelty of trust. Ethan Dedicus, doubting his neostarb soul, turned around and around on the salt sea bottom and cursed the probe ship fathers every one. In his head his blood beat loud, and Arachne ached around him like a whitened world wound. Knowing no directions, Ethan struck out toward the mid-morning sun. He walked and walked. The horizons remained ever distant, ever smooth, annoyingly undisturbed. He looked behind him to see his own footprints and saw none. He walked some more. In the midday heat he uncapped a cylinder and drank his first drink. One, two, three drops on the tongue. And walked toward the place where the sun no longer was. And took his second drink. Four, five, six drops, moistening a cobwebbed mouth then knelt in the middle of nowhere and shut his mind off. Click! His gut, rumbling, would not so obligingly click off. Thoughtless, he squatted. His eye saw a little hole on the sea bottom, a crumbly place in the whiteness. Ethan Dedicus told his mind to come on. Click! It did. Then he dug at the hole and pulled away salt shards and stabbed down with his knife. Scrabbling with his hands, he caught a stunned murky mole and pulled it free of its burrow, 
an ugly beastie with a hair-horn nose and spatulate feet. In the hot sun, Ethan slew it and ate it, sucking the sinewy flesh as if it were candy, crunching the mush-marrowed bones. He drank off his first cylinder of water. The skin and hair horn of the murky mold he thrust back into the caved-in hole contemptuously. Then shut down his mind, click, and walked on the feet of his own shadow, off-mindedly trying to step on the shadow's elusive gray head, a bobbing, shadow-boxing shadow's head. His mind would not stay off. What he saw was too strange to look at out of dreamily dead eyes. He halted and gawked at the horizon, the horizon before him. Pale light pinked its curving edge, but higher up the sky was streaming with movement. It was raining there. No, Ethan said aloud. It doesn't rain on the sea bottoms. But what he saw resembled rain, even though the only clouds in sight were three or four miles up and as feathery as goose down. Didn't the distant sky glitter with columns of downpouring moisture? Didn't the density and height of those columns verify a desert squall, an advancing shower? It's not supposed to rain out here. He shook his fist at the translucent columns for trying to deceive him. He wanted a rain, but dared not hope. Looking at the lofty cirrus, he thought, as feathery as goose down. Analogy into equation. Goose down. Goose summer. Gossamer. And suddenly he knew that he was looking at neither a mirage nor an on-sweeping squall. Spiderlings coming to see me, he shouted. Transloos ballooning babies and all their thousand cousins. The wind in his mouth, he sprinted toward the arachnid aviators on their glistening silken tethers. A shower of blowing cobwebs. If they were coming toward him, then garden home must lie beyond their filamentous squall line. All he need do was walk in that direction, and he would survive his blooding. His time in the wilderness would be successfully won through. Thinking that, Ethan Dedicus let out a joyous yelp. He was sixteen. But not stupid. He halted again and reconsidered. He had only one remaining cylinder of water. What were his chances of stumbling on the burrow of another murky mole? The spied herds of Garden Home had said farewell to their tottering glass babies early that morning, had watched them fly off, most likely, right after sunrise. How far might the spiderlings have ballooned in twelve hours' time? Maybe, Ethan decided, as much as two hundred kilometers. Conservative estimate. Sage, you burgundy bastard, he hissed. Galactic cum, child murderers and sadists. Venerable starbs of the arm, go to vile sty. He hoped these maledictions covered everyone. He would not be able to walk two hundred kilometers or more before his water ran out, and he fell over from the heat. Dornail Dedicus. Standing there with the sun at his back, and before him curtains of proted thread catching the sun's last light, he peeled a strip of dead flesh from his nose, crisp it between his fingers, and thought. Galactic cum, the martial arm, and integrity swain were indeed child murderers. They murdered the child so that a man might move in and reanimate the vacated corpse. Absolutely. There had to be a way out of the sea bottoms. The martial arm did have probe ship officers, after all, and every one of them had been blooded. About a kilometer away, Ethan caught sight of a single drifting spiderling. Sunlight ricocheted off its body and twinkled from the five or six incredibly lengthy threads streaming from its spinnerets. Cephalothorax down, the spider floated toward him. In less than five minutes, as best as Ethan could judge, it would sweep right by him. Then the others, the hundreds of others who were still together, would come ballooning past, too. You're my way out, Ethan said. I'll board you. But the first balloonist drifted by overhead, out of reach. Ethan Dedicus waited. In another ten minutes, six more of the advance guard had floated by, all of them either too high or too far to his left or right to permit a hijacking. He left off waiting and once again sprinted forward. On Arachne, the afternoon was deepening inexorably into twilight. The air seemed to be laden with melancholy music played upon countless strings. Ethan, still running, was surrounded by showers of gauze. 
At last he caught the forelegs of one of the airborne spiderlings and attempted to hoist himself over its outraged eyes into the saddle between its abdomen and cephalothorax. For a moment his feet were off the ground, peddling air. Then several of the spider's leg joints broke off in his hands, and he crashed back down on the sea bottom, still holding severed leg pieces. He got up and cast them aside. Rocking back and forth, the maimed spiderling floated on. Half panicked, Ethan turned in rapid circles in the eye of the silk storm. His hands felt sticky. He stopped turning and looked at them. A viscous goo, the colorless blood of the spider people, adhered to his palms. As he watched, this goo began taking on a faint pinkish cast. In another moment, it had turned the brilliant burgundy that was the hallmark of the garden home spide herds. Contact with air, a chemical reaction. Ethan realized suddenly that he had been blooded, symbolically blooded. Now all he had to do was survive the very real ordeal of getting back to garden home, the part of the blooding that counted. He wiped his hands on his uniform. I'll board one of you, he shouted. I'll outlive all of you. He was sixteen. But he was crying. He wept for himself and the spider whose legs he had pulled away. Sage had as much as told Ethan that the stalking widows were intelligent creatures, sentient in the manner of man, or in a manner totally their own at least, and he, Ethan Dedicus, had cruelly hurt one of their people. It was not to weep about. He had to try again. Most of the ballooning arachnids were too high to reach, much too high to reach, and the sun had already set. Soon they would be flown into starlit darkness. He pulled his belt tight and ran forward, his eyes half-misted shut, and the immense desertscape glinting with buoyant silk. Ethan leaped. He caught a spiderling about its thin middle and desperately hung on. For a moment he feared that the strand supporting it would crumble beneath his additional weight and come cascading down around both of them. He lifted his knees beneath him. The floating spider dipped, then dipped again. Ethan's toes dragged the hard sea bottom, slowing their progress. He lifted his knees again and curled his toes away from the earth. Come on, he thought, come on. They were up, the spiderling and he, up in the pearly evening sky among hundreds of other airborne travelers, an assault force with no one to make war against. Ethan shut his eyes completely and stretched his legs out. They hung free now, just as he hung free and the wind washed around his dangling body as if he had been submerged in a beautiful, giddy-making tonic. Finally, Ethan opened his eyes and found himself in a jungle of writhing legs. His head was pressed against the spider's belly. He pulled himself up, squeezing his way between two of the creature's hind legs to its chitinous back. He straddled the spiderling, facing rearward, and grasped two of the threads that emerged from its spinnerets. He leaned forward and hung on. After a while, his unwilling mouth ceased to struggle. Over one shoulder, Ethan could see the white sea bottoms receding beneath him. The planet's horizons broadened and broadened and broadened even more. But only the sea bottoms filled this broadening expanse. Where were they flying off to? Ethan locked his legs together, tested his grip on the silken cords, and was soon rocked to sleep. Deep adolescent sleep. Womb warm slumber. He dreamed that he was piloting the dawn right through the surreal glooms of id space, lost in a comforting nightmare of power. He woke once, remembering where he was almost immediately. Since it was too dark to see the ground, he closed his dreaming eyes again. The air seemed refreshingly cool, not at all cold. He let the wind sail him back to sleep. When Ethan Dedicus next woke up, he did so because his spiderling was twisting about in a determined way, as if hoping to dislodge him. He hung on with locked legs and aching hands. It was light, sort of. He could see neither ground nor sky. The two of them were drifting in a luminous fog, insulated from the outside world. Tatters of insubstantial silver gray floated past Ethan's face, but the spider's persistent twisting kept him from enjoying the scenery. A cloud bank they were in. A fog of turbulent, wispy batting. Where were the other balloonists? Stop it, Ethan shouted. Damn you, you... He promptly christened the spiderling Bucephalus. Damn you, Bucephalus. His voice was muffled by the fog, smothered in moistness. 
Bucephalus continued to writhe and sway. The boy wondered how far he would fall if the creature did dislodge him. Several times he felt himself slipping, but gathered his strength and clung like a cat on a bedspread. Shortly he was hanging head down, while Bucephalus faced skyward and used its forelegs to hoist itself up the silken threads creasing its belly and disappearing into the moving clouds high above. "'What are you doing?' Ethan shouted. "'You can't climb up your own balloon wires, you leggy spidekin!' Then the beast ceased climbing. It left off torquing about. Their frail airship achieved a kind of rocky equilibrium. Looking over his shoulder, upward, Ethan saw Bucephalus joggle several drops of condensed moisture down the flowing silk into its pedipalpi. A drink in flight. Better than Ethan himself could manage. They floated on for a time, through the silver-gray fog, and then the spider abruptly released its grip on its balloon wires and dropped until, joltingly, caught up at its own spinnerets. Ethan screamed but held on. When the beast at last stopped bucking, the boy was head up again. You damn near did me that time, Busey. You damn near did. They rose through the mist, at last breaking through into painful sunshine. Beneath them, their cloud bank undulated like a wide living fleece. Above them, the sky, was the thin arachnean scarlet that Ethan had almost forgotten. At unhailable distances, Ethan saw several other ballooning spiders. He counted nearly forty, whereas before there had been hundreds. The dispersal, he supposed, was progressing as a dispersal ought. But to no point, Ethan said aloud, you either die or return to garden home. I hope you're a returnee, Bucephalus. I don't like cloud walking. It's not first on my list of career priorities. Through a break in the cloud bank, the boy saw that they were over water, water of multicolored blue. The waves sparkled, but it was impossible to judge how high he and his spiderling were. When the clouds at last thinned to mere ghostly wisps, nothing but ocean lay beneath them. For two or three hours they sailed casually over water. Twice Ethan Dedicus looked on in amazement as companion balloonists reeled in a bit of thread and slowly tailspun into the sea, suiciding. After collapsing upon them, the down flyers' webs bobbed in random patterns on the bright surface. It was not until these odd self-drownings that Ethan realized his own spiderling might have some control over where they were going. "'Say, Busey Bell, are you my pilot?' Ethan looked up at the wind-weaving threads, bearing them aloft, and tried to discover where the threads ended. He could not. The sun made him squint. Was Bucephalus manufacturing more protid secretion and silently paying it out? Was it reeling some in, his pilot? Had this been going on all along? I wish I knew your talk, Busey. What kind of blutter of boys fails to teach his neo-starb the Spidican lingo? Sage, he thought. Sage, you treacherous spiderd. Far away he saw red cliffs rimming the sea. Their airship drifted in that direction. Eighteen or twenty balloonists still accompanied them, that Ethan could actually see and count. The remainder were gone now, having either plunged into the water or shrunk to invisibility with distance. Ethan was hungry. Maybe Bucephalus could survive on a drop or two of water every morning, but Ethan wanted food. The taste of yesterday's mercumol was still acrid in his mouth. Nevertheless, his stomach made noises as if he had not eaten for a week. But for the moment the boy satisfied himself with a careful sip from the cylinder that Sage and the dreadwife had provided him. He looked down and saw earth instead of water, intricate topography instead of the sea's smoothness, infertile and brownish red, all of it, fit country only for predatory arachnids. Why had Galactic come, come here? Was it solely to blood-probe ship captains for the martial arm? No, not solely. Once, many, many years ago, scientists had ogled through microscopes the virulent, shape-changing virus in the saliva of the stalking widows. They had done so in order to devise a plastic, semi-living sembody, an adaptable counter to almost any antigen that might enter the bloodstream. Ethan carried these artificial counters in his own blood while the spied herds of Garden Home had long since developed natural immunity to the arachnid virus. How about that, Busey? You got a mouthful of hungry germs? 
Later, Arachne had become an administrative and commercial center, a seedy port. A number of those who came to Arachne were Tura tramps, rugged crazies who sometimes ventured out to Garden Home or even into the Dead Sea bottoms. Not much to see in them, though, Ethan Dedicus told his pilot, except the silk storms, and they happen only once a year, right? Eucephalus, the spiderling, kept its own counsel. They passed over cliff after cliff of creviced sandstone. The entire planet now seemed to be made of lusterless copper. First white desert, then ocean, now sandstone. Shortly it was night again. As myriad stars commenced to burn, the earth blanked out. Weakened by a night and day aloft, Ethan Dedicus hung on to Bucephalus lethargically. Now another night lay ahead. He uncapped his second cylinder and emptied it in a single breathless gulp. Then the cylinder fell from his fingers and tumbled into darkness. He had eaten nothing all day. His stomach lurched painfully with each new gust of wind. His lips were chapped, his cheeks and forehead blast-burned. And if he went to sleep again, how could he be sure that Busey would not suicide during the night, plummeting them both to destruction? He could not. That was the answer. He could not. Knowing the answer too well, he slumped across the spiderling's upturned rear, gripped the threads emerging from its spinnerets, and went to sleep. When he awoke, only ten other arachnid aviators remained in sight, all a good ways in front of them, and conspicuously higher. In the dawn glow over the land, Ethan saw a vista depressingly similar to yesterday's endless sandstone. Except that now there were canyons in the rock, monstrous canyons, labyrinthine, and cruel. The canyons were new. Ethan remembered climbing with the H. Sage from Scarlet Sky Depot into a crevice like the mighty ones below. He remembered the nucleoscape. Might not these canyons be tributaries to the one he and Sage had traveled in? Did Port Egerton lie near? Did Garden Home lie near? Probably not, Ethan thought. We have crossed an ocean. His speculation ceased when Bucephalus began writhing its legs and threatening to topple him into skyey space. Time for a morning drink. Midnight moisture on the balloon wires. Symbolically blooded Dedicus prepared for the spider's topsy-turvy toast to dawn. Inebriate of dew, he silently cursed, drunken horson. And he was suddenly upside down, admiring red rock. Then moments later he was traumatically upright again, wind whirling blue in his mouth, sun stitching his eyes into a squint. That day was a dull one. Several times he thought about trying to control the direction of their travel himself, either by cutting a silk strand free or attempting to pull more thread from one or two of the spinnerets. But he was afraid to experiment. And if he could control their climb and descent, where would he take them? Enigmatic Arachne gave few topographical clues, all of them dreary, dull. Dull. As this marvelous floating was finally dull. Ethan's hunger grew. His weakness, he realized, would soon be an obstacle to his survival. Faint, fatigued, feverish, he would be bucked into free-falling anonymous death by Bronchobucephalus's next dipsomaniacal quest for water. And he would die. It was as simple as that. He... Ethan Dedicus, new star of the elitist martial arm, would die. His body burst upon abrasive rock or abusive sea, his grave a canyon or a watery grotto, just another abortive blooding. Die. And so as the afternoon wore on, Ethan made up his mind to kill the spiderling. He didn't want to. He had to. To be successfully blooded, one had to survive. That meant that Bucephalus would have to die. I'm sorry, Ethan Dedicus said, meaning it. I'm sorry to have to do this. He removed the knife from his belt, locked his legs farther down the creature's cephalothorax than usual, and reached his arms around the abdomen in order to find the soft membrane where its legs joined its body. Only here could his knife penetrate the horny skeleton. Eucephalus, exasperated, languorously waved its legs, but Ethan found the spot anyway, and stabbed and jerked the blade sideways, and stabbed again. The spiderling spasmed, its body hiccuped violently, lame, its legs thrashed. Overhead, silken streamers buckled in the wind, buckled and fluttered. But forearmed and resolute, the boy survived these gimpy aerial throws. 
he hung on for drear death, the spiderlings, not his own. Its spasming done, they floated on almost as before. When Ethan next looked at his hands, they were covered with clear, viscous fluid. He watched as the discharge turned bright burgundy. This new stain overlapped the old, from his palms and knuckles all the way up his wrists. He felt a murderer, a Jacobean villain, a deranged hero. Oh, blood, 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 he thought, and put the thought out of his mind. Click, so that he could ensure his own survival. Pilotless now, he had to hurry. An hour or so ought to suffice, time in which to eat and plan a second hijacking. If he remained too long aboard Bucephalus's dead husk, the winds might eventually send him flailing into nowhere. Only living spiders made it back to Garden Home. He needed a pilot. Ethan Dedicus, hanging on with one hand, used his knife to crack open the chitinous back of the spiderling. Imagine it's lobster, he told himself. Same phylum, after all. Arthropoda. This knowledge proved uncheering. Deliberately, Ethan ate of the clear tubular heart, squeezing it section by section through the hole he had punched in Bucephalus's back. He ate until he could eat no more. The taste was vile. His uniform was blotched with wine-colored stains on his chest and on his thighs where he had wiped his hands. Again and again he willed himself not to vomit. When he could force no more down, he pulled out still more of the heart and cut loose a large section to hang from his belt. For tomorrow, he told himself, imagine it's lobster. By this time, the spiderling's translucent body, open to the air, was shot through with marblings of deepest ruby. To lighten the load that the balloon threads had to bear, Ethan methodically cut away each one of the corpse's legs. He dragged out reddening entrails and heaved them into the wind. They dwindled slimily in the late afternoon sunlight, spiraling downward in dreamy slow motion. And, as he had hoped, his pilotless airship began to rise. Four balloonists floated above him now, no more. He had not seen any of the other six spiders plunge into the knife-edged canyons that day. They had simply sailed off. These four remaining ones were his last hope. He had to board one of them before the twilight deepened into night, before night scattered his last hope beyond the prospect of capture. He had to maneuver his fragile craft by body shifts and tuggings of line, expertly as if he had flown on streaming silk his entire life. Clumsily, Ethan Dedicus managed. Seldom looking down, he leaned and yanked his way alongside the slowest of the four spiderlings, the slowest and the heaviest. Even so, it bobbed several meters out of reach to his left and above him. A chasm of air intervened, a frightening chasm of air. Ethan hacked away portions of Eucephalus's body until he had almost nothing to cling to. Using the toe of one foot against the heel of the other, he pulled his boots free and kicked them into the dropping sun, where they seemed to catch fire and disintegrate. Very little time remained. It was like his last evening on the sea bottoms all over again, but more urgent, more insanely desperate. Ethan leaned and yanked on the tethers, shifted his weight, and muttered incoherently into the wind. He looked up and saw that Bucephalus's threads were weaving themselves among those of the spider that he hoped to board. Indifferently, the beast watched him approach. He could almost touch its dangling forelegs, almost look into its mouth. But he wasn't rising anymore. An unbridgeable gap existed, a chasm. Not knowing what else to do, Ethan unfastened the belt the spide herds had given him and let it drop. Food supply and all, Bucephalus's tubular heart. Like a buccaneer, he held his knife between clenched teeth. Come on, he thought. Come on. Maybe coincidentally, maybe because of his action, his craft bobbed higher, then higher again, and instantly Ethan Dedicus jumped. He was conscious of his knife slicing his mouth, spinning silverly away. He was conscious of rocking impact and blurred out-of-kilter horizons. Then he felt his newly filled stomach plummeting canyonward and his body irresistibly following. A tailspin, silk tearing on the sky. This is it, Ethan said to himself. This is it. At which point he was yanked up by the gossamer canopy, pouting from the spiderling's tail, and the world snapped back into place with a pop. Miraculously, he was still astride, his hijacked arachnid. But now he could see their elongated twilight shadow on a wall of rock below. 
how far they had fallen. His entire body trembled, his blotched, clinging hands most of all. Far, far above them, the mutilated corpse of Eucephalus rode the gusts ever upward. Ethan felt empty, alone. I'm not going to name you, he told his new pilot. I promise you that. I won't give you a name. By the time it was completely dark, his heart had stopped its riotous beating, and they had gained a bit of altitude again. Both relieved and exhausted, Ethan pressed his body against his hosts, tightened his grip on the silks, and for the third time in as many nights, went to sleep as if in a treetop cradle. He slept a big drug sleep. He bobbed on the lullaby winds and dreamed of solid ground grown over with lovely grass. In the middle of the cool night, he opened his eyes and thought he heard the distant sloshing of waves. He did not look down. Soon he was asleep again, dreaming of clip-on epaulets and probe-ship glory. A venerable starber was he in his sleep rhythms. The following morning, he survived the spiderling's flip over for water and head down got a good view of the sea. The same sea as before, or a new one? Multicolored and sparkly, it looked just like the other, but there was no way for Ethan to be sure. White froth and indigo, cream combers and lilac, but not a sea coast or sailing vessel in sight. Not even in the air was there a sailing vessel. Right side up again, he quickly determined that they were alone. The last three balloonists had skied away during the night, or maybe crumpled down in the dark to drown. Not again would he be able to switch courses in mid-scream, a thought not hateful, so breath-stopping had his jump been. Nor could he kill off his current mount for food, but for desperation, but for sheer desperation. You're my ticket, trick, and trump, the boy whispered. You're it, beastie. Then Ethan himself shook water down the silks and drank. He was not desperate, not yet. And all that day they floated where the wind and the spiderling willed, over bright ocean, until the late afternoon brought land into view once more, a whiteness punctuated with bizarre yardongs, then the red rocks again, a maybe new continent, he couldn't tell for certain. Then, at eventide, he suddenly saw Port Egerton, and the saffron bubble within a bubble within a bubble of Scarlet Sky Depot, high on a cliff above the nestling city. We've circled around, Ethan shouted. You've brought us back. He thought about trying to wrench the airship to Earth, about crash landing on the plateau by the depot. Maybe these bubbles and domes signaled his last chance to look upon the work of man. It would be dark soon, his fourth night aloft. But the widow's dread wife had said, Come back to us, sweetling. Come back to us with blood on your hands. He had to trust in his Spidekin pilot. He had to go cruising craftily back to garden home. Otherwise, the blooding would be blotted an all-for-naught mistake. What, what should he do? With poignant regret, Ethan Dedicus watched Port Egerton slip away beneath them, an opportunity lost, after which, remorseless, night fell. But this night Ethan could not sleep. He made no attempt to sleep. To sleep would be madness. This night he felt sure they would balloon their way to the salt escarpments above the spied herd's cove of yellow tents. His journey would be over his blood incomplete. The petty demands of the body, hunger, thirst, weariness, could not eclipse the importance of such a fulfillment. Adrenaline flowed in the boy, a tiny gland wind raging where Arachne's winds could never roar. The passing hours, the turning stars, mocked his excitement. He and the spiderling drifted in darkness. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. Had the winds changed again? Would morning again find them over water? Weave a spell for us, hag sage, burnish your spider crown, sage, and lift lovely garden home out of the desert. Put it anywhere you like, but put it close. Put it goddamn close. To no avail, this plea. They dipped and rose and stuttered in nearly utter blackness, only the stars gleaming. Ethan began to despair. He thought of another day aloft, of his wind-scorched lips and his knotty sinews and the idea of dying at sixteen. Why not simply slide backward off the arachnid's stupid snout and let whatever lay beneath snuff out his life? In that thought was some sweetness, a temptation like young girls' bodies. It seduced him, almost. 
A thin singing saved him, a fluty piping in the wind. Through the tall darkness, Ethan Dedicus heard this music, and the child of the stalking widows heard it too. Instantly, they dropped several meters. Ethan's stomach told him that they had dropped. He gripped the silks and pulled himself up a little, so that in a moment he saw far in front of him two tiny flames, like matches burning, and the slowly emerging silhouette of a jagged landform. It was the roof of Garden Home. Or was it a dream? A cruel deception? No, no, Ethan said. It's the Spiderhead's fortress, the stalking widow's roost. Home in on that singing, widow's babe. Home in on it, I tell you. They homed. The silver singing, as unearthly as everything else he had encountered on Arachne, led them in. As they approached the great butte of the stalking widows, he could see that the match flames were torches. The dark milling forms of many people crowded the opening between two salt spires, an opening toward which his pilot was apparently navigating. And around them, around them in the dark, he somehow knew that there were other balloonists sailing in, a very few at a time, homing in on the eerie song that they had all heard from afar, picking it up long before he himself had heard it. The survivors of Goose Summer Madness, riding their gossamer tides back home. And he, Ethan Dedicus, among them, decorously blooded. They swept toward the gap in the rock. Torchlight illuminated the strange upturned faces of a hundred burgundy spied herds. He heard cheering, cheering that overrode the ghostly song of the widow's dread wife, for it was she who had sung them in. As they gusted in, he thought he saw her albino eyes flashing out of a fire-tattered face. She was apart from the others, standing on a high ledge, singing. The spiderling and boy swept through the gap. Hands caught at him, friendly hands, the hands of spiderherds. The cheering swelled until he thought it would rupture the very darkness and spill daylight over all Arachne. Hands clutched at him. Hands held him upright. The press of celebrating bodies bore him staggering, grinning, away from his glassy beast, along a narrow path. Faces among the hands, baby translues, and threnody holes. Torches bobbingly accompanied them. Solid ground, Ethan thought. I'm on solid ground. And then their procession of faces and hands abruptly halted. And numbly, turning up his eyes, Ethan saw a burgundy dark, maybe old man on the path in front of him. A hag sage, wearing loose brown sacks and a glinty blue spider crown. The eight sage, flickering brightly there. Oh, what a man you are now, sage said. You're stained and smeared and shredded, just like a spied herd. Just like a spied herd, lovely one. For a moment, Ethan Dedicus stared uncomprehendingly, then grinned, then felt a cold, violent ache in his heart, then crumpled in the hands of the gentle rowdies who had led him to his blutter. Just like a spied herd, Ethan looked, just like a spied herd. Now the martial arm would let him drop probe ships into id space. Why did his gut hurt so? His heart, too. Lurching forward on his knees against the many friendly hands, he heaved up undigested bits of something saddening. Spittle dripped from his lips and chin. Then he heaved up air, only air. Then he threw back his sweaty face and looked at the imperceptibly lightning sky where winked a thousand scornful stars. Just before he passed out, Ethan whispered the word, Bucephalus. No one heard him. No one knew his hurt. Michael Bishop writes, What to say about blooded on Arachne? Not a great deal, really. I set myself the goal, before beginning, of writing a sort of technicolor entertainment with no slowdowns and a suitably imageful and cadent style. The title, a deliberately garish one, redolent, I hope, of one of SF's golden ages in the old pulps, pre-existed the story and provided me with its impetus. Then I studied up on spiders a little bit and began. During the writing, when I reached an impasse of some kind, I simply resolved to hurdle it, and either introduced a new character or took steps to advance the purely physical action. The story, as it now stands, is no sort of landmark at all, either in the field or, more modestly, in my own development as a writer. But I think it succeeds in precisely those areas I wanted it to succeed in. 
The word from here, then, is simply this. Enjoy. Leviticus in the Ark by Barry N. Maltzberg Conditions are difficult and services are delayed. Conditions have been difficult for some time. Services have been delayed more often than being prompt, but never has it weighed upon Leviticus as it does now. Part of this has to do with his own situation. Cramped in the Ark, Torres jammed into his left ear and right kneecap, heavy Talmudic bindings wedged uncomfortably under his buttocks. He is past the moments of quiet meditation that for so long have sustained him. Now he is in great pain. His body is shrieking for release. He has a vivid image of himself bursting from the ark, the doors sliding open, his arms outstretched, his beard flapping in the strange breezes of the synagogue as he cries denunciation. I can no longer bear this position. There must be some Yiddish equivalent for this. Very well, he will cry it in Yiddish. No, he will do nothing of the sort. He will remain within the ark, six by four, jammed amidst the holy writings. At times, he is sure that he has spent several weeks within. At others, all sense of time eludes him. Perhaps it has been only a matter of hours. Well, make it a few days since he has been in here. It does not matter. A minute is as a century in the eye of God, he remembers. Or did it go the other way? And vague murmurs that he can hear through the not fully soundproofed walls of his chamber inform him that the service is about to begin. In due course, just before the adoration begins, they will fling open the doors of the ark, and he will be able to gaze upon them for a few moments, breathe the somewhat less dense air of the synagogue, endure past many moments of this sort because of his sudden, shuddering renewal of contact with the congregation. But, ah, oh God, it is difficult. Too much has been demanded of him. He is suffering deeply. Leviticus turns within the limited confines of his position, tries to find a more comfortable point of accommodation. Soon the service will begin. After the ritual chants and prayers, after the sermon and the hymn, will come the adoration. At the adoration, the opening of the ark. He will stretch. He will stand. He will stretch out a hand and greet them. He will cast light upon their eyes and upon the mountains, that they shall remember and do all his commandments and be holy unto him. He wonders if his situation has made him megalomaniac. Two weeks before, just at the point when Leviticus' point of commitment to the ark loomed before him, he had appeared in the rabbi's cubicle and made a plea for dispensation. I am a sick man, he had said. I do not think that I will be able to stand the confinement. Also, and I must be quite honest with you, Rabbi, I doubt my religious faith and commitment. I am not sure that I can function as that embodiment of ritual which placement in the ark symbolizes. This was not quite true. At least, the issue of religious faith had not occurred to Leviticus in either way. He was not committed to the religion, not quite against it either. It did not matter enough. But he had gathered from particularly reliable reports going through the congregation that one of the best ways of getting out of the ark was to plead a lack of faith. Perhaps he had gotten it wrong. The rabbi looked at him for a long time, and finally drawing his robes tightly around him, retreating to the wall, looked at Leviticus as if he were a repulsed object. Then perhaps your stay in the ark will do you some good, he had said. It will enable you to find time for meditation and prayer. Also, religious belief has nothing to do with the role of the tenant. Does the wine in the goblet conceive of the nature of the sacrament it represents? In the same way, the tenant is merely the symbol. I haven't been feeling well, Leviticus mumbled. I've been having chest pains. I've been having seizures of doubt, cramps in the lower back. I don't think that I can... Yes, you can, the rabbi said with a dreadful expression. And yes, you will. And had sent Leviticus out into the cold and casting light of the settlement, beginning to come to terms with the realization that he could not, could not under any circumstances, escape the obligation thrust upon him. Perhaps he had been foolish to have thought that he could. Perhaps he should not have paid credence to the rumors. He returned to his cubicle in a foul temper, set the traps to privacy, and sullenly put through the tape of the Union Prayer Book Revised Edition for the High Holy Days. 
If you really were going to have to do something like this, he guessed that a little bit of hard background wouldn't hurt. But it made no sense. The writings simply made no sense. He shut off the tapes and for a long time gave no further thought to any of this until the morning when, in absolute disbelief, he found the elders in his unit, implacable in their costume, come to take him to the Ark. Tallis and Tephilim. In the Ark, Leviticus ponders his condition while the services go on outside. He has taken to self-pity during his confinement. He has a tendency to snivel a little. It is really not fair for him, a disbelieving man, but one who has never made his disbelief a point of contention, to be thrown into such a position, kept there for such an extended period of time. Ritual is important, and he for one is not to say that the enactment of certain rote practices does not lend reassurance, may indeed be a metaphor for some kind of reality which he cannot apprehend. But is it right that all of this should be at his expense? He has never entered into disputation with the elders on their standards of belief. Why should they force theirs upon him? A huge volume of the Talmud jabs his buttocks, its cover a painful little concentrated point of pain, and, cursing, Leviticus bolts from it, rams his head against the beam forming half of the ceiling of the ark, bends, reaches, seizes the volume, and with all his force hurls it three feet into the flat wall opposite. He has hope for a really satisfying concussion. Some mark of his contempt that will be heard outside of the ark will impress and disconcert the congregation. But there simply has not been enough room to generate impact. The volume falls softly, turgidly across a knee, and he slaps at it in fury, little puffs of dust coming from the cover inflaming his sinuses. He curses again, wondering if this apostasy committed within the very place in which, according to what he understands, the Spirit of God dwells, will be sufficient to end his period of torture, release him from this one kind of bondage into at least another, but nothing whatsoever happens. He could have expected that, he thinks. If the tenant of the ark is indeed symbol rather than substance, then it would not matter what he did here or what he thought. Only his presence would matter. And fling volumes of the Talmud, scrape at the Torahs, snivel away as he will, he is nevertheless in residence. Nothing that he can do will make any difference at all. His presence here is the only testament that they will need. Step by tormenting step, Leviticus has been down this path of reasoning after apostasy a hundred times during his confinement. Fortunately for him, these are emotional outbursts which he forgets almost upon completion, so that he has no memory of them when he starts upon the next. And this sense of discovery, the renewal of his rage, so to speak, every time afresh, has thus sustained him in the absence of more real benefits, and will sustain him yet. Also, during the long night hours when only he is in the temple, he is able to have long imagined dialogues with God, which to no little degree also sustain him, even if his visualization of God is a narrow and parochial one. The first time that the doors had been flung open during the adoration and all of the congregation had looked in upon him, Leviticus had become filled with shame, but that quickly passed when he realized that no one really thought anything of it, and that the attention of the elders and the congregation was not upon him, but upon the sacred scripts that one by one the elders withdrew, brought to the podium, and read with wavering voice and fingers, while Leviticus, hunched over naked in an uncomfortable fetal position, could not have been there at all, for all the difference it made. He could have bolted from the ark, flung open his arms, shrieked to the congregation, Look at me, look at me, don't you see what you're doing? But he had not. He had been held back in part by fear, another part by constraint, still a third part from the realization that no one in the ark had ever done it. He had never seen it happen. Back through all the generations that he was able to seek through accrued knowledge, the gesture was without precedent. The tenant of the ark had huddled quietly throughout the term of his confinement, and kept himself in perfect restraint when exposed. Why should this not continue? Tradition and the awesome power of the elders had held him in check. He could not interrupt the flow of the services. He could deal with the predictable, which was a term of confinement and then release, just like every one who had preceded him. But what he could not control was any conception of the unknown. If he made a spectacle of himself during the adoration, there was no saying what might happen then. The elders might take vengeance upon him. 
they might turn away from the thought of vengeance and simply declare that his confinement be extended for an indefinite period for apostasy. It was very hard to tell exactly what they would do. This fear of the unknown, Leviticus had decided through his nights of pondering and imaginary dialogue, was probably what had enabled the situation to go on as long as it had. It was hard to say exactly when he had reached the decision that he could no longer accept his position, his condition, his fate, wait out the time of his confinement, entertain the mercy of the elders, and return to the congregation. It was hard to tell at exactly what point he had realized that he could not do this. There was no clear point of epiphany, no moment at which, unlike a religious conversion, he could see himself as having gone outside the diagram of possibility, unutterably changed. All that he knew was that the decision had slowly crept into him, perhaps when he was sleeping, and without a clear point of definition, had reached absolute firmness. He would confront them at the adoration now. He would force them to look at him. He would show them what he and, by implication, they had become. So trapped within a misunderstood tradition, so wedged within the suffocating confines of the ark, that they had lost any overriding sense of purpose the ability to perceive wholly the madness that they and the elders had perpetuated. He would force them to understand this as the sum point of their lives, and when it was over, he would bolt from the synagogue naked, screaming, back to his cubicle, where he would reassemble his clothing and make final escape from the complex, and leave them, not him, to decide what they would now make of the shattered ruins of their lives. The long period of confinement, self-examination, withdrawal, and physical privation had, perhaps, made Leviticus somewhat unstable. Just before the time when the elders had appeared and taken him away, Leviticus had made his last appeal, not to them, certainly not to the rabbi, but to Stala, who had shared to a certain point his anguish and fear of entrapment. "'I don't see why I have to go there,' he said to her, lying tight in the instant after fornication." It's stupid. It's sheer mysticism. And besides that, it hasn't any relevance. But you must go, she said, putting a hand on his cheek. You have been asked, and you must. She was not stupid, he thought, merely someone who had never had to question assumptions, as he was now being forced to. It is ordained. It won't be that bad. You're supposed to learn a lot. You go. She gave a little gasping intake of breath and rolled from him. You know that's impossible, she said. Women can't go. In the Reformed tradition they can. But we're not in the Reformed tradition, she said. This is the high orthodox. I tend to think of it more on the line of being progressive. You know, Leviticus, she said, sitting, breathing unevenly. He could see her breasts hanging from her in the darkness like little scrolls, like little scrolls. Oh, his confinement was very much on his mind, he could see. It's just ridiculous that you should say something like that to me, that you should even suggest it. We're talking about our tradition now, and our tradition is very clear on this point, and it's impossible for a woman to go. Even if she wanted, she just couldn't. All right, he said. All right. No, Stala said. No, I won't stop discussing this. You were the one to raise it, Leviticus, not me, and I just won't have any of it. I didn't think you were that kind of person. I thought that you accepted the traditions, that you believed in them. In fact, it was an encouragement to me to think, to really think, that I had found someone who believed in a pure, solid, unshaken way, and I was really proud of you, even prouder when I found out that you had been selected. But now you've changed everything. I'm beginning to be afraid that the only reason you believed in the traditions was because they weren't causing you any trouble, and you didn't have to sacrifice yourself personally. But as soon as you became involved, you moved away from them. She was standing now, moving toward her robe, which had been tossed in the fluorescence at the far end of his cubicle. Looking toward it during intercourse, he had thought that the sight of it was the most tender and affecting thing he had ever known, that she had cast her garments aside for him, that she had committed herself trustfully in nakedness against him for the night, and all of this despite the fact that he was undergoing what he took to be the positive humiliation of the confinement. Now, as she flung it angrily on herself, he wondered if he had been wrong, if that casting aside had been a gesture less tender than fierce, whether or not she might have been, and he could hardly bear this thought, but one must, after all, press on, 
perversely excited by images of how he would look naked and drawn in upon himself in the ark, his genitals clamped between his thighs, Talmudic statements by the rabbis Hill and Ben Bagbag, his only companions in the many long nights to come. He did not want to think of it, did not want to see her in this new perspective, and so leaped to his feet, fleet as a heart, and said, But it's not fair. I tell you, it isn't fair. Of course it isn't fair. That's why it's so beautiful. Well, how would you like it? How would you like to be confined in Leviticus, she said. I don't want to talk to you about this any more. Leviticus, she added, I think I was wrong about you. You've hurt me very much. Leviticus, she concluded, if you don't leave me right now, this moment, I'll go to the elders and tell them exactly what you're saying and thinking, and you know what will happen to you then. And he had let her go. Nothing else to do. The shutter of his cubicle coming open, the passage of her body having the light from the hall, then the light exposed again, and she was gone. He closed the shutter. He was alone in his cubicle again. It isn't fair, he said aloud. She wouldn't like it so much if this was reform and she were faced with the possibility of going in there some day. But this gave him little comfort. In fact, it gave him no comfort at all. It seemed to lead him right back to where he'd started. Futile, amazed protest at the injustice and folly of what was being done for him. And he had gone into an unhappy sleep thinking that something, something would have to be done about this. Perhaps he could take the case out of the congregation. If the ordinators were led to understand what kind of rights were being committed in the name of high orthodoxy, they would take a strong position against this, seal up the complex, probably scatter the congregation throughout a hundred other complexes. And it was this which had given him ease, tossed him into a long, murmuring sleep replete with satisfaction that he had finally found a way to deal with this, because he knew instinctively that the ordinators would not like this. But the next morning, cunningly, almost as if they had been informed by Stala, perhaps they had, the elders had come to take him to the ark, and that had been the end of that line of thought. He supposed that he could still do it, complained to the ordinators, that was, after his confinement was over, but at that point it hardly seemed worth it. It hardly seemed worth it at all. For one thing, he would be out of the ark by then, and would not have to face it for a very, very long time, if ever. So why bother with the ordinators? He would have to take a more direct position, take it up with the congregation itself. Surely once they understood his agony, they could not permit it to continue. Could they? In the third of his imaginary dialogues with God, whom he pictured as an imposing man, somewhat the dimensions of one of the elders, but much more neatly trimmed and not loaded down with a paraphernalia with which they conducted themselves, Leviticus said, I don't believe any of it, not any part of it at all. It's ridiculous. Doubt is another part of faith, God said. Doubt and belief intertwine. Both can be conditions of reverence. There is more divinity in the doubt of a wise man than in the acceptance of fools. That's just rhetoric, Leviticus said. It explains nothing. The devices of belief must move within the confines of rhetoric, God said. Rhetoric is the poor machinery of the profound and incontrovertible. Actually, it's not a matter of doubt. You're just very uncomfortable. That's right, I'm uncomfortable. I don't see why Judaism imposes this kind of suffering. Religion is suffering, God said with a modest little laugh. And if you think Judaism is difficult upon its participants, you should get a look at some of the others sometime. Animal sacrifice, immolation, the ceremony of tongues. Oh, most terrible. Not that everyone doesn't have a right to their point of view, God added hastily. Each must reach me, each in his way and through his tradition. Believe me, Leviticus, you haven't got the worst of it. I protest. I protest this humiliation. It isn't easy for me either, God pointed out. I've gone through cycles of repudiation for billions of years. Still, one must go on. I've got to get out of here. It's destroying my health. My physical condition is ruined. When am I going to leave? I'm sorry, God said. That decision is not in my hands. But you're omnipotent. My omnipotence is only my will working through the diversity of twenty billion other wills. Each is determined, and yet each is free. That sounds to me like a lousy excuse, Leviticus said sullenly. I don't think that makes any sense at all. 
I do the best I can, God said, and after a long, thin pause, added sorrowfully, You don't think that any of this is easy for me either, do you? Leviticus has the dim recollection from the historical tapes, none of them well attended to, that before the time of the complexes, before the time of great changes, there had been another kind of existence, one during which none of the great churches, Judaism included, had been doing particularly well in terms of absolute number of participants, relative proportion of the population. Cults had done all right, but cults had had only the most marginal connection to the great churches, and in most cases had repudiated them, leading, in the analyses of certain of the historical tapes, to the Holocaust that had followed, and the absolute determination on the part of the Risen that they would not permit this to happen again, that they would not allow the cults to appropriate all of the energy, the empirical demonstrations, for themselves, but instead would make sure that the religions were reconverted to hard ritual, that the ritual demonstrations following would be strong and convincing enough to keep the cults out of business, and through true worship and true belief, although with enough ritual now to satisfy the mass of people that religion could be made visible, stave off yet another holocaust. At least, this was what Leviticus had gathered from the tapes. But then you could never be sure about this, and the tapes were all distributed under the jurisdiction of the elders anyway, and what the elders would do with material to manipulate it to their own purposes was well known. Look, for one thing, at what they had done to Leviticus. I'll starve in here, he had said to the elders desperately, as they were conveying him down the aisle toward the ark. I'll deteriorate. I'll go insane from the confinement. If I get ill, no one will be there to help me. Food will be given you each day. You will have the Torah and the Talmud, the feast of life itself, to comfort you and to grant you peace. You will allow the Spirit of God to move within you. That's ridiculous, Leviticus said. I told you I have very little belief in any of this. How can the Spirit... Belief means nothing, the elders said. They seemed to speak in unison, which was impossible, of course. How could they have such a level of shared anticipation of the others' remarks? Rather, it was that they spoke one by one with similar voice quality. That would be a more likely explanation of the phenomenon, mysticism having, so far as Leviticus knew, very little relation to rational Judaism. You are its object, not its subject. Aha! Leviticus said then, frantically raising one finger to forestall them, as they began to lead him painfully into the ark, pushing him, tugging, buckling his limbs. If belief does not matter, if I am merely object rather than subject, then how can I be tenanted by the Spirit? That, the elder said, finishing the job, patting him into place, one of them extracting a rag to whip the wood of the ark speedily to high gloss, cautiously licking a finger, applying it to the surface to take out an imagined particle of dust. That is very much your problem and not ours, you see. And closed the doors upon him, leaving him alone with scrolls and Talmud, cloth, and the sound of scrambling birds. In a moment he heard a grinding noise as key was inserted into lock, then a snap as tumblers inverted. They were locking him in. Well, he had known that. That at least was not surprising. Tradition had its roots. The commitment to the Ark was supposed to be voluntary, a joyous expression of commitment, that was. The time spent in the Ark was supposed to be a time of repentance and great interior satisfaction. But all of that to one side, the elders, balancing off the one against the other, as was their wont, arriving at a careful and highly modulated view of the situation, had ruled in their wisdom that it was best to keep the Ark locked at all times, excepting, of course, the adoration. That was the elders for you. They took everything into account, and having done that, made the confinement, as they said, his problem. Now the ritual of the Sabbath evening service is over, and the rabbi is delivering his sermon. Something about the many rivers of Judaism, each of them individual, flowing into that great sea of tradition and belief, the usual material. Leviticus knows that this is the Sabbath service. He can identify it by certain of the prayers and chants, although he has lost all extrinsic sense of time, of course, in the Ark. For that matter, he suspects, the elders have lost all extrinsic sense of time as well. It is no more Friday now than Thursday or Saturday, but at a certain arbitrary time after the Holocaust, he is given to understand the days, the months, the years themselves were recreated and assigned, and therefore, if the elders say it is Friday, it is Friday, 
just as if they say it is the year 37, it is the year 37, and not 5700 something or other, or whatever it was when the Holocaust occurred. In his mind, as a kind of shorthand, he has taken to referring to the Holocaust as the H. The H did this. Certain things happened to cause the H, but he is not sure that this would make sense to other people, and as a matter of fact, wonders whether or not this might not be the sign of a deranged consciousness. Whatever the elders say it is, it is, although God in the imaginary dialogues has assured him that the elders in their own fashion are merely struggling with the poor tools at their command and are no less fallible than he, Leviticus. He shall take upon himself in any event these commandments, and shall bind them for frontlets between his eyes. After the sermon, when the ark is opened for the adoration, he will lunge from it and confront them with what they have become, with what they have made of him, with what together they have made of God. He will do that, and for signposts upon his house as well, that they shall remember and do those commandments and be holy, holy, holy. O oh, their Savior and their hope, they have been worshipping him as their fathers did in ancient days. But enough of this, quite enough. The earth being his dominion, and all the beasts and fish thereof, it is high time that some sort of reckoning of the changes be made. Highly unfair, Leviticus thinks, crouching, awaiting the opening of the ark, but then again he must, as always, force himself to see all sides of the question. Very possibly, if Stala had approved of his position, had granted him sympathy, had agreed with him that what the elders were doing was unjust and unfair, well then, he might have been far more cheerfully disposed to put up with his fate. If only she, if only someone, had seen him as a martyr rather than as a usual part of a very usual process, everything might have changed. But then again, it might have been the same. The book of Daniel, he recollects, had been very careful and very precise in giving, with numerology and symbol, the exact time when the H would begin. Daniel had been specific. He had alluded to precisely that course of events at which period of time that would signal the coming, or the second coming, depending on your pursuit. The only trouble with it was that there had been so many conflicting interpretations over thousands of years that for all intents and purposes the predictive value of Daniel for the H had been lost. Various interpreters saw too many signs of rising in the East, too many beasts of heaven, stormings of the tabernacle, too many uprisings among the cattle or the chieftains to enable them to get the H down right once and for all. A lot of them, hence, had been embarrassed. Many cults hinged solely upon their interpretation of Daniel and looking for an apocalyptic date had gotten themselves overcommitted and going up on the mountaintops to await the end had lost most of their membership. Of course, the H had come, and with it the floods, the falling, the rising, and the tumult in the lands, and it was possible that Daniel had gotten it precisely right after all, if only you could look back on it in retrospect and get it right. But as far as Leviticus was concerned, there was only one overriding message that you might want to take from the tapes if you were interested in this kind of thing. You did not want to pin it down too closely. Better, as the elders did, to kind of leave the issue indeterminate and in flux. Better, as God himself had imaginarily pointed out, to say that doubt is merely the reverse coin of belief, both of them motes in the bowels of the hound of heaven. The rabbi, adoring the ever-living God and rendering praise unto him, inserts the key into the ark. The tumblers fall open, the doors creak and gape, and Leviticus finds himself once again staring into the old man's face, his eyes congested with pain as he reaches in trembling toward one of the scrolls, his cheeks dancing in the light, the elders grouped behind him and attending carefully. And instantly, Leviticus strikes. He reaches out a hand, yanks the rabbi out of the way, and then tumbles from the ark. He had meant to leap, but did not realize how shriveled his muscles would be from disuse. What he had intended to be a vault is instead a collapse to the stones under the ark, but yet he is able to move. He is able to move. He pulls himself falteringly to hands and knees, gasping, the rabbi mumbling in the background, the elders looking at him with shocked expressions, too astonished for the instant to move. The instant now is all that he needs. He has not precipitated what he has done in the hope of having a great deal of time. Look at me, Leviticus shrieks, struggling erect, hands hanging, head shaking. Look at me. Look at what I've become. 
Look at what dwells in the heart of the ark. And indeed they are looking, all of them. The entire congregation, Stala in the women's section, hand to face, palm open, extended, all of them stunned in the light of his gaze. Look at me, he shouts again. You can't do this to people. Do you understand that? You cannot do it. And the elders come upon him, recovered from their astonishment, to seize him with hands like metal, the rabbi rolling and rolling on the floor, deep into some chant that Leviticus cannot interpret. The congregation gathered now to rush upon him, but too late. It has, as he must at some level have known, been too late from the beginning. And as the rabbi chants the elders strain, the congregation rushes. Time inverts, and the real, the long expected, the true H, with its true host, begins. Barry Ann Maltzberg writes, I was born in 1939, married in 1964, had a daughter in 1966 and another in 1970, presently live in the pastoral serenity of Bergen County, two miles from the Ridgefield Park oil dump and refinery. I have written more than 70 novels, some of them science fiction, and more than 150 short stories, almost all of which have been, or at least have been published as, science fiction. My favorite of all my novels is Underlay, Avon Books, 1974, which is invisible. I am a full-time writer, have been for about seven years. Cambridge, 1.58 a.m. by Gregory Benford Gregory Markham returned to the Cavendish Laboratory at 9.13 p.m. Instead of going to his cluttered office, he descended into the basement. The corridors were poorly lit, and many laboratories yawned empty, stripped of equipment. When he entered the large room reserved for the nuclear resonance group, he nearly bumped into a tall, thin man standing just inside the door. The man turned and smiled slightly. You must be Markham, he said, holding out his hand. Right. How did you know? You're the only one here who looks as though he might be an American. Ah, I've been here six months, but apparently there's something British that doesn't rub off on visitors. You're better dressed than we are, for one thing. You mean, for a scientist, I'm better dressed. Those tweeds of yours are quite fashionable. We do a bit better in the government. It's about all we seem to be doing well these days, the man said wryly. Oh, you must be Ian Peterson, then. Didn't I say that? Stupid of me. Yes, I rang you up two days ago. Sorry, I'm wandering around in a daze, I guess. Crisis? Of course, there's always one these days. The Emergency Council has been in executive session since this morning. I was barely able to get the train down here in time. Worried about North Africa? That, yes. Looks as though it's a full-scale dieback this time. Damn. Is it all due to the drought? Plus not having any food reserves. Disease is killing most of them now, though. Markham gestured into the laboratory. Say, there's Renfrew. Have you met? No, I've only just arrived. He's the heavyset one? The two men stood on a raised platform overlooking a sprawl of scientific equipment. There were eight technicians working among the aisles. Roughing pumps chugged laboriously, and there were muffled conversations, but otherwise the laboratory was quiet. I'd like a word before I meet Renfrew, Peterson said. I didn't have much chance to sound you out on the telephone the other day. I don't have much of an opinion so far, Markham said precisely. Nonetheless, you're the fellow the Americans selected to send. You must know how they feel about this. Strictly speaking, they didn't send anyone. I'm here with the Cavendish Theory Group, sabbatical leave. The National Science Foundation wired me last week to act as liaison. Yes, you're from the University of California at Irvine, right? A plasma physicist. Most of my work has been in plasmas until the last few years. I wrote a paper on tachyons long ago before they became fashionable. I suppose that's why the NSF asked me to be here. Peterson lowered his voice. There's the rub, you see. I haven't any technical background in this sort of thing. No one on the council has. We've got ecologists and systems people and that sort of thing, but... Well, look, tell me, do you think this experiment might be of any real help? Without being melodramatic, Markham said slowly, I believe it could save millions of lives. If it works. We know the technique works. It's whether we can actually communicate with the past that we don't know. 
And this setup here, Peterson swept his arm out across the laboratory bay, can do that, if we're damned lucky. We know there were similar nuclear resonance experiments in the Cavendish and a few other places in the States and the Soviet Union, functioning as far back as the 1950s. In principle, they could pick up coherent signals induced by tachyons. So we can send them telegrams. Yes, but that's all. It's a highly restricted form of time travel, if you want to put it that way. This is the only way anyone's figured how to send messages into the past. We can't transmit objects or people. Peterson shook his head. I did a degree in math, computers. But even I know there's a paradox involved here somewhere. The old thing about shooting your grandfather, isn't it? Someone on the council brought that up yesterday. We almost booted the whole idea out because of that, you know. A good point. I made the same error in a paper back in 1970. It turns out there are paradoxes, and then if you look at things the right way, paradoxes go away. Maybe I can explain... Sorry, but I haven't time for that now. The whole point, as I understand it, is to send these telegrams and tell somebody back in 1955 about our situation here. Well, something like that. Warn them against chlorinated hydrocarbons, sketch in the effects on phytoplankton, describe... Hello, Greg. Glad to see you here. Unnoticed, John Renfrew had mounted the catwalk from the bay below. He was a large, swarthy man, with his white shirt partially untucked in his trousers. Lines of fatigue made his face seem ashen. Despite the chilly English spring, there were crescents of sweat in the cloth around his armpits. And you're Mr. Peterson, I expect, Renfrew said with considerably less enthusiasm. Come to see if I've been spending the council's special appropriation wisely. Something of the sort, Peterson said distantly. I'm grateful for it, mind you that, and we'll be showing you some results later on. But Professor Markham is here because I think the only way to really accomplish anything is to get the Americans to come in. Since I'm not so essential, Peterson said, you might have scheduled this experiment at some more reasonable hour. Couldn't. Noise level in the day is too high. And anyway, the electric power chaps won't let us run in the peak usage times. We use a lot of high-tension devices to put out short bursts of tachyons, and they... I'm sure, Peterson said. Could I please see the experiment? Ah, yes, certainly. Renfrew turned and led the way down the catwalk to the floor of the laboratory. The room was of bare stone work, outfitted with old-fashioned electrical connections and rather newer cables strewn through the aisles of apparatus. Some old gray cabinets were of English manufacture, but most of the newer equipment was housed in brightly colored compartments from Maxwell Laboratories, Physics International, and other American firms. Peterson gathered these garish red and yellow units, came from the council appropriation. Renfrew led them to a complex array housed between the poles of a large magnet. Superconducting setup, of course. We need the high field strength to get a nice sharp line during transmission. Peterson studied the maze of wires and meters. Cabinets housing rank upon rank of electronics towered over the men. He found the mass of it oppressive. He waited for Renfrew to begin, but when the man said nothing, Peterson pointed out a particular object and asked as to its function. Oh, I didn't think you'd be wanting to know the technical side, Renfrew said. Try me. We've got a large nuclear source in there, see? Renfrew pointed at the encased volume between the magnet poles. We modulate the electric fields around the source, its cesium, in such a way that the nuclei give off tachyons, particles that travel faster than light, you know. On the other side, he pointed around the magnets, leading Peterson to a long cylindrical tank that protruded ten meters away from the magnets, we draw out the tachyons and focus them into a beam. They're a particular type of tachyon, ones that resonate only with cesium nuclei. Ordinary matter is transparent to tachyons, do you see? Until they run into something, Peterson said. No, no, that's the point, Renfrew said sharply. Tachyons just don't interact with most ordinary matter. They pass right through. That's why we can shoot them halfway across the galaxy without having them stopped, Markham interjected. Except for cesium, Renfrew said. When one of our tachyons hits a cesium atom in a strong magnetic field, a situation that doesn't occur naturally very often, it will be absorbed. The struck nucleus recoils, then, with a very high momentum. It sends out shock waves in the lattice of the cesium sample. 
That's some other fellow sees him, I suppose, Peterson said. One operating in 1955, Renfrew said. Markham added, we hope. We're hoping the fellows during the experiments back then will notice some large signals. They'll perceive them as sound waves carrying a message, Renfrew said. The whole point is that there must be enough tachyon striking that 1955 block of cesium metal to show up clearly. For that, we have to concentrate a burst of tachyons and aim it just so. Hold on, Peterson said, putting up a hand. Aim for what? Where is 1955? Quite far away, as it works out, Markham conceded. Since 1955, the Earth has been going around the sun, while our star itself is revolving around the hub of the galaxy. Add on to that the motion of our galaxy relative to the fixed rest frame of the center of mass of the universe. You mean 1955 is in a different place, then? Certainly. So we send out a broad beam that sweeps the volume we believe was occupied by the Earth at that particular time in the past, Markham said. Sounds impossible. Markham shrugged. It may be. The trick is that Renfrew here is creating tachyons with essentially infinite speed. So if we can hit the right spot in space, we can send a message back quite a long way. How far back we can go is related to the distance. We're aiming for a particular space-time point along the Earth's geodesic, Renfrew began. You're traveling a bit too fast for me, Peterson put in. What were these results you were talking about? We've been working with noise problems the last few months. That's the main thing. The signal has to appear above the thermal background, so it's accessible to the fellows back in the 1950s, with their relatively crude equipment. Peterson shook his head. I'm amazed you got the money for this. Renfrew's face tightened. Well, we did get it, though it's bloody well not enough. You think you won't be able to get through, Markham said? Renfrew turned to the American. It'll be a near thing. We need a lot more power, to be sure. That's where the Americans come in, if they will. But you'll try, Peterson said. Right. The rig is set. We've been working on it all day. When can we run, Markham said. Now. It was 9.34 p.m. Jose Bascon waited for the first threads of dawn to lighten the sky. Slowly, he put his loose fishing gear in a mesh sack. He squatted at the threshold of a dark stone house, listening to the slowly gathering sounds of people arising through the village. He tried to ignore the gnawing, rumbling hunger in his belly. He debated with himself for a moment and then decided a mouthful of wine would give him energy to begin. The cork came out with a dry pop, and he carefully trickled a pool of it into his mouth. It was sharp and rough. The fumes seemed to burn his nostrils. Rodas Cabernet. He read each letter to himself, moving his lips. Jose could still remember letters, but the words made no sense to him. Down slope from his house was a long, low wooden building with a sign atop it. To pass the time, he slowly spelled the letters out to himself, as he had many times before. Mitsubishi Packing Corporation. There was no movement around the building. No lights were burning. There had been little work for months there, Jose knew, and some of the men who had learned that trade had moved away to another village in search of another job. Jose heaved to his feet. If there was to be work for anyone, he had better get down to his boat. The bleak village of scattered one-story houses depended utterly upon the fishing fleet. There had been precious few hauls of fish in the last few weeks. The familiar casting areas yielded nothing. Jose and a few other men had found some shallow spots farther up the coast that occasionally gave a modest catch, but everyone knew those places were not dependable. He walked slowly down the damp cobblestone street. A drizzle began. He heard the high notes of excitement from the direction of the plank pier. There was also a low bass sound, like angry men yelling. Jose walked faster. A small hill hid the view of the ocean from him. He took a shortcut through a clump of stunted brown trees. A dead bird lay in his path, but he did not notice it. He rounded the brow of the hill. The shouting grew louder. He squinted through the drizzle, and suddenly his eyes widened. Normally at dawn the Atlantic was dark and oily. 
Today it was a mottled red. A stench of rotting sea life rose from the narrow beach. Jose did not have to go out in his skiff today to know he would find no fish. Something had happened. The ocean was dying. November 16th, 1991 Dear Alex, I'm not going to make it down for Thanksgiving. There's just too much to do here at Caltech. The last few weeks have been extremely exciting. I'm working with a couple of other people, and we really don't want to break off our calculations, even for a holiday in Baja. I shall miss the prickly cactus and that delicious dry heat. Sorry, and maybe we can make it next time. After breaking a promise like this, I really suppose I ought to tell you what stirred me up so. Probably a marine biologist like you won't think all this is of such great concern. Cosmology doesn't count for much in the world of enzymes and titrated solutions and all that, I suppose. But to those of us working in the gravitational theory group, it looks as though there's a genuine revolution around the corner. Or maybe it's already arrived. You must remember Malcolm Walmsley, the fellow who was best man at Jim and Hillary's wedding. He's tied into this, though somewhat indirectly. He and two others were the first to notice that quasars are clustered into two groups in our sky. This was way back in 1966, and you will get some idea of how difficult the observations are when I tell you that it has taken this long to follow up those first measurements in depth. It turns out the quasars are clumped together, representing a really large-scale clustering of matter in the universe. This is related to a problem that's been hanging around astrophysics for a long time. If there is a certain quantity of matter in the universe, then it is a closed geometry. Like the surface of a sphere, you can move around on it, but you can't escape. So people in our line of work have been wondering for some time if there is enough matter in our universe to close off the geometry. It would be nice to see if the geometry is closed by a direct experiment, say by sending out a beam of light, and seeing if it curves around and comes back eventually. But that experiment takes about 20 billion years to finish. Just counting the luminous stars in the universe gives a small quantity of matter, not enough to close off space-time. But there's undoubtedly a lot of unseen mass, such as dust, dead stars, and black holes. We're now pretty sure that most galaxies have large black holes at their centers. That accounts for enough missing matter to close off our universe. What's new is that the recent data on quasar distribution mean there are large fluctuations in matter density throughout our universe. If galaxies clump together somewhere in our universe and their density gets high enough, their local space-time geometry could wrap around on itself in the same way that our universe is closed. We now have enough evidence to believe Tommy Gold's old idea that there are parts of our universe which have enough clustered galaxies to form their own closed geometry. They won't look like much to us, just small areas with weak red light coming out of them. The shocker here is that these local density fluctuations qualify as independent universes. The time for forming a separate universe is independent of the size. It goes like square root of gn, where g is the gravitational constant, and n the density of the contracting region. Thus it's independent of the size of the many universe. A small universe will close itself off just as fast as a large one. This means all the various sized universes have been around for the same amount of time. Defining just what time is in this problem will drive you to drink if you're not a mathematician. The point here is that there may be closed off universes inside our own. In fact, it would be a remarkable coincidence if our universe was the largest of all. We may be a local lump inside somebody else's universe. Remember the old cartoon of a little fish being swallowed by a slightly larger one, in turn about to be swallowed by another bigger one, and so on, ad infinitum? Well, we may be one of these fishes. The last few weeks I've been working on the problem of getting information about, or out of, these universes inside our own. Clearly, light can't get out of one universe into the next. Neither can matter. The only possibility might be some type of particle that doesn't fit into the constraints set by Einstein's theory. There are several candidates like this, but Thorne, the grand old man around here, doesn't want to get into that morass. Too messy, he says. 
Some of us here think otherwise, which is why I'm working so hard on the problem. There's a chance of a first-class discovery in this. We've had the devil of a time pursuing things with the food strike and the big fire in L.A., and I scarcely think anyone would give much of a damn with the world in its present state, but that's what the academic life is for. I'm going to try to get through to La Jolla sometime soon, and maybe we can see each other then. Sorry about Baja. Sincerely, Charles. At 10.22 p.m., John Renfrew began tapping slowly on a signal key. Markham and Peterson stood behind him. Technicians monitored other output from the experiment and made adjustments. It's this easy to send a message, Peterson said. Simple Morse, Markham said. I see, to maximize the chances of its being decoded. Damn, Renfrew suddenly stood up. Noise level has increased again. Markham leaned over and looked at the oscilloscope face. The trace danced and juggled, a scattered random field. How can there be that much noise in a chilled cesium sample, Markham asked. Christ, I don't know. We had trouble like this all along lately. It can't be thermal. Transmission is impossible with this going on, Peterson put in. Of course, Renfrew said irritably. Broadens the tachyon resonance line and muddles up the signal. Then the experiment can't work, Peterson said. Bloody hell, I didn't say that. There's just something wrong now. I'm sure I can find the problem. A technician called down from the platform above. Mr. Peterson? Telephone call. Says it's urgent. Oh, right. Peterson hastened up the metal stairway and was gone. Renfrew conferred with some technicians, checked readings himself, and fretted away several minutes. Markham stood looking at the oscilloscope trace. Any idea what it could be, he called to Renfrew. Heat leak, possibly. Maybe the sample isn't well insulated from shocks, either. You mean people walking around the room, that sort of thing? Renfrew shrugged and went on with his work. Markham rubbed a thumbnail against his lower lip and studied the yellow noise spectrum on the green oscilloscope screen. After a moment, he said, Have you got a correlator you could use on this rig? Renfrew stopped for a moment and thought. No, none here. We have no use for one. I'd like to see if there's any structure we could bring out of that noise. Well, I suppose we could do that. Take a while to scrounge up something suitable. Peterson appeared overhead. Sorry, I'm going to have to go to a secured telephone. Something's come up. Renfrew turned away without saying anything. Markham climbed the stairway and said, I think there will be a delay in the experiment anyway. Ah, good. I don't want to return to London just yet without seeing it through. But I'll have to talk to some people on a confidential telephone line. It will probably take an hour or so. That bad? It seems so. There's a large diatom bloom off the South American coast, Atlantic side. Bloom? Biologist's word. It means the thyloplankton are coming to terms with the chlorinated hydrocarbons we've been using in fertilizer. Apparently, marine animals can't get along with this new diatom. They're dying off, and the whole food chain might be threatened. I see. Can we do anything about it? I don't know. We've been trying some methods in the Indian Ocean, anticipating something like this might happen. I don't know if we can shift resources to the lower Atlantic that fast. Well, I won't keep you from the telephone. I've got something to work on, an idea about Renfrew's experiment. Say, do you know the whim? Yes, it's a pub in Jesus Green. I'll probably need a drink and some food in an hour or so. Why don't we meet there? It's, let's see, 10.45. Yes, that's a good idea. See you near midnight. The Physical Review D, Volume 2, Number 2, 263-265, 15 July 1970. The Tachyonic Antitelephone. G.A. Markham. D.L. Book and W.A. Newcomb, Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, University of California, Livermore, California, received 23 June 1969. The problem of detecting faster-than-light particles is reconsidered in relation to Tolman's paradox. It is shown that some of the experiments already underway or contemplated must either yield negative results or give rise to causal contradictions. Hypothetical faster-than-light particles, tachyons, 
have recently received considerable attention, both theoretically and experimentally. Still, there are difficult questions of causality associated with faster-than-light signals. We hope to show that these have not been adequately resolved. In particular, it appears that at least some current attempts to produce and detect tachyons are foredoomed to failure on fundamental grounds. In 1917, Tolman presented an argument, Tolman's Paradox, showing that if faster-than-light signals can be propagated, then communication with the past is possible. That is, they would comprise an anti-telephone. Recently, Belanyuk, Despond, and Sudarshan have attempted to answer this argument with a reinterpretation principle. They note that a tachyon of negative energy, minus E, leaving point 1 at time, T1, and arriving at point 2 at an earlier time, T2, may be reinterpreted as a tachyon of energy plus E traveling from 2 to 1. Thus, the earlier of the two events can always be viewed as an emission and the later as an absorption. They point out that the end of the tachyon's world line that appears earlier depends on the reference frame of the observer. That is, emission of a tachyon may be viewed as absorption by another observer. As we shall see, this statement is not sufficient of itself to refute Tolman's paradox. Note that Tolman's paradox deals only with faster-than-light communication. It does not rule out tachyons, which for some reason may not be used as a signaling system. There is no paradox associated with an unmodulated tachyon beam. Current theories deal mainly with non-interacting tachyons. The moment interactions are introduced, Tolman's paradox must be faced. James Whitegren was late for work. He hastily shook out his jacket and hung it in the narrow dark cloakroom. He put on his white smock and fumbled with the buttons. His head was blurred and it ached, either from the cheap Algerian red of the night before or central fatigue. He hated this job. Maybe that had something to do with it. He pushed open the heavy door into the preparation room. The chill air made Whiteburn shiver, and the foreman gave him a significant look. He hurried to his post. Well, hell, he wouldn't have been late if he hadn't had to take the damn bus from Croydon through Caterham and then run into that jam at the railway crossing. Nothing ever seemed to work right these days. He took out his working case, the chemical analyzers and needles and the rest. He was reasonably sure that he understood most of the checks he was to make, but the government seemed to add a new test every time he turned around. Whiteburn got his kit in order and went to the first line of carcasses. He looked aside as he approached, wanting to delay the moment until the last. It didn't seem to matter whether it was pork or beef or lamb. The sight of a carcass hanging from a hook, partially chopped to pieces and still bleeding, made him ill. If he wasn't a vegetarian, maybe it would be easier. He did the first row all right, drawing out the samples and making the color-coded checks required. He ignored the gobs of yellow fat that dangled in the air the stringy meat interlaced with blue and brown streaks. By the second row, he had begun to feel the dull, buzzing pain behind his eyes again, and his attention wavered. Whiteburn checked his watch. Still quite a long time till tea break. He came to a line of pigs neatly strutted and cleaned. There was a special set of tests for these, recently started by the government inspectors. Something to do with the protein supplements given the hogs. Ground-up cod and whitefish marrow, something like that. He inserted a needle, took a sample, and tested it in the analyzer. The color indicator came out neutral. Whiteburn felt his headache getting worse. He shuffled on to the next body and repeated the process. This result was somewhat worse, but Whiteburn knew he probably wasn't doing the test right. It seemed likely this meat would come out all right if he was careful about his procedures. He looked down the long row of silently hanging hog carcasses and felt the room spin around him. God, it was really bad this morning. He shouldn't have drunk the wine. He should have called in sick. He put away his kit. That was enough for this line. The tests came out neutral or maybe a little better, and anyway, what did it matter? The tests weren't that good in any case, and Whitebird wasn't about to eat any of this rubbish. Christ, only the rich could buy this stuff now. He coughed, and his head felt worse. He decided to take his tea break early. What a piss-up of a day this was. 
The whim was gloomy, even considering the energy shortage. Ian Peterson pushed his way through a crowd near the front door and stood for a moment trying to get his bearings. A yellowed poster announced that some menu items were discontinued, temporarily, of course. The whim was surprisingly crowded. Then Peterson remembered that most experimental work at Cambridge was done at night due to its low priority. The university crowd had apparently adapted well. Some of them even seemed to be in good spirits. He made his way across the crowded eating section through blue curls of pipe smoke layered in the air. Someone called his name, and he peered around until he saw Markham in a side booth. It's chancy finding anyone here, isn't it? Peterson said as he sat down. I was just ordering. Thought I might have the tongue, though it's incredibly expensive. Peterson studied the menu. Lots of salads, aren't there? There doesn't seem to be anything worth eating these days. Anything with meat in it is just impossible. Yes, except the cheaper cuts. I don't see how you can eat tongue, knowing it came out of some animal's mouth. Have an egg instead, then? Peterson laughed. I suppose there's no way to turn. But I think I'll splurge and have the sausages. That should do up my budget pretty nicely. When the waitress had brought Peterson's ale and Markham's Maccas and Stout, Peterson suddenly noticed an odd sour tang in the air. Is that what I think? They allow that in here? Markham looked around and sniffed the air. Marijuana, sure. All the mild euphorics are legal here, aren't they? They have been for a year or two, but I thought by social convention, if there's any of that left, one didn't smoke it in public places. If the government wants to distract people from the news, there's no point in requiring them to do it only at home, Markham said mildly. A score to you. Despite all the rhetoric, I'm sure that's why it was legalized. I'll bet the rate of use goes up pretty soon, too. The news that bad? Worse, if anything. How much does the bloom cover? Apparently almost all the South Atlantic. The large fishing areas are gone. As far as patrols can tell, there is nothing left alive inside, and the perimeter is growing. We'd better get Renfrew's experiment on the air, then. That's what I don't understand. I may be a non-specialist, but how in hell do you get around that grandfather paradox bit? How can we possibly change the past? Quite honestly, no one knows for certain. Renfrew's is the first experiment done with tachyons that deliberately tries to reach the past. All the ideas he's working under depend on new advances in cosmology and relativity and particle physics. No one has been able to put all these ideas together in a coherent philosophical package. Then how the hell can you say this might work? There are good theoretical reasons to think it might. The trick is that you can change the past so long as the physical circumstances of the experiment aren't also altered in the process. Peterson shook his head. Don't follow. Look, we want to get the word that use of fertilizer-sensitive grains won't work in the long run, that the oceans are so damned vulnerable, more so than anything else, that whole countries will begin to go down the drain by the 1980s. We can send that information, the laws of physics and causality will let us, as long as we don't solve the problem so well that the Renfrew experiment never gets performed. That is, unless we do something that cuts off the message itself. So we can make things better. At least there isn't any reason in the theory why we can't. That's what you're asking the government to support? The council did, didn't it? Only on advice. Do you think the National Science Foundation will come in with some money for Renfrew? Markham shrugged. The waitress arrived with their food, and both men began to eat quickly. If Renfrew's personality has anything to do with it, I think we can write off the whole affair. Yes, I'm rather amazed he's so hostile, Peterson said. Any idea why? Sure, he's had to scrounge and fight like Billy Hell to get this thing together. I think he's getting paranoid about it. Yet he's doing just what should be done. He's checking important implications of a new cosmological theory that uses tachyons as an essential part. It took half a century for Weber to test for Einstein's gravitational waves, you remember. Well, Renfrew is speeding up the process a bit for tachyons. He's already found them, hasn't he? Yes, but to use them, there's the rub. That settles it, then. The council secretary wanted me to return to London immediately, but I won't. I'll stay a few more hours to see if this thing comes out. Shouldn't we be getting back over to the laboratory? 
Markham took a long pull at his stout. I suppose so, he sighed. What time is it? Morning already. One o eight. From The Geography of Calamity, Geopolitics of Human Dieback, by J. Holdren. 1984 to 1986, Java. Attributable deaths, estimated, 8,750,000. 1986, Malawi, 2,300,000. 1987, Philippines, 1,600,000. 1987 to present, Congo, 3,700,000. 1989 to present, India, 68 million. 1990 to present, Colombia, Ecuador, Honduras, 1,600,000. 1991 to present, Dominican Republic, 750,000. 1991 to present, Egypt, Pakistan, 3,800,000. 1993 to present, General Southeast Asia, 113,500,000. The stars were out as Markham and Peterson made their way back to the Cavendish. Their walk took them through the Euclidean perfections of King's College, through an ivy arch and down a small cobble lane. They went along the backs, Markham rather relishing the experience as only Americans do at Cambridge, and then passed through the great court of Trinity. The air was heavy and damp giving their footsteps an odd hollow ring. As they entered the nuclear resonance laboratory, Renfrew looked up and waved energetically. Where have you been? We've got everything set up. Sorry, I was delayed, Peterson said. Renfrew nodded to two technicians and beckoned them down the stairs. I have a Scott correlator rigged in, as you asked, he said to Markham. But our noise problem is just as bad. I expected so, Markham said. When Renfrew seemed surprised, he went on. I've been doing some calculations and a bit of reading since I left. I think there may be an explanation for the anomalous noise level. It's not thermally generated at all, if I'm right. Instead, the noise comes from tachyons. Your cesium sample isn't transmitting tachyons, it's receiving them. There's a tachyon background we've neglected. A background, Renfrew said, from what? Let's see. Try the correlator. Renfrew made a few adjustments and stepped back from the oscilloscope. That should do it. Do what, Peterson put in. This is a lock-in coherence analyzer, Markham said, which means it can cull out the genuine noise in the cesium sample, sound wave noise, that is, and bring any signals up out of the random background. Which is just what it's doing, Renfrew said quietly. He stared intently at the oscilloscope face. A complex waveform wavered across the scale. It seems to be a series of pulses strung out at regular intervals, Renfrew said. But the signal decays in time. He pointed at the fluid line that faded into the noise level as it neared the right hand of the screen. Quite regular, yes, Markham said. Here's one peak, then a pause, then two peaks together, then nothing again, then four nearly on top of each other, then nothing. Strange. What do you think it is? Peterson asked. Not ordinary background, that's clear, Renfrew answered. It's coherent. Can't be natural, Markham said. Renfrew. No, more like... A code, Markham finished. It was 1.56 a.m. Let's take some of this down, Markham said. He began writing on a clipboard. Is this a real-time display? No, I just rigged it to take a sample of the noise for a hundred microsecond interval. Renfrew reached for the oscilloscope dials. Would you like another interval? Wait until I copy this. Peterson said, why don't you just photograph it? Renfrew looked at him significantly. We have no film. There's a shortage. And priority doesn't go to laboratories these days, you know. Anyone here know Morris? Markham interrupted. Renfrew shook his head. Peterson said, I probably still remember some. Markham handed him the clipboard. Try that. Meanwhile, let's have another interval analyzed. Renfrew made an adjustment, and another pattern appeared on the scope, this time covering only half the time period before it was submerged in the noise level. Markham began copying its features. Odd, Peterson said. It decodes to ND meet I. That's all. At least it's English, Markham said. Try this. 
Renfrew wrinkled his brow. What's happening? Someone is sending us time telegrams, I'd say, Markham said. Telegrams to 158 AM Cambridge. They're having trouble getting through the noise level. Word from the future, Renfrew said slowly. They must know we set up this attempt to signal back to the 1950s. So they're trying to reach us, too. Makes sense, doesn't it? Trouble is, Markham said, can you transmit through that noise? Renfrew thought a moment. I don't believe so. This is the best equipment I could muster. I might be able to pick up a factor of two in sensitivity with a few modifications, but I doubt it. And there's no point in going to lower temperatures if the noise level is this high. Peterson held up the clipboard. A-M-S-N-U, Q-U-E-A-L-S-E-U-D, P-O-H-3-E-4-C. Gibberish. I was afraid of that, too, Markham said. What are you talking about? Renfrew said sharply. All that background noise doesn't arise naturally, or at least that's my guess. It's formed by overlaying a lot of different coherent signals from many different sources. Every once in a while, this particular space-time point we're at gets a burst of coherent signal somewhat larger than the rest. That's what we've been decoding. But the noise level is so high, not much can get through before it's swallowed up again. Apparently, focusing is difficult. If our technology is strained right now, I doubt we'll get very much more. Renfrew began pacing back and forth with sudden energy. He waved at the laboratory technicians who had left their posts and gathered around the three men. Keep an eye on, he called, and motioned them away. When he turned back, Peterson could see clearly the lines of fatigue in the man's face. Look, if you're right, why are there so many signals coming in? And why does this second message come out nonsense, Peterson added. Markham gestured at the oscilloscope screen. Try another one, John. I'll bet you find that quite a few of the signals that get above noise level are incomprehensible. Renfrew moved to the oscilloscope, and when he had a new trace, Peterson began copying it. Markham went on. There's going to be gibberish simply because either the senders don't use Morse, or the senders don't speak our language. You mean from the far future, then, Peterson said. No, not necessarily, though that's possible. Markham made a tent of his fingers and smiled into it in what was clearly his favorite academic gesture. John, I know you've been busy with this experiment and haven't had time to keep up with theoretical developments, but the very existence of tachyons and the rest of the so-called new relativity leads to far-reaching, almost incredible conclusions. I don't have much time for reading, Renfrew said with a note of dismissal. Leisure of the theory class, Markham said laconically. Not that there are that many technical journals left. I've gotten most of this from Thorne's group at Caltech. The astrophysical data pretty well show now that there are quite a few nested universes inside our own. They look like infrared emission readings to us. The light we are getting is from the era before the space-time geometry closed off in those areas. This one says D-I-4-K-L-T-O-R-Y-E-3. It appears you are right, Peterson said. Hmm. Well, perhaps. We should do quite a few more before we conclude anything, Renfrew conceded. But what's this about astrophysics? I've not paid much attention to that. Those fellows seem to speculate in ideas like stockbrokers. Markham smiled and nodded. Granted, they often take a grain of truth and blow it up into a kind of intellectual puffed rice, but this time they may have a point. Charles Wickham sent me some calculations that look convincing. The reason it ties in with your work, John, is that tachyons are the only thing that can even theoretically escape from a closed space-time geometry. Why is that, Peterson said. Well, they violate the tenets of the old relativity theory, Einstein's. That's a clue in itself, but let's not go into that. The only point I want to make is that we are getting tachyon noise. It's unlikely that natural effects will give much tachyon noise. Christ, we're measuring a hundred times the expected value. I think we're getting the signals emitted by other civilizations, signals that have escaped from the nested universes inside our own. Well, I suppose that makes sense, Peterson said. Other societies might try to use tachyons, too. After all, 
And I still don't understand why faster-than-light particles can let you communicate back in time. It's simple, Renfrew interjected. Comes right out of special relativity. The We'll skip it, Peterson said firmly. Alien sending tachyon signals makes sense, though I can't see that it's any use to us. Here's another, Renfrew said, handing a sheet to Peterson. Decode it. Peterson wrote for a moment, and then read out, C-E-R-N-4. K.J. Q.O.E.C. At first I thought it might be something about C.E.R.N., the European Nuclear Agency, Markham said. But the rest is just random. Renfrew compressed his lips. There was a long silence. Between the magnet coils, the liquid nitrogen bath that immersed the nuclear sample gave up a pale fog. There came an occasional snap as ice formed on its jacket. Abruptly, Renfrew stood up. Not much bloody chance of C.E.R.N. being in the picture, is there? He turned to Peterson. Our brilliant crisis managers shut it down three years ago. Peterson studied him coldly. The fact remains, Dr. Renfrew, that you have failed to live up to your promises. You cannot contact the past. Markham. But look, all we have is an idea about why it doesn't work. We have to see if this is galactic-scale background. We can check again. See if there is some angular dependence to the incoming noise. It might be avoidable some way. Peterson pointed at Renfrew. You yourself said you couldn't improve sensitivity much more. I can't, but the Emergency Council hasn't got funds or time for pursuing your hobbies. There's no point in studying theoretical questions like this tachyon business... If we're all heading slam-bang for the rapids ahead, Peterson said. Renfrew had begun pacing again, but he suddenly turned on Peterson and said savagely, Yes, no use at all, is it? Research is nothing to you buggering power-mad bastards, climbing all over each other to direct the latest disaster. Markham raised his hand and began, Now, John, sure enough, we're headed for the rapids, but if so, what's the point of everybody trying to pilot the boat, eh? That doesn't stop you council sons of bitches from... Peterson sprang to his feet. From trying to stop runaway technology, yes. That's all your type thinks about, isn't it? Bad technology got you into this, so you're going to get out using solely your wits, is it? Only the Americans can get us out of this bloody mare's nest now. Only they've kept up any kind of respectable science and engineering. The cold seeps into his bones. Jose Bascon sits on the doorstep of his house and watches the cobblestone streets. He has been waiting for two days. They have all been waiting, the entire village, for the promised truckload of food from the government regional storehouse. The truck is late. Some say it will not come. The children in the streets do not play anymore. They stare dully ahead, unable to focus properly. Few people pass by his house. Jose watches a woman shuffle by, her belly distended. She is carrying a basket, but there is nothing in it. He has heard the tales of dysentery, the word of the radio about cholera. His fingers toy with the cut on his wrist. It has not closed completely, though it is three days old. Jose knows it will not heal unless he gets food. He should get up and search for something, but the villagers have already scavenged the countryside around. There is no place left to go. He sits and watches the street and waits for the truck. AP. United Airlines Flight 347, London to Washington, D.C., encountered turbulence on its approach to Dulles Airport and crashed in the early hours of the morning. The plane went down in a wooded area and burned upon impact. Witnesses said the plane appeared to explode as it struck the trees. Early reports mentioned no survivors. This latest in a series of airline disasters has... Peterson awakes slowly. There is a murmur of movement around him, but he is lethargic, his limbs slack. He studies the lattice work of glass and metal standing beside his bed for a long moment, and then decides he must sit up and continue writing the telegram. He struggles up and finds his pen. He begins to write, but the noise in the ward is distracting. Patients lie on temporary pallets, some of them moaning, and others staring unmoving at the ceiling. Peterson concludes that the food poisoning must be more widespread than he thought. 
The nurses move quickly through the ward, stepping primly over the patients in the aisles and ignore the chorus of pleadings that come from all sides. Peterson shuts the scene out of his mind. He continues writing. Though I sent my report several days ago, I expected at that time it would be considerably reinforced at the National Science Foundation by the in-person appearance of Dr. Markham. Only yesterday did I learn that he died when his return flight to Washington went down. Dr. Markham told me before he left that he thought the rash of airline crashes was not pure accident, that defective manufacturing in the airplanes themselves was responsible, and I fear that had I not urged him to go in person, he would not have flown at all. It was only because of Dr. Markham that I realized the potential significance of the Cavendish tachyon experiments. I have some personal difficulties with Dr. Renfrew, but I was persuaded by Dr. Markham to overlook these in the light of the gathering crisis. I will not describe to you the chaos and near starvation that prevail all around me today. I imagine similar scenes must be going on in many other of the Western nations. I hesitate to think what the rest of the world is like. I have telephoned my office to send you the copies of Dr. Markham's notes that I retained. As you study them, you will undoubtedly conclude that the entire matter of communicating with the 1950s or 1960s, which gives us enough lead time to measurably affect the present day, is technically very difficult. But if only a small bit of information can get through, we must make the effort. The technical argument speaks for itself. I am unqualified to add anything further about that. But there is something about the Renfrew experiment that has only today occurred to me, and I feel I should bring it up. We received a few scattered bits of signals that momentarily peaked above the tachyon noise level. It seems to me that the existence of these signals is in itself of momentous importance. They are evidence that someone in the future still speaks English and can send tachyon signals. We have no way of knowing how far in the future that time might be. A pessimist might say that the fact that people in the future want to communicate with us is in itself a bad sign. What disasters lie ahead that others would reach back into the past and try to alter events? I take the other view. That men can still send tachyon signals from the future is a sign that there are solutions to this crisis. Our ecosystems may not be fatally unstable. Perhaps something can be done. I urge immediate action on my report of... Rain spattering in his face awakens him. The cold numbs his legs, but he is too weak to stand. There was no one in the street now, only a huddled form lying in a doorway down the hill. The form has not moved for a day now. Jose rests his head in his hands, rocking from side to side. He knows the truck is going to come. If he can sit here in the cold stone doorway long enough, the truck will come. A brown organic bloom begins to spread off the coast of Spain. Fishermen report it, but at first their descriptions are not understood by local officials, and the word does not reach the oceanographic community until the bloom is several hundred kilometers in diameter. A stench begins to rise from the sea. Fish are dying in unparalleled numbers. The bloom becomes redder as it spreads. Similarities to the South American bloom multiply. Biologists soon agree that the phenomena are related. Manadrin, a chlorinated hydrocarbon used in insecticides, has opened a new life niche among the microscopic algae. A new variety of diatom has evolved. It uses an enzyme that breaks down manadrin. The diatom silica also excretes a breakdown product that interrupts transmission of nerve impulses in animals. Dendritic connections fail. In Lisbon, Birds fall from the sky and die within minutes. The beaches are dark with rotting sea life. The bloom spreads. John Renfrew works late, alone, though he is weak from dysentery. Most of his technicians have not appeared for work since the breakdown of the food supply network. It is rumored that many people are fleeing to the countryside. Every sound Renfrew makes echoes hollowly in the Cavendish. He is the only man left in the building. The heat was long ago turned off. Electrical power is low, but still functioning. The campus itself seems nearly entirely abandoned. For the last few days he has seen only a few figures in the distance. The trains have stopped. 
He has not heard the distant rumble of an airplane for many days. The tachyon noise level remains constant. Occasionally he can resolve a few brief snatches of coded signals, but never as much as a complete sentence. Most of the messages are clearly not Morse. Some are complex waveforms, others almost pure sine waves. Nothing Renfrew can do reduces the noise level. He cannibalizes electronics gear from other untended experiments in the Cavendish, but there is little improvement. The dysentery becomes worse. He feels his brow and realizes he has a fever. He hears strange, distant sounds like voices, but when he goes to investigate, there is no one else in the building. There is only the gritty scraping of his own shoes on the stone floor. He drinks great quantities of water, but nothing stops the dysentery. His throat burns. As he works, the laboratory shifts in and out of focus, as though under water. He tries to think calmly and cleanly about what Markham said in the train station, about car black holes and the riddle of cosmology. Even Einstein's theory carried a causal loops in it, Markham said, matter swallowed into the net of space-time and spitting out elsewhere in the differential geometry, else when, else when. And now tachyons and worlds sliding into other worlds. G times in. Tensor geometries folding inward, blindly, following the squiggles and jots of Riemann and Littenberg. There is an ache behind his eyes. Renfrew shivers as the cold seeps into him. He reads the latest fragment. Enzyme inhibited B. That is all. He scans the other bits of signal, hoping for something that makes sense. They all mean something to someone, but who, where, when? His apparatus opens up communication with all the rest of the universe instantly. Men could talk to great cultures that span the stars. A telegram from Andromeda would take no longer than one from London. Even other enclosed universes are accessible. There may be macro-universes, larger than our own, all sending tachyon messages that leak out of the space-time curvature and sleep through this laboratory, through Renfrew, through everything. He shakes his head. Incredible. Unless there is some unsuspected natural source of tachyons, the random yellow jitter on his oscilloscope is a wealth of information. But all the form and structure is eroded into noise by overlapping too many messages. Because everyone is talking at once, no one can hear. But no, Renfrew thinks to himself, rocking back and forth to keep warm. No, they aren't all talking at once. All times are represented, all places, each split nanosecond, all things smeared together in a vast ocean of noise. The universes are all connected, he sees, as behind him the pumps cough, the electronics gear gives an occasional ping. Tachyons of ten to the minus thirteenth power centimeters size flash across whole universes. Ten to the twenty-eighth power centimeters of cooling matter, in less time than Renfrew's eye takes to absorb a photon of the pale watery light. The tachyons zip by, carrying word of alien thoughts. All size scales, all distances, are wound in upon each other. Singularities suck up the stuff of creation. Event horizons ripple. Worlds coil into worlds. Renfrew shakes himself. Christ, the fever! It claws at him, runs glowing smoke fingers through his mind. Again he tries his equipment. The oscilloscope gives a complex wave, but the decoding makes no sense. Perhaps there is no message. Never was. Causality weighs its leaden hand on events. But where were cause and effect in such an infinite matrix of worlds? Where the past, which the future, no beginning or end, only an endless series of nested universes. He smiles to himself with flinty irony. Attempting to sidestep causality, he is caught again in its snare. The grandfather paradox remains. An infinite series of grandfathers will live out their lives safe from Renfrew. The noise wins. The noise prevents his tinkering. The only thing left was to forget the past, let it lie in musty pages on gravestones. Renfrew sees he must turn to the future. There is someone up there, in the times ahead, still sending. Enzyme inhibited B. 
Someone is calling. Hello, 711 AM, 1995. Hello, enzyme inhibited B. Whispers flit across the tachyon spectrum, embedding soft words of tomorrow in the cesium. Someone is there. Someone brings hope. The infinite goddamn universe has not beaten him yet. The room is cold. Renfrew huddles by his instruments. He is trying a modification of the signal correlator, when suddenly the lights flicker and wink out. All power is gone. Utter blackness rushes in. Renfrew takes a long time to feel his way out of the basement laboratory and into sunlight. It is a bleak, gray morning, but he does not notice this. It is enough to see light at all. As he stands outside the Cavendish, he can hear no sound whatever from the entire town of Cambridge. The breeze carries a sour tang. He feels a curious, heady lightness. He does not know what lies ahead. Perhaps Peterson has gotten through to the Americans. If there is no causality, then nothing is known. The past and future are equal riddles. Renfrew takes a few hesitant steps across a geometrically flattened green and feels a surge of something he cannot name. He moves more firmly. With resolution, puffing slightly, he sets out to walk into the countryside. Nested universes collapse inward on nested universes, onion skin within onion skin. They hum in the infrared. Tachyons sputter from their cores. The galaxy is a swarm of colored dots, turning with majestic slowness in the great night. The bloom laps at the Dover coast. Surf foams pink on the beaches. Ian Peterson's cable reaches Washington. Gregory Benford writes, Theorem. Time travel is impossible. Proof. If a time machine exists, it can be used to make paradoxes. Cause and effect will be reversed. This means logical contradictions can exist in the operating of the universe. This is unacceptable. So goes the logic, and quite neat it is. I am a theoretical physicist, and the argument looks compelling to me. In fact, I wrote a paper on the subject in 1970 with David Book and William Newcomb. In the late 1960s, much dust was being raised about a hypothetical particle, the tachyon, which could travel faster than light. Now, faster than light travel, FTL, is a mainstay of science fiction. One might think that a scientist who was also a writer of fiction would leap at the possibility of FTL. After all, tachyon seemed to promise a reasonable explanation for those galaxy-spanning ships so beloved in SF. But I didn't cheer the advent of tachyons. Instead, I attacked it. The reason lies in the theorem announced above. Einstein's special theory of relativity can be used to show that if FTL particles exist, they can be employed in a transmitter, and the signals emitted by this tachyonic telephone could be sent back in time. So FTL implies time travel, paradoxes, and all the elaborate games that SF writers have played with the idea since H.G. Wells. David Book, William Newcomb, and I worked out a simple proof, based on Einstein's theory, especially designed to overcome an argument that certain particle theorists have constructed. These theorists wanted to avoid the time paradox problem, and thought they had. Book, Newcomb, and I showed that if tachyons could be detected in an experiment at all, they implied communication through time. And if somehow tachyons couldn't be detected, but existed anyway, what was the use of doing experiments to find them? Since those days, tachyons have fared rather badly. The experiments designed to detect them failed to find anything. And despite a spate of tachyon theories, no one has gotten around the time paradox problem. But still, sometimes I wonder. Suppose time paradoxes are not totally disallowed in our universe, but are merely highly unusual. In a certain sense, paradoxical events can occur within the boundaries of the general theory of relativity. In the last few years, we've gotten quite accustomed to black holes and white holes, places where matter may tunnel through space itself to reappear in distant galaxies. I don't think the tachyon ferment is totally resolved, and indeed it may never be. 
it's very difficult to show that something doesn't exist. All these thoughts led me to think about the time travel stories so beloved in SF, and whether they seemed probable. Even if time travel was possible, would it really come about that way? So I tried to deal with the problem in a fashion that felt right to me, that seemed dramatically interesting, and had some reasonable scientific underpinning. Not correct, just reasonable. All time travel stories are dreams, really, and this one is no different. If the real thing comes along someday, it will undoubtedly be unlike anything I've guessed. I hope.